Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 14. Chapter 326, Substitute Ah! Lumian's right chest glowed faintly. His spirit body quivered as a yellowish beam shot forth from his mouth. It instantly struck Guillaume Benet, dressed in a dark shirt and black pants, causing him to collapse in confusion and shock. Spell of Harumph. He's fake. Lumian's eyes narrowed as he assessed the situation. He wasn't too surprised by the outcome. It was evident that this wasn't the real Guillaume Benet, a Sequence 5 fate appropriator. The way the man reacted to the attack, coupled with his lack of familiarity with Beyonder powers and mysticism, made Lumian believe that the substitute was an ordinary person thrust into an unfamiliar world. Disregarding the bewildered butler, Lumian swiftly turned on his heels and sprinted out of the compact living room. As he ran, he whispered, to Dill. Franca, draped in her hooded, leather-armored black robe, materialized in front of Lumian. Lumian grabbed her shoulder, allowing the black mark on his right shoulder to flicker with a dark light. Amidst the swirling maelstrom of vibrant hues, the duo found themselves on the balcony of Dill's sixth floor. Having sent Jenna to inform Albus previously, Lumian had already memorized the coordinates. Upon seeing her companion arrive, Jenna, dressed as a female mercenary, emerged from the shadows. She pointed at room 602 and lowered her voice. It's not over yet. Damn it, he's dragging this out. The second round, perhaps? Lumian chuckled. According to Albus, the occupant of room 602 had already blown his load once before having afternoon tea. Now, it had begun again. The soundproofing here is impressive, Franca remarked, her head tilting as she listened for any signs of activity from within room 602. Jenna observed as Lumian wiped his face, disguising himself as a typical dill brothel attendant. She clicked her tongue and voiced her thoughts. That woman in there screams occasionally. Damn it, is that perverted padre into some abusive stuff? Jenna, an underground singer frequenting bars and dance halls, had cultivated an open and passionate image. Her close rapport with Franca, who managed the dancers, exposed her to a world beyond the ordinary. She had zero experience, but her insights were substantial. Franca caught on swiftly. She modulated her voice and clicked her tongue. Lumian, his niece face transforming him, glanced at Franca, silently requesting her to sprinkle fluorescent powder in the corridor outside room 602. A countermeasure against Guillaume Benet's invisibility. Lumian knew that the invisibility didn't erase traces or sense. Should Guillaume Benet escape into the corridor during combat, the fluorescent powder would create a luminous trail, guiding Lumian's pursuit. However, Lumian reconsidered and decided that the use of fluorescent powder might be too conspicuous. Guillaume Benet could easily detect the abnormality and escape using his bizarre abilities before Lumian could launch a surprise attack. After a moment's reflection, Lumian leaned in to whisper to Franca, deploy invisibility to conceal yourself in the corridor. Use invisible spider silk to create a web that covers the target's door from the ground to the ceiling. This approach would neutralize the effectiveness of invisibility, while also entangling Guillaume Benet if he attempted to employ slow flight. No problem. Franca adjusted her black hood and entered the corridor. In a blink, her form dissolved, as if a snowman had melted in the sun. Seven to eight seconds later, a gentle breeze brushed against Lumian's legs. He was taken aback for a moment before comprehending. Franca is using the invisible spider silk to signal readiness. Since this dude advanced to a demoness of pleasure, everything she does carries a sense of teasing. Yeah, she just advanced and might not have full control over the potion's power. She could be unwittingly affected. Muttering inwardly, Lumian shifted his attention to Jenna and instructed, Conceal yourself in the shadows here. If Guillaume Benet flees this way, you can shoot or execute an assassination. If that fails, withdraw immediately. If he heads in another direction, don't pursue. Got it. Jenna, well versed in these situations, didn't push for more involvement. She understood that her capabilities could be effectively deployed only under specific circumstances. 
with his team arranged, Lumian pivoted and directed his gaze at the wooden door of room 602. He inhaled deeply, exhaling slowly to steady his nerves. With that, he fetched an armchair from the balcony and positioned it in the corridor. The invisible spider silk avoided him as he moved some distance away from room 602 and set down the chair. In the following moment, he lightly tapped the chair's back. Crimson flames flowed from his palm, slithering over the chair like serpents. As the armchair caught fire, Lumian jogged toward room 602 without attempting to conceal his movements. He wrapped his knuckles against the wooden door. What is it? A voice tinged with contained anger reverberated from within room 602, indicating a pivotal juncture. Fire. There's a fire. Lumian shouted in feigned panic. Son of a sow. The male voice inside cursed in a Ristin province accent. Simultaneously, Hunter Lumian detected a distinctive motion, someone getting off the bed. Two to three seconds later, the door swung open, revealing a naked man wearing an iron-colored half-mask and a white shirt, his lower half exposed. A brunette, clad in a fishnet nightgown, was still draped over him. Holy heck, can't you even let go of her? Franca's amused commentary echoed in Lumian's mind from her invisible position diagonally across. However, Lumian's focus was unshaken. When the suspected Guillaume Benet appeared, his gaze flickering towards the smoky, flaming chair, Lumian acted swiftly. Ha! Ah. Another yellowish beam shot forth, piercing through both the man in the iron-colored half-mask and the woman in the fishnet nightgown, enveloping them. A glimpse of shock and panic flashed across the eyes of the supposed Guillaume Benet, revealing his grasp of beyonder powers. Then, his eyes dulled, and he collapsed, a fraction after the woman. As the sound of something heavy thudding to the floor echoed, Lumian seemed to enter a surreal trance. Impossible. A fate appropriator like Guillaume Benet couldn't be knocked out by a contractee's spell of harumph. Is he a decoy? The one at 50 Rue Vincent was an imposter too. Where is the real Guillaume Benet? Shaking off his momentary daze, Lumian knelt, peeling off the iron-colored mask from the unconscious man. The face beneath was unervingly familiar, it was the hooked-nosed countenance of Guillaume Benet. Darkening with concern, Lumian pushed the half-dressed woman away from his target and tore open the white shirt. In the next heartbeat, his eyes fell upon three black marks resembling signatures on the unconscious man's upper body, one on the left chest, one on the right chest, and another on the abdomen. This wasn't Guillaume Benet. Guillaume Benet held more than three contracts, probably a dozen or more. All fake? All substitutes? Lumian clenched his fists, his eyes igniting with an invisible blaze. He rose, dragging the man, an identical look-alike of Guillaume Benet, back into room 602. Then, he found a blanket, swathed the unconscious woman, and deposited her in the corridor. In the interim, Franca discerned the falsity of the prey once again, vanishing her invisibility. She summoned Frost and doused the flames consuming the armchair. As she transferred the woman from the corridor to a vacant room, Lumian extended his right hand, fingers closing around the throat of the inevitability bestowed. With a decisive snap, he broke the man's neck, rendering him unconscious and lifeless. Following that, he shut the wooden door, drew the ritual silver dagger, and sanctified it. A wall of spirituality enshrouded room 602. Subsequently, Lumian initiated the summoning dance, opting to engage in a preliminary, purpose-driven spirit channeling through this method. He had chosen not to enlist Franca's aid for a reason, he was uncertain about the peculiar creatures the deceased had contracted. It was possible they would induce corresponding corruption. Only Lumian, having long been an inevitability bestowed, remained unaffected by the spirit channeling process. The sedatives and the last remnants of truth serum from the Bliss Society were reserved for use on the real Padre. Diagonally opposite 50 Rue Vincent. Perched on the second floor of the building and ensconced in cover, Anthony Reed, steadfastly observing the target, espied a graceful lady in a pale green gown hurrying out, accompanied by her valet, maid, and butler. The group entered a carriage, deftly relocated from the rear to the front entrance, before embarking toward the far end of Rue Vincent. 
Without precipitously giving chase, Anthony meticulously memorized specific details concerning the carriage and the horses. Amidst the fervent and contorted dance, the departed spirit detached from its corporeal vessel, hovering midair. It cast a glare laden with animosity and perplexity upon Lung Mian. Drawing his own blood, Lung Mian enacted a command, compelling the spirit to bind to him. Although desire and veracity ignited within him, Lung Mian remained resolute, detecting an additional presence. Summoning the Abyss Demon Flower Invisibility Transfiguration Damn it! An involuntary curse escaped Lumian's lips. He began to grasp the unfolding situation. The individual at 50 Rue Vincent was possibly a product of the substitution spell. The one at the Dill Brothel, on the other hand, had been fashioned as a substitute by Guillaume Benet, utilizing transfiguration, exploiting its negative effects. He was vigilant against anyone exploiting his negative effects to track him down. Transfiguration was a contractual ability capable of altering a person's appearance, physique, and disposition. It also possessed a measure of resistance against divination. The price exacted was one's own visage, with the detrimental side effect manifesting as a desire for the exploitation of others. Lumian steadied himself, summoning to mind the genuine Guillaume Benet, his visage, his deeds. This resonance united with the memories that had left the most indelible mark on the spirit of the deceased, enabling Lumian to hunt for clues. In due course, a cluster of seven or eight memories quivered slightly. Lumian selected one, striving to magnify it for deeper understanding. Chapter 327 The Real Guillaume Benet The memories of the false Guillaume Benet surged, and Lumian found himself immersed in the familiar confines of 50 Rue Vincent's cozy parlor. Draped in an air of regal poise, the counterfeit Guillaume Benet stood before the armchair, addressing the recipient of these memories with calculated words, take this money and venture to Rue de la Mireille. There, seek out the renowned courtesan of utmost repute. But you must assume my looks, veiled by a mask. With humility and deference, the memory's owner bowed. Understood, Archbishop. And thus, this memory concluded. Lumian held a steadfast conviction that the inevitability bestowed before him was a meticulously crafted proxy, a construct devised by none other than Guillaume Benet himself. It appeared that he had likely garnered a cohort of adherents to inevitability. From among them, he had singled out a candidate from Southern Entis, one who swiftly reaped three successive boons. This candidate was meticulously endowed with the same abilities as him, the summoning of the Abyss Demon Flower and the Shroud of Invisibility. This granted him an impeccable guise, perfectly mirroring the true him thanks to the contract's negative effects. Of course, transfiguration remained an integral, indispensable ability. From this vantage, it became evident that Guillaume Benet hadn't neglected the adverse ramifications of the specialized covenant. He might have contemplated this from inception or perhaps gained insight subsequent to a dire prophecy, reviewing his recent undertakings. Regardless, this counterfeit Guillaume Benet, proficient in transfiguration, appeared to be a deliberate ruse. Lumian suspected the presence of other inevitability devotees who clandestinely monitored the Dill brothel. They clandestinely shadowed the sham Guillaume Benet, primed to relay swift notification to the authentic Padre should danger befall his double. In such a scenario, Guillaume Benet enjoyed a distinct advantage, whether he elected to abscond, leaving the product of this substitution spell to grapple with looming peril, or opted to ensnare his antagonists using the doppelganger as bait. Synthesized with the fragments of the fake Guillaume Benet's recollections, Lumian surmised that the genuine Guillaume Benet primarily resided at 50 Rue Vincent. Yet, he permitted the substitute to operate overtly, effectively obfuscating his true whereabouts. Upon this realization, Lumian harbored a pang of vexation. Had Albus not unearthed the sham Guillaume Benet within the confines of the Dill brothel, Lumian wouldn't have been lured away from the decoy, he would have been affixed on the Guillaume at 50 Rue Vincent. This would have spared him the frenzied teleportation prompted after the incapacitation of the substitution spell's byproduct. Lumian would have gravitated towards scouring the building, conceivably unearthing the genuine Guillaume Benet. Granted, Absent the synchronous appearance of Guillaume Benet, 
Lumian wouldn't have entertained notions of a substitution spell. He'd have likely fallen prey to deception, swerving far from the path leading to the authentic Padre. With this epiphany at the forefront, Lumian cast aside his intention to scout for lurking inevitability adherence. Recognizing that the bona fide Guillaume Benet had been alerted, Lumian terminated his summoning dance and dissolved the wall of spirituality. Turning to Franca and Jenna, shrouded in separate shadows, he intoned, Let's head to 50 Rue Vincent now. Presently, Lumian clung to the hope that vestiges of clues lingered or that Anthony Reed, entrusted with overseeing the locale, had gleaned pertinent insights. Franca and Jenna emerged from the shadows one after another, wasting no time to inquire about the current situation. Lumian grabbed their shoulders and activated spirit world traversal once more. In the blink of an eye, their forms solidified within the modest confines of 50 Rue Vincent's parlor. Absent were the butler, valets, and maids, leaving an unattended figure, unconscious, the result of the substitution spell, laid out on the carpet. A meticulous scan of the surroundings concluded with Lumian's approach. He knelt beside the proxy, employing a variety of techniques to rouse him from his stupor. As the counterfeit Guillaume Benet's eyes fluttered open, they met an unfamiliar visage. Startled, he jolted upright, fear tinting his tone. Who are you? Why did you barge into my house? Get out. I'll call the police. I'll call the police. He recollected the recent attack, a curse-like assault. Lumian drew his revolver and pressed it against the fake Guillaume Benet's forehead. The substitute fell silent. Where is the true master of this residence? Lumian's voice resounded, deep and steady. As if pierced by a sudden realization, the imposter Guillaume Benet spat out. I am the true master. I'm the master here. Lumian's lips curled into a smile. In that case, I offer my sympathies. Your wife, it seems, ran off with the butler with your valuables. The valets and maids, meanwhile, seem to have embraced an opportunistic approach, essentially relieving you of anything tangible except this house. In a while, the police will arrest you, citing your involvement in the slaying of a vagrant and perpetrating cultic rituals and extensive deceit. A mosaic of fact and conjecture, Lumian's words emerged with an intent to intimidate the substitute, dismantling any fantastical illusions. Considering the retreat of the madam, butler, valets, maids, coachmen, and gardener from 50 Rue Vincent, Lumian inferred their conversion into believers of inevitability, orchestrated by the genuine padre. This intricate maneuver camouflaged a multitude of cultic practices and eccentric observances, all harmonized through the substitution spell. The false Guillaume Benet at Dill, having reached sequenced seven contract T status, was indicative of multiple instances of boon request rituals and trier. Innocents would undoubtedly become sacrifices, and the best candidates were undoubtedly tramps. At Lumian's declaration, the imitation Guillaume Benet gazed about, bewildered and panic stricken, his voice piercingly beseeching, Paulina. 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 It's indeed the condiment beauty. Unfortunately, she's now a heretic. Lumian watched as the fake Guillaume Benet fell silent, his eyes filled with despair. Any final words? Lumian inquired once more. The fake Guillaume Benet shuddered and said, I'm real. I'm really the master of this place. However, that woman, that woman is a succubus. She surreptitiously lured someone and ensconced him within the cellar. She, she's having an affair with a devil. Affair with a devil. In the basement. Was she secretly meeting the real Padre in private? Yes, the negative effects of Guillaume Benet's desire for coitus will always exist. They won't disappear just because he has two substitutes. Lumian scrutinized the mock Guillaume Benet, who tenaciously clung to his facade as the genuine master of 50 Rue Vincent. Left hand poised, he controlled his might, and with precision, delivered a calculated blow behind the imposter's ear. The fake Guillaume Benet fainted again. Lumian's strategy entailed swift exploration of the residence, as allowing the imposter to run amok could inadvertently trigger calamity. He rose to his feet, massaging his throbbing temples, and turned to Franca and Jenna for an update. Any word from Anthony Reed? No. 
Franca shook her head gently. It seems he followed your directive to trail Madame Paulina. Lumian tersely acknowledged. Then let's search this place and await his feedback. Franca adjusted her black hood and emphasized, one team of three. Don't split up. This was the territory of the heretics. Even if they had already escaped, residual vestiges might still remain. Should they split their efforts and encounter mishaps, timely rescue would be jeopardized. When the authorities carried out such operations, they had to be at least in groups of three or within sight of each other if they wanted to split up. Lumian issued a pointed gesture toward the staircase adjacent to the parlor, let's proceed to the basement. The trio descended, and as they did, Franca leaned to Jenna, her tone hushed, Seal's exchange with the counterfeit was textbook instigation. When you return, dissect the intent behind each phrase. Okay. Jenna absorbed the counsel like a parched sponge. In due course, they reached the basement door. Lumian turned toward his companions, preparations before we venture inside. To thwart lingering echoes of inevitability's powers or unconventional creatures, precaution was paramount. Promptly, Lumian, now adorned with altered visage and partially lengthened hair, pushed the door open, revealing the basement's dim recesses. Within, an unremarkable array of miscellaneous items cluttered the space. No conspicuous anomalies were apparent. Just as Franca readied for magic mirror divination, Lumian, with his hunter's acumen, discerned subtle traces. With metallic clinks, he unveiled a concealed door. Beyond lay a stairwell descending further into the subterranean depths. The trio descended cautiously, arriving after moments at a vast yet rudimentary chamber, bathed in gas lamp radiance. It was unknown if Guillaume Benet had created it himself or if he had sealed off a portion of underground trier and modified it into a private territory. In the center of the stone-floored hall stood an altar, surrounded by ghastly white human bones, complete sheepskin, cowhide, and giant canine skin. Upon seeing this, Lumian was taken aback as he recalled one of the five special ritualistic magics that Am's monk had, animal creation spell. Simultaneously, remembrances of the felines, avians, and canines inhabiting the floor above, and the brown-furred dog nestled beside the mock Guillaume Benet, surged forth. Dog. Dog. Animal creation spell. With an epiphanic rush, Lumian pieced together the genuine Guillaume Benet's concealment. He had invoked the animal creation spell to transmute himself into the hulking, brown-furred canine. In this form, he paraded brazenly before his counterfeit and the surrounding onlookers. With the recitation of the preordained incantation, the true Guillaume Benet could rapidly molt his canine facade, resuming his human guise. In the confines of the parlor, the counterfeit Guillaume Benet remained enshrouded in an unconscious reverie, utterly oblivious to the stark duality between reality and illusion. Cautiously, he inched the guest room door ajar, greeted by a jarring tableau. Before him sprawled his beautiful wife, Paulina, ensconced upon the sumptuous bed, unclothed, whilst a hulking brown-furred canine loomed beside her. At the bedside, a plate bearing a medium-cooked steak was positioned. Amidst clenched teeth, Lumian communicated the enigma of the animal creation spell and his speculative hypothesis to Franca and Jenna, his words resounding, I hope we find that damned dog. No, he should have shed his dog skin by now. Animal creation spell. Humans turning into dogs. Jenna was alarmed. The world of mysticism is so bizarre and terrifying. The three of them worked together and swiftly searched for traces. Before long, Jenna picked up something from a crevice in the stone slab and exclaimed in surprise, I found something. Franca ran over and realized it was brown dog fur. Both approached Lumian, who continued his investigative fervor, presenting their find. Lumian's elation was palpable. He postulated Guillaume Benet's evasion via an underground covert route, disentangling him from Paulina and the rest. Then, they discovered a few strands of brown dog fur. Following the fur, they found another hidden door. After opening the hidden door in the rock wall, Franca performed a simple magic mirror divination and received a revelation that nothing was amiss. Then, she followed Lumian and Jenna in. At that moment, Jenna, who was in the middle of the group, lost sight of Lumian. 
Franca was still following behind her. Without waiting for Jenna to speak, Franca surveyed the room and frowned. We've circled back to the sacrificial hall. Emerging through the secret door, Lumian entered an expanse echoing a quarry's cavern. With gas lamps conspicuously absent, Lumian summoned forth a crimson blaze to pierce the shadows. Almost simultaneously, he sensed that Jenna and Franca hadn't followed him. We got separated just like that? Puzzlement swirled within Lumian's mind, overridden by a low voice that echoed from the abandoned mind's depths, Lumian Lee. Chapter 328, Bottle of Fiction Lumian Lee Lumian found himself frozen in place, his gaze distant as he reacted to the ominous growl. In a shadowy corner of the abandoned mine, a figure outlined itself. Clad in a complete coat of brown dog skin, the figure's torso and abdomen burst open, revealing a human form adorned in a white robe, embellished with intricate silver and black threads. Without a sound, the canine skin dropped to the ground, unveiling a man of slight stature, barely reaching 1.7 meters. His thin black hair framed a face with sharply intense blue eyes, and a slightly upturned nose added to his air of authority. This was none other than Guillaume Benet, the padre of Corda village. At that very moment, a smile graced Guillaume Benet's lips. He held a white human bone in his grasp, his eyes aflame with a fanatical zeal that suggested he was on the cusp of receiving a newfound boon from the forces of inevitability, a boon that could reshape his destiny. Guillaume Benet's initial instinct was to flee from 50 Rue Vincent the moment he saw his decoy incapacitated by the strange spell and his adversary vanishing through the aid of spirit world traversal. In doing so, the decoy could fulfill its full potential of averting disaster. He would escape the looming catastrophe, embarking on a fresh start in a new location, unburdened by the present circumstances. Yet, within an instant, his abilities as a fate appropriator alerted him to the anomaly in the assailant's destiny and the lingering traces of a formidable entity aligned with the inevitability pathway. From this revelation, he deduced that the individual responsible was Lumian Lee, the very person harboring the angel he had once tirelessly invoked. Rapid thoughts raced through Guillaume Benet's mind. As a devoted adherent to the might of inevitability, he was instantly consumed by zealous fervor. He sought to capture or eliminate Lumian Lee. He aspired to break the seal, allowing inevitability's angel to truly descend upon the land. He yearned to obtain a godhood boon, breaking free from the constraints of mortality. He longed to stand as inevitability's chosen representative, guiding the troves of foolish humanity. Having swiftly assessed the situation on both fronts, Guillaume Benet ordered Paulina and the others to flee, luring any potential allies of Lumian Lee away from the scene. Meanwhile, he left behind the substitute, creating a trail of clues for Lumian Lee to follow, leading him into the basement to unveil a hidden door. With his preparations in place, Guillaume Benet entered the sacrificial chamber, deliberately preserving the sheepskin, cowhide, and dogskin. This would enable Lumian Lee, already versed in the animal creation spell, to swiftly uncover the truth. Simultaneously, he shook off a tuft of dog fur, inadvertently revealing his escape route. He chanted the incantation he had prearranged, dispelling the animal creation spell. Drawing upon his concealed power, Guillaume Benet unlocked the door leading to Underground Trier, a contractual power known as the Bottle of Fiction. This ability, a source of personal avarice, enabled Guillaume Benet to convert designated, modest-sized spaces, those harboring symbolic elements like doors and windows, into realms encapsulated within the bottle of fiction. He could impose simple entry conditions, permitting only those who met the prerequisites to enter, while others would be promptly returned to their original positions. Guillaume Benet's stipulation for entry was one bearing the power of inevitability. This criterion was one he shared with Lumian Lee. Regardless of whether Lumian had embraced inevitability's boon, as a carrier of the inevitability angel, enmeshed in the threads of fate, he undeniably possessed inevitability's power. This design ensured that Lumian's allies couldn't breach the bottle of fiction's barrier without a boon of inevitability. It left only Lumian Lee and himself secluded within. And if they had indeed embraced inevitability, they would both remain influenced by the great existence, 
transforming them into equivalent companions during pivotal moments. Guillaume Benet sidestepped the utilization of individuals hailing from Cordu as entry criteria into the bottle of fiction, as it posed a vexing challenge to confirm such origins. Such a determination demanded consultation with the spirit world, unlike the more direct assessment of one possessing a distinct power. Furthermore, should Paulina and the others manage to elude their pursuers and return to this very spot, they could provide essential aid through the opening of the bottle. Having meticulously orchestrated his plan, Guillaume Benet concealed himself, poised for Lumian Lee's entry into the bottle of fiction. As anticipated, upon seeing Lumian Lee, now under an altered guise yet devoid of any traces of the inevitability angel's influence, Guillaume Benet took swift action, invoking the soul assimilation mystic spell. Understanding that Lumian Lee wasn't the individual's original name but had been assumed for nearly six years, recognized by all those around him, Guillaume Benet was certain this identity held a mystic connection that could serve as the true name. Endowed with the knowledge of Cordu as its padre, he possessed a certain insight into Lumian Lee's circumstances. With conviction in the efficacy of the soul assimilation mystic spell, he anticipated it would gravely disorient Lumian Lee. Observing Lumian Lee's form, frozen at the threshold of the bottle of fiction, head bowed and body swaying with instability, Guillaume Benet's grin expanded. Acting without hesitation or speech, he hurled the white human bone he clutched, intending to employ a curse spell capable of rendering the target comatose indefinitely. With this achieved and Lumian Lee under his sway, his intention was to retrieve the pre-prepared ritual sheepskin, enshroud the captive, and intone the incantation, transforming him into a voiceless, nearly powerless sheep. At that juncture, Guillaume Benet could lead the sheep elsewhere, endeavoring to shatter the seal and unleash the imprisoned angel. Once successful, he would ascend to sainthood, becoming a potent human figure bestowed with godhood powers. Smack! As the bone landed, Guillaume Benet surged forward, rapidly enunciating a Hermes incantation. Blind, D. Midway through the chant, the Padre, having made all of Cordu village a sacrificial offering, suddenly experienced a tightening within his chest, an uncommon premonition heralded by fate. For him, such premonitions occurred rarely. Including this instance, it was the second occurrence. The prior occasion had led him to reassess his actions upon arriving in Trier, spurring him to execute the substitution spell and transfiguration, generating a substitute. With absolute faith in inevitability, Guillaume Benet ceased his chant and lunged to the side. In the next second, he heard Lumian's voice. Humph. A nearly imperceivable white beam shot forth from Lumian's nostrils, impacting the precise spot where Guillaume Benet had stood. The beam streaked through the air, vanishing upon contact with the uneven gray black terrain. Lumian's gaze lifted, his eyes extraordinarily clear, seemingly untouched by the soul assimilation mystic spell. Concealed beneath his elongated hair, his ears were snugly filled with soft paper balls. In anticipation of residual effects upon entering the basement, he had taken precautionary measures, blocking his ears and altering his appearance to fend off the soul assimilation mystic spell's influence. How could I be affected if I can't even hear you call my name? Admittedly, the paper balls couldn't wholly stifle sound. A faint shout did reach Lumian, though he failed to discern it as his name. The impact was but a mild vertigo, quickly dissipating. Capitalizing on this opportunity, he deduced the affliction he had confronted to be the sole assimilation mystic spell. With feigned gravity, he baited his lurking adversary into revealing himself, launching a surprise counter with the spell of Harumph. Yet, Lumian hadn't envisaged Guillaume Benet as his assailant. Unwilling to flee just yet, he clung to his resolve to confront the foe and liberate the imprisoned angel. Such a determination heightened Lumian's intensity, a fusion of anxiety and exultation, an undercurrent of madness underscoring his elation. Instantaneously, Guillaume Benet vanished upon landing beside him. Ebony tendrils, contorted like serpentine forms, descended from the mind's apex shrouding the bottle of fiction in an enveloping embrace, blossoming into colossal flowers as crimson as blood. Circling the entryway, Lumian retrieved the iron-gray military alcohol flask, uncapped it, and withdrew the decency brooch. Swoosh! 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 
emerald green arrows exuding a pale pallor streaked forth from the rear of the black vine, piercing the space Lumian had just vacated. Where these arrows connected, the rocks and earth seemed to undergo the assault of concentrated acid, manifesting glaring and exaggerated signs of corrosion. After downing the decency brooch, Lumian's form agilely evaded the ghastly green arrows, targeting his cranium. Simultaneously, he genuflected and inclined forward, palms pressed to the gravel and dirt. Abruptly, vermilion flames surged forth, forging a crescent-like barrier. This fiery barricade extended in all directions, kindling the obsidian vines in its path and inciting the vivid flowers, their fierce maws agape. An inconspicuous, saccharine aroma permeated the air, inducing a drowsy haze, an inclination toward slumber. Guillaume Benet, unveiling himself after launching the ghastly green arrows, nimbly shifted his position. Inhaling the anesthetic gas engendered by the blazing abyss demon flowers, he beheld the crimson wall poised to transmute the entire abandoned mine into an inferno. Why would Lumian Lee ignite the abyss demon flowers, knowing they induce sleep? A momentary bewilderment flashed across Guillaume Benet. In a flash, his insight converged with Lumian's stratagem. Lumian aimed to cultivate an environment saturated with anesthetic gas, an environment impartial to ally or adversary alike. In essence, this would induce slumber in Lumian Lee as well as Guillaume Benet. Lumian's companions stood sentry outside the bottle of fiction. It was conceivable they would soon decipher a means to shatter the contract spell's hold. Comprehending this, Guillaume Benet emitted a disdainful snort, his visage adorned with a metallic sheen. Steel body. This was also a contract ability he had never exhibited in front of Lumian Lee. Temporarily morphing him into a metallic entity, it rendered Guillaume Benet impervious to the anesthetic gas's effects. Naturally, metamorphosing into a metallic entity would curtail his capacity to wield most of his abilities. Outside the bottle of fiction. Upon grasping that she and Jenna had returned to the sacrificial chamber while Lumian had mysteriously disappeared, Franca swiftly procured a mirror. Stains of blood and black splotches marred the mirror's surface. Puzzled, Jenna inquired, why are you employing mirror substitution? Wouldn't it be more sensible to make another attempt at traversing the hidden door? With an air of solemnity, Frank explained, this mirror carries the mirror substitution spell I prepared for Seal prior to our mission. It allows me to cast a reverse curse on Seal. Presently, I'll employ a milder curse to assess if I can establish a connection with him. Should she succeed in placing a curse upon Lumian, it would imply the connection remained intact. If the bond hadn't been severed, an alternative resolution had to be pursued. Chapter 329 Metallic Creature Simultaneously with Franca's explanation, inky flames emanated from her right hand, melding with the mirror that belonged to Lumian's substitute. Jenna observed with a mixture of apprehension, her breath held involuntarily. Within the bottle of fiction, just as the wall of flame surged forth, kindling the abyss demon flowers, a pang of agony gnawed at Lomian's heart, birthing a faint shroud of black flames upon his chest. In response, his spirit body descended gradually, drawn into an abyssal darkness, a void obliterating light. Curse? Lumian, ensconced within the cradle of crimson flames, was caught off guard. The reasons behind this unexpected curse eluded him. On the one hand, he had preemptively plugged his ears, blunting the impact of the soul assimilation mystic spell. On the other, Guillaume Benet lay concealed among the dormant abyss demon flowers, offering no overt indications of invoking contract abilities. Furthermore, he remained unscathed, leaving behind neither flesh nor blood. Every strand of his discarded hair had been consumed by the encroaching flames. As the black flames emerged, the curse lingered at a subdued level, manifesting as a faint affliction that refrained from impeding his movements. Instantaneously, Lumian formulated a hypothesis. This curse came from Franca. Employing mirror substitution, she sought to reach out to him. With renewed determination, Lumian thrust his hands in the direction of the Padre's covert location. Resounding with crackling, another barrier of crimson flames materialized, fire enveloping the descending abyss demon flowers. 
leveraging this veil to obscure Guillaume Benet's line of sight, Lumian pivoted and sprinted toward the entryway of the bottle of fiction. His actions and his overt choice resonated with unmistakable clarity, conveying to Guillaume Benet, why should I fight you within your chosen battleground? If my comrades are barred from entry, I'll venture outside and unite with them. Emerging from his concealment behind a cluster of abyss demon flowers, Guillaume Benet radiated a metallic gleam across his exposed skin. Blazing tongues of fire surged toward him, yet they could only strip away a fraction of fabric, unable to sear his flesh. Through the fiery veil, the Cordu Padre bestowed a smile upon Lumian's indistinct figure. Given the capability to freely traverse the bottle of fiction with requisite conditions fulfilled, he had ingeniously laid a trap at the entryway, awaiting Lumian's unwitting ensnarement. Having assumed a metallic form, his utility was confined to boons involving his body, fate, and three distinct contract abilities untouched by his transformation. Among the latter was Shadow Burial. A black mark on Guillaume Benet's torso wavered, summoning pallid white and abyssal black arms that extended from the encroaching shadows, ensnaring Lumian, mid sprint toward the entryway. Lumian, with a forceful stomp, catapulted into the air, seemingly aiming to vault over the eerie appendages emerging from the shadows, seeking sanctuary at the hushed, inky exit. Behind him, a crimson fireball materialized, poised to detonate at a moment's notice transmuting into a vessel of obliteration. Simultaneously, fierce fireballs ignited to his left and right, as if poised to counteract the grasp of the arms. Guillaume Benet's metallic visage bore a smile more discernible than before, though it remained deprived of vitality, stern and emotionless. He anticipated Lumian's imminent leap into the bottle of fiction's exit. The strange arms accompanying the shadow burial served as a diversionary tactic, forestalling any suspicions from arising. It's a pity that I can't use Bone Curse in my metallic state. Otherwise, this would be a good opportunity. Guillaume Benet hesitated to dispel his steel body and deal Lumian another blow. That way, he wouldn't be able to transform into a metallic creature again anytime soon. The abandoned mine now permeated with anesthetic gas would shortly transform into an inferno. For weak humans lacking godhood, this hostile terrain was untenable. Even Am's monks could sustain themselves only a brief interval longer. In the throes of hesitation, Guillaume Benet ultimately opted to persist with shadow burial, permitting the nightmarish arms to continue their relentless encroachment upon Lumian. With a vigorous leap, Lumian neared the exit of the bottle of fiction, almost within grasp. At that moment, the pitch-black exit, a shadowed orifice devoid of flame, suddenly writhed faintly, akin to a shadowy maw yearning for sustenance. Undetected, a suffused aura of shadow had enshrouded the secret door's surface, a profundity seemingly imbued with life. This was a trap Guillaume Benet had meticulously laid. The mechanism lay dormant during Lumian's initial entrance, solely activating when Lumian attempted exit. This safeguard was devised to preempt Lumian from having any danger premonitions when initially entering the bottle of fiction, deterring him from braving its confines. Lumian perceived the sensation of plummeting into an abyss, the final lifeline eluding his grip. The deceptively thin veil of darkness coiled, an amalgam of endless shadows that converged into an abyssal maw, an aperture on the verge of engulfing him. Mid-flight, Lumian extended his right palm, yet just before it made contact with the shadowy maw shrouding the hidden door, he abruptly withdrew it, mimicking a gesture of prying open a door. In tandem, the decency brooch nestled upon his right chest emitted a subdued golden glow. Distortion Lumian distorted the action of opening the door with the concept of unsealing this confined space. From the outset, his intent to depart the bottle of fiction was absent. Instead, he sought to find a way for his companions to infiltrate, thus furnishing reinforcement. This enclave laden with combustible resources stood as a haven for a pyromaniac. Boom! With a resounding detonation, the crimson fireball positioned to Lumian's left erupted, issuing a horizontal thrust that exacted a substantial toll. His attire lay rent, and his flesh bore charred imprints, inflicted by the fiery onslaught. Gradually nearing the shadowy vortex, the forceful explosion propelled him away from the exit of the bottle of fiction and beyond the enshrouded region brimming with appendages swathed in pallid white and abyssal black. 
resounding with a thud, Lumion tumbled, ensconcing himself behind a rampart of surging flames. This maneuver forestalled the further encroachment of the shadowy expanse, obliging the strange arms to contend with the blistering blaze. Outside the bottle of fiction, a frigid zephyr brushed against Franca and Jenna, wafting from the hidden door's interior. Swiftly, the chill metamorphosed into a searing fervor. Behind the hidden door lay a derelict mine engulfed in a sea of crimson flames, the blazing inferno punctuated by the descent of undistorted fire dragons, their incandescence unbridled. The remaining black vines, the crimson flowers, and the strange arms all succumbed to the fiery onslaught, pursued relentlessly by the raging conflagration. Signaling to Jenna, Franca receded into the shadows as she drew closer to the hidden door. Jenna understood Franca's intentions and rationally retreated into the shadows outside the hidden door, concealing herself. She knew that it would be difficult for her to participate in the battle with her strength. Thus, she chose to bide her time, awaiting the enemy's emergence through the threshold, poised to exploit a fleeting opportunity to deliver a decisive, lethal strike. Within the ajar bottle of fiction, Lumian, having concluded his somersault, propped himself up with a single hand. Locking his gaze onto the distant Guillaume Benet, his form akin to that of a metallic marionette, Lumian's lips curled wordlessly, yielding an eruption of crimson flames that engulfed his flesh and attire. A familiar pang of torment reverberated across Lumian's psyche, jolting him awake from the lethargic stupor. It's been some time. Lumian's grin was tinged with distortion as he hurtled toward the metal encased Guillaume Benet. His forward momentum stirred the encompassing crimson flames, elongating behind him like a shimmering, unfurled cape. Weary of Lumian's earlier utilization of the Harumph spell, Guillaume Benet, resembling a puppet forged from steel, evaded direct confrontation, executing artful shifts in position. Discerning Lumian's strategy of harnessing the flames to stave off the abyss demon flowers induced anesthetic gas, Guillaume Benet discerned this endeavor to be fleeting. At best, Lumian's fiery gambit would delay his descent into unconsciousness. Certain matters couldn't be resolved by self-harm. Having adopted the form of a metallic entity via a steel body, Guillaume Benet remained impervious to the anesthetic gas's effects, even foregoing the need to draw breath. This form also minimized the conflagration's impact on him. Guillaume Benet was convinced that steel body's efficacy would persist until Lumian Lee succumbed to unconsciousness. Furthermore, his assessment revealed Lumian's substantial spirituality expenditure, coupled with Lumian's evident abstention from spirit world traversal. This deduction led Guillaume Benet to surmise that the Harumph spell likely bore limitations on its frequency of use. Of course, sustained evasion was untenable. Lumian Lee's actions hinted at him using some unconventional means to open the bottle of fiction, suggesting his companions had likely infiltrated covertly through invisibility. Guillaume Benet couldn't allow this duo to demonstrate the potency of their teamwork. Nimbly maneuvering around the plummeting tendrils of flaming vines, Guillaume Benet executed a sudden pivot, facing Lumian with unwavering intent. His metallic countenance mirrored the flaming luminance, refracting a kaleidoscopic iridescence. Myriads of diminutive rainbows coalesced, cleaving Guillaume Benet as though he gazed upon his mirror image. Light Incarnation one of the three contractual abilities accessible in his steel body state. Its premise lay in leveraging light to forge a fleeting incarnation, capable of channeling an individual's capabilities. Two metallic Guillaume Bennets surged toward Lumian simultaneously. Thud. 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 Each stride they undertook fostered corporeal expansion, culminating in the metamorphosis into metallic titans which tore asunder their white robes adorned with silver-black threads. Elevating his right hand, Lumian summoned into being a host of crimson fire ravens that swirled about him. The fire ravens promptly surged toward the two Guillaume Bennets, demonstrating no clemency. Given the inherent challenge of distinguishing authenticity from imitation within a short span of time, Lumian adopted a stratagem of unleashing an onslaught indiscriminately comprising both genuine and illusory manifestations. For truth could not be falsified, nor could falsity be genuine. In an abrupt detonation, the Guillaume Benet before him disintegrated. Rumble. 
accompanied by the explosion, amid which a multitude of fire ravens were prematurely engulfed in combustion, a water cannon sculpted from dark green liquid surged forth from the fate Guillaume Benet's fragmented remnants. The water cannon, of astonishing alacrity and proximity, penetrated Lumian's fiery shroud, impinging upon his form. As a consequence, Lumian's physique began exhibiting telltale signs of liquefaction. Drainier gland poison. One of three contractual abilities he could use as a metallic entity. With a brittle crack, Lumian's corporeal structure fractured, metamorphosing into mirrors. A mere ten meters from Guillaume Benet, Franca, owing to the activation of mirror substitution, involuntarily escaped her state of invisibility. Observing her emergence, Guillaume Benet's blue irises assumed a pallor bordering on translucence. A deft push of his right palm propagated the emergence of an expansive river of mercurial sigils encircling Franca. Pitting himself directly against Lumian Lee proved to be a disconcerting engagement for Guillaume Benet. His paramount and most formidable fate appropriator ability remained inaccessible, for its utilization would catalyze a consequential backlash from inevitability. Since it couldn't be used on Lumian Lee, it could be used on his companion. Chapter 330 Forewarned is Forearmed A fate appropriator harbored two primary abilities, firstly, the capacity to magnify a corresponding fate tributary, thereby setting in stone an imminent destiny for the target. This process could be expeditious, yet its future influence spanned a mere ten seconds. The resulting efficacy was contingent upon environmental compatibility, a more congruent backdrop augmented the probability of the event materializing in the forthcoming future. Secondly, the ability to swap an accumulated fate for a fragment of the target's own destiny. Absent a premeditated arrangement, one had to either kill the adversary to access their fate or employ their personal fate as a substitute. Relatively more protracted in execution than magnifying an impending fate tributary, this method prohibited one from assailing the target or inducing harm mid-process. At this moment, Guillaume Benet, who wasn't fighting one-on-one, -on -one, clearly didn't want to engage in a fate exchange. His plan was to utilize the current environment and magnify Lumian Lee's female companion's fate tributary of being affected by the Abyss Demon Flower's anesthetic gas to make it a reality. Of course, as the woman in the Black Hood hadn't fallen asleep and wouldn't be paralyzed or knocked unconscious for ten seconds, the sole recourse was to expedite the process while steering it toward the most dire outcome. In a similar vein, this elucidated one of the rationales behind Guillaume Benet's abstention from interfering with Lumian Lee's fate tributary. What he refrained from attempting was the exchange of the adversary's fate or the inversion of key tributaries into the principal course, lest he suffered the backlash invoked by inevitability. He wouldn't have a problem if he only made Lumian Lee slip and fall, achieving futures that wouldn't have significant impact. The mercurial river encircling Franco was reflected in Guillaume Benet's lightened eyes. After some discernment, he grabbed at one of the tributaries formed by the mercury symbol that wrapped around itself. Concurrently, Franca arched her neck, thereby unveiling her supple neck and moist vermilion lips under the hood's shadows. Peculiarly, a palpable flutter stirred in Guillaume Benet's chest, reverberating to his nether regions as he recollected scenes of his liaisons with courtesans along Rue de la Muraille. Yet, these recollections paled in allure compared to the figure opposite him, despite her visage remaining partially veiled. Despite his momentary lapse, Guillaume Benet promptly reinstated his focus. Capitalizing upon this fleeting respite, Franca, enlightened to the general scope of a fate appropriator's abilities courtesy of Lumian, sparked latent black flames, engendering frost that enshrouded her form. Opaque filaments converged, manifesting palpable encasement amid the frigid shroud, akin to a cocoon. Unperturbed, Guillaume Benet's lips curled into a smirk, unfazed by the unfolding situation. If a fate appropriator's abilities were so easily rendered ineffectual, they wouldn't be called fate appropriators. Furthermore, as long as the target's fate tributary was magnified or underwent a fate exchange, they wouldn't be able to break free even if they used a substitute. With measured deliberation, Guillaume Benet extended his right palm and executed a slight wrist rotation, magnifying a particular fate he had chosen. 
Nonetheless, in this precise instant, he perceived the hooded lady's fate river adopting an uncanny semblance of illusory ambiguity, an etherealness so pronounced as to border on feigned fabrication. A decoy. Guillaume Benet's endeavor to augment the fate tributary was abruptly thwarted. The cocoon disintegrated, frost fragmenting, and black flames metamorphosing into coruscating beams of light. Yet, the focus of the protection wasn't Franca herself, but rather, a mirror. Capitalizing on Guillaume Benet's momentary bewilderment, a casualty of the demoness of pleasure's allure and his self-imposed adverse effects, Franca seized the initiative. Employing mirror substitution, she ensconced herself in layers of black flames, frost, and spider silk, confounding the adversary while concealing the real lethal peril. Thus, she extricated herself from the figurative crosshairs, evading the adversary's targeting. Simultaneously with the failure of Guillaume Benet's attempt to amplify the fate tributary, a figure garbed in an assassin's attire manifested behind him, its visage partially obscured by a classic brass revolver, aimed steadfastly at the enemy's cranium before pulling the trigger. Bang! The iron-black round collided with the dodging Guillaume Benet's head, emitting a distinct metallic clang. Guillaume Benet's head, bedecked in a metallic sheen, yielded to the impact, though its structural integrity endured, deflecting a potentially lethal strike. Nearly in tandem, Lumian, having used mirror substitution to evade the effects of drainer gland poison, and draped in flaming clothes, emerged nearby. Dropping to a genuflecting posture, he pressed his palms to the ground. In response, twin crimson fire serpents surged into being, consuming the incendiary vines while spreading the flames along their trajectory, ultimately converging to form a colossal pair of fire dragons. Both entities surged toward Guillaume Benet. However, their purpose wasn't to ingest their quarry, but to intertwine and coalesce, giving rise to an ostentatious and brilliant conflagration blooming flower. As the fiery flower unfurled before him, Guillaume Benet grappled with comprehending Lumian Lee's intentions. With his steel body, his resistance to flames was steadfast for the time being, but the other party wouldn't go as far as wasting an opportunity and do nothing but perform fire magic, right? This was bribe. Lumian had gifted Guillaume Benet with a blazing flower, an emblem signifying incineration and obliteration. Capitalizing on the decency brooch, he had completed a bribe, thereby attenuating the adversary's defenses. Although Lumian Lee's true motives remained opaque, Guillaume Benet's intuition kindled with the conviction that this augured unfavorably. In rapid succession, Guillaume Benet invoked light incarnation anew, fragmenting into three iterations as he advanced toward Lumian. As Franca's assault faltered, she vanished anew. Witnessing the three iterations of the metalized Guillaume Benet rapidly engorge, Lumian conjured a new cohort of fire ravens and distributed them evenly amongst the trio of adversaries. Then, turning his form and slowing his pace, he primed himself for a prospective evasion of the ensuing water cannon conjured from Draenir gland poison. Swoosh! 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 The crimson fire ravens landed precisely on the three metalized Guillaume Bennets. Rumble, rumble, rumble. They exploded simultaneously. A torrent of dark green liquid surged forth from one of Guillaume Benet's forms, water cannon. Lumian, braced for the assault, deftly evaded, his gaze fixed upon the collision of aqueous impact against the rocky wall, a tremor rippling through the bottle of fiction. Yet, as Lumian's evasion completed, he detected a colossal shadow enshrouding his feet. Thereupon, a medley of pallid white and obsidian black arms extended forth from this obscurity. In contrast, Lumian's other choice of direction was shrouded in a dark shadow. At sequence 5, light incarnation permitted Guillaume Benet the creation of up to three incarnations, each incarnation fake. One harbored drainer gland poison, while the other pair wielded shadow burial, intent on ensnaring Lumian within their shade-infused grasp. Curved, grotesque limbs ensnared Lumian's ankles, striving to haul him into the nebulous depths. Amid this peril, a figure emerged from the inky depths, a half-naked, metallic-finished Guillaume Benet. Shadow burial was a form of shadow concealment for him. By capitalizing on three light incarnations, which consumed a large amount of spirituality, to veil his position, thereby detaining Lumian temporarily, 
Guillaume Benet engineered his stealthy approach via the shadows, orchestrating a decisive assault. His body suddenly expanded as he punched Lumian behind the ear. A thunderous crack resonated as Lumian's form fragmented akin to a glass pane, fracturing into myriad minuscule fragments subsequently claimed by the pallid white and obsidian black arms. Mirror Substitution It was precisely due to the implementation of mirror substitution that Franca refrained from intervening on Lumian's behalf when she saw him restrained by the strange arms extending from the shadow. Rather, she bided her time, anticipating Guillaume Benet's advent to administer a terminal blow. Amidst the cracking sounds, Franca's hooded, black-robed figure involuntarily appeared once more, quickly spotted by the Padre. Guillaume Benet had been waiting for this opportunity to stop himself from being affected by the charm and turn his blue eyes light-colored again. He saw the mercurial river of fate and began to choose the fate of being paralyzed by the burning gases of the abyss demon flowers. Yet, an abrupt surge of peril seized Guillaume Benet's consciousness, compelling a stark realization, interference with the adversary's fate would undoubtedly yield cataclysmic repercussions. Impossible. Moments earlier, such consequences hadn't arisen. Yet, as he scrutinized the figure before him, Guillaume Benet, who had been able to interfere with his target's fate normally previously to near success, saw a hooded woman hiding behind the hooded woman. The woman behind her held a palm-sized mirror that illuminated his figure. In an instant, Guillaume Benet understood what was going on. The hooded woman standing in front of him, revealing the river of fate, was Lumian Lee. After activating mirror substitution, he took the initiative to appear in front of his companion. Seizing the opportunity, he used a transfiguration-like ability to change his appearance and disguise himself as his companion. You do realize, using the same trick won't work twice? Franca, who was hiding behind Lumian, chuckled when she saw this. Seeing Lumian under attack, she took out her teammate's mirror substitution and threw it in front of her. Taking advantage of the cover and the enemy's drawn attention, she aimed another mirror at Guillaume Benet. Without hesitation, Franca's palm was enveloped in black flames as she swiped the mirror's surface. Curse! Demonis Curse! In a simultaneous eruption, a quietly smoldering black flame ignited from within Guillaume Benet's metallic form. Elated that his steel body rendered him impervious to conflagration, inflicting only minor wounds, he soon perceived an anomalous drain on his spirit, coupled with indications of severe ethereal scorching. In the span of an eye's flutter, the Cordu village padre emitted a tormented cry. Instantaneously, his metallic semblance plummeted to the earth with a cacophonous clatter, reconstituting into a form unadorned by metal, starkly naked and manifestly fleshy. At the same time, Franca, too, experienced a visceral tremor, her countenance assuming a pallid hue. Rebirth The contract ability in question facilitated Guillaume Benet's revival within the Slayer's body. Guillaume Benet's spirit smiled and hastened to replace the woman holding the mirror and take control of her body. Yet, he confronted a disconcerting reality, before him stood an enshrouded woman brandishing a mirror, bearing her lower visage in a manner reminiscent of malevolent allure. She's in front. Then whose body did I rebirth into? A disorienting befuddlement inundated Guillaume Benet. Meanwhile, Lumian, ensconced within Franca's semblance, donned a knowing grin, gradually retracting his right palm from the Padre's lifeless cadaver, the decency brooch aglow with a dusky golden luminescence. Distortion how could he not guard against Guillaume Benet's rebirth ability when he already knew that Guillaume Benet's mistress had chosen such an ability? Lumian couldn't overtly commandeer Guillaume Benet's rebirth with his seal and corruption alone. Nevertheless, Lumian, resembling Franca with uncanny precision, had already instructed Franca to bring the Earth Blood Ore. Innately repellent to even the Montsouris ghost, the earth blood ore imposed an unseen force field compelling Guillaume Benet's spirit body's circumvention. Leveraging the distortion afforded by the decency brooch, coupled with the earth blood ore's obstructive efficacy and the knee's face's transformation, Lumian orchestrated Guillaume Benet's rebirth within his very body. Although Lumian's visage paled and his frame quivered slightly, a smile graced his lips as he extended his hand towards his left chest gently declaring, Padre, everyone is waiting for you. 
Chapter 331 Spirit Channeling As Lumian's words reverberated, an inexplicable chill settled over Guillaume Benet, even in his spirit body form. Simultaneously, a peculiar tug gripped him, causing him to involuntarily convolute and plunge towards a specific direction. There, a colossal, semi-transparent vortex unfurled, ensconced in a wispy gray fog at its nadir. Within this haze materialized a dimly lit village, populated by spectral forms. One of these apparitions gazed skyward, noticing Guillaume Benet's struggle against the vortex's inexorable pull. His pale white face instantly lit up with excitement and fanaticism as he shouted, Oh, my deity, my lord, you're here too? Quickly, join us. Hasten your approach. The figure belonged to Guillaume Benet's brother, Pons Benet. Sensing Pons Benet's abnormality, the figures lingering in the dim village looked up at Guillaume Benet. Among them, Madonna Benet, Philippa Guillaume, and the others, who had once been Guillaume Benet's mistresses, extended their pale white arms to the sky and smiled blankly. Quickly, join us. Hasten your approach. Immediately after, Shepherd Pierre Barry, Lumian's comrade Guillaume Barry, Azema Lizier, and more added their supplicating gestures. In an instant, a peculiar, pallid forest seemingly sprouted from within the village's dim enclave, its spectral denizens directing their palms towards the Padre. Guillaume Benet's descent escalated, his spirit body verging on fragmentation. Struggling to counteract the vortex's pull, he sought to resist its sway, aiming to evade its dominion and flee Lumian's profoundly perilous vessel. He couldn't care less about the rebirth in the other party's body and the corresponding fate. That was something he couldn't bear. Lumian's grin expanded, seemingly attuned to the cacophony of terror and anguish echoing within his own body. Indeed, possessing him via rebirth and forcing a possession by luring others over via the summoning dance were completely different treatments. The former would form a connection with his fate and, in an attempt to replace it, it would inevitably trigger the seal. Guillaume Benet's profound corruption by inevitability meant that the resonance of this seal's potency was inevitable. Though Lumian remained ignorant of the precise ramifications, he intuited they would bode ill. Perceiving Guillaume Benet's vehement longing to extricate himself, Lumian opted to refrain from thwarting his escape, willingly relinquishing any interference. Post-rebirth, save for scenarios involving specific domains such as Sun, Lumian lacked the capability to forcibly expel an uncooperative Guillaume Benet from his body. Mirror substitution, too, proved ineffectual in such a case. However, should Guillaume Benet yearn to depart, the course of action was rendered straightforward. Ultimately, Guillaume Benet, having expended a considerable amount of his spirituality, struggled to escape from Lumian's body. Precisely then, Lumian deftly rotated his wrist, enlisting distortion anew. A dark golden glimmer traversed his chest, heralding Guillaume Benet's emergence within the palm-sized mirror clasped in Franca's grasp. Franca's palm coalesced an unblemished frost, which she spread over the mirror's surface. Instantaneously, Guillaume Benet's form became ensconced within a veneer of ice, ensnared within the mirror's confines. Concurrently, Franca summoned black flames, which enshrouded the icy enclosure. Though the ice in itself was inadequate to bar a spirit body's escape from the mirror, the shrouding black flames bore that capability. Should Guillaume Benet dare venture beyond the ice's protection, the flames awaited to engulf him. With Guillaume Benet's spirit body securely sealed, Franca glanced up at Lumian, who had removed the paper balls, and directed, Channel his spirit after we're out. Your flames and anesthetic gas are everywhere. With her physique in expenditure, holding on for another two or three minutes sans mirror substitution posed no undue challenge. Nonetheless, she sensed Lumian reaching his threshold. Affirming Franca's directive with a nod, Lumian briskly pivoted and surged towards the bottle of fiction's exit. Consequent to Guillaume Benet's demise, the concealed trap had naturally been lifted. Having returned to the sacrificial hall, Lumian promptly dissipated the knee's face, reverting his appearance from that of Franca's hooded visage and black robe. His upper body bore the telltale markings of being charred, yet owing to his skillful management following the initial digestion of the pyromaniac potion, his trousers remained unscathed. 
This approach, evoking pain, stimulating cerebral activity, and rousing his senses, didn't necessitate subjecting his entire form to incineration, localized scorching proved sufficient. Observing his somewhat unconventional appearance, Franca, torn between concern and amusement, chimed in with an air of teasing, do you have a penchant for masochism? You go through this ordeal every time you engage in combat. Lumian directed his attention toward the mirror ablaze in Franca's grip and casually responded, that's how hunters are. I'd be deluding myself if I bought into your fabrications. I'm an instigator, after all. Franca had borne witness to prior pyromaniac skirmishes. Witnessing their conversational exchange, Jenna deduced that their adversary had been ensnared and the situation had reached its resolution. Thus, she emerged from the concealment of the shadows. Franca graced her with a smile before turning her attention back to Lumian, relaying, Hold on for a moment. Don't fret. Guillaume Benet isn't entirely dead yet. Once the rebirth effect wanes, he'll morph into a recently expired spirit, his faculties adrift. At that juncture, channeling his spirit will prove less hazardous, and we can be sure he doesn't lie. Lumian calculated the remaining duration of the decency brooch's efficacy and remarked, let's wait here. Leveraging the mystical knowledge gleaned from the boon, he discerned that the rebirth effect endured merely two minutes, its termination was imminent. Abandoning their current location to embark on a quest for a more secure locale for spirit channeling would necessitate identifying another concealed setting, subjecting Lumian to an additional hour of repulsion before spirit channeling could ensue. The optimal time frame for spirit channeling would subsequently elapse. Moreover, Lumian harbored a reluctance to further procrastinate. Franca nodded in understanding. Stepping toward the altar, she set the mirror upon the pitch-black ring symbol crafted from thorns, thereby maintaining the enshrouding black flames. This facilitated Lumian's observation. Fixated on Guillaume Benet's pale and ashen visage, ensnared beneath the duality of black flames and ice, Lumian smirked with brilliant satisfaction gradually etched upon his lips. He uttered, You're truly foolish. If I were you, I'd evade and refrain from launching an assault post-steel body activation, awaiting the adversary's inevitable fatigue. Ah, I neglected to apprise you. My spirituality has plummeted below the safety threshold, thereby making spirit world traversal or even utilization of the spell of Harumph impossible. I'm barely able to kindle fire, changing my face, and using the brooch. Should you have bided your time, I would have neared my limit and fainted on the spot. I acted rashly and reacted relatively slowly towards the end. On the one hand, I didn't want to expend more spirituality and wanted to save them for critical moments. On the other hand, mirror substitution consumed Franca's spirituality. On the other hand, haha, <laughs> it was a trap for you. Do you remember the flaming flower? Without this gift to complete bribe, Franca's curse wouldn't have been able to kill you, a sequence five. Upon hearing the term spell of Harumph and recalling Lumian's actions of knocking out two fake Guillaume Bennets in a row, Franca's eyelids twitched in shock and confusion. Jenna looked at Lumian, who kept mocking the spirit body in the mirror, and tugged at Franca with a measure of concern. She whispered, perhaps we should attempt to assuage him? No need. Franca shook her head and took the initiative to distance herself from Lumian, giving him a private space to vent. Jenna tersely acknowledged and followed Franca to the edge of the sacrificial hall, casting a lingering glance at the visage of pallid, pale white and ashen hues reflected within the mirror. Guillaume Benet emanated a mixture of hostility, terror, and ultimately, despair. Dill Brothel, Sixth Floor On a distant balcony, Albus positioned himself in a discreet corner, his concealed gaze unwaveringly fixed upon room 602. Once Lumian and his companions had seemingly teleported away, Albus stepped out from his concealment, a wry smile tugging at his lips. To think a mere sequence seven individual wields an artifact that enables traversal of the spirit world? His connection with red boots isn't simple. Whether Gardner Martin is privy to this or remains in the dark, I wonder. As he muttered, Albus's smile carried a hint of ambiguity and playful intrigue. 50 Rue Vincent, Underground Sacrificial Hall. 
Lumion's continuous taunting endured until the rebirth effect gradually subsided, a shadow darkening Guillaume Benet's eyes. Meanwhile, Franca, intently calculating the elapsed time, positioned herself near the altar and erected a wall of spirituality, priming herself for the forthcoming endeavor. With the moment at hand, she softly intoned the incantation, engaging her self-devised magic mirror spirit channeling spell. Yet, just as success appeared imminent, Lumian summoned the decency brooch's distortion once again, rerouting the inquiry of the magic mirror spirit channeling spell toward himself. In a final bid for success within a singular attempt, he even invoked the knee's face, transfiguring into Franca once more. Almost instantaneously, the mirror's surface dimmed, casting Guillaume Benet's pale visage into a slightly blurred disposition. With his capacity to sustain the knee's face dissipated, Lumian reverted to his original form and shifted his focus back to Guillaume Benet. Who led you to place faith in inevitability? Although Franca harbored a degree of curiosity, she was mindful of the repercussions of Lumian broaching forbidden topics, thus jeopardizing her corruption. Subsequently, she parted the wall of spirituality, positioning herself at a distance from the altar. Guillaume Benet, in a somewhat dazed state, responded, it was Aurora Lee. Upon discovering that the faith of an accursed deity was disseminating, she covertly approached me, affirming that I could harness superpowers without supplicating the bishops. Moreover, I was assured of the prospect of obtaining godhood in the future potentially ascending to the rank of saint and thereby securing eternal life. At the time, I remained skeptical. Nevertheless, my curiosity compelled me to withhold judgment. Over time, however, I witnessed her burgeoning might, my reservations gradually subsiding. After a brief lull, Lumian inquired, his blue gaze intense, who influenced Aurora Lee to embrace inevitability. I don't know. Guillaume Benet's bewilderment was palpable as he shook his head. Following a moment of contemplation, Lumian continued his line of questioning, what profound impression did Aurora Lee leave upon you? Guillaume Benet's countenance shifted, a semblance of recollection mingling with apprehension. She, she said that she was an Aurora Lee. Chapter 332, Sinners She said she was an Aurora Lee. Lumian felt as if a bolt of lightning had struck him, his thoughts freezing in their tracks. In fact, he could deduce that Aurora Lee wasn't his sister's real name. Someone deliberately settling in a border village wouldn't likely use their true identity. Yet, after almost six years together, he could sense that his sister embraced the name Aurora Lee. She never spoke of her original identity or her past life in his presence. Moreover, the forged identity documents she possessed seemed increasingly genuine. When she rose to fame as a best-selling author, their authenticity was unquestionable. Why would she suddenly say that? And how did it tie into her inexplicable faith in the enigmatic existence known as inevitability? A sharp ache throbbed in Lumian's head, jolting him back to reality. Anxiously, he inquired, did she mention who she was? On the mirror-like surface, no longer shrouded in black flames and frost, Guillaume Benet, pallid and tinged with a bluish hue, responded with a dazed expression, she claimed to be Roche-Louise Sanson. I've never heard of such a name. Lumian furrowed his brow and probed further, did she mention anything else about this identity? Guillaume Benet shook his head. Nothing more. Lumian pressed his left hand against his temple. After a brief silence, he pressed on. Was Roche Louise Sanson involved in the plot to sacrifice Cordu in exchange for the arrival of the inevitability angel? Guillaume Benet appeared to wrestle with himself, but ultimately yielded to the sway of the spirit channeling. His response came forth, candid and unfiltered No, that was my doing. I was driven by the desire to attain godhood swiftly, to ascend as a saint. Aurora Lee initially approved, only to oppose my plan mere hours later. She was indecisive. Eventually, I chose to conceal my intentions from her and made covert preparations. Later on, she seemed to tacitly endorse our efforts, offering aid during critical junctures. Occasionally, though, she resisted and engaged in acts of destruction, yet she'd quickly relent. The aurora you depict almost seems schizophrenic. 
Lumian found himself clinging to the image of Aurora, yet he couldn't escape the memory of the lizard-like, diaphanous elf emerging from his sister's mouth. He recalled her sporadic awakenings, her discussions on escaping their predicament. But even in those moments of clarity, Aurora's behavior hardly resembled normalcy. She even overlooked the option of summoning Gila's messenger for swift assistance, the most direct solution out of their ordeal. Lumian shifted the conversation, asking, when did Aurora begin propagating the faith of inevitability in Cordu? Guillaume Benet appeared even more muddled than before. My initial investigation pointed to around May or June of last year. After that, she paid me a secret visit. Seems to be consistent with my suspicions. Something must have transpired back then to corrupt Aurora. If she was an original believer in inevitability, she wouldn't wait five or six years before proselytizing. Lumian's expression flickered with pain, which he quickly suppressed. Have you ever come across diaphanous, lizard-like creatures in Cordu? No, Guillaume Benet answered truthfully. Do you have any knowledge of a figure known as the Sufferer in Cordu? Lumian inquired further. Guillaume Benet appeared taken aback. I don't know. No. Lumian's facial muscles twitched involuntarily. Have you observed an owl around Aurora? No, Guillaume Benet negated again. Lumian continued to pose inquiries regarding the Cordu catastrophe, yet the answers offered were far from satisfactory. Finally, he probed, is there a secret organization or a heretical church associated with Roche-Louis Sanson? Guillaume Benet, his pallid countenance increasingly diffused, finally nodded. Yes, it's called Sinners. I now hold the position of one of the Sinners' archbishops. Sinners. The heretical church which believes in inevitability. Lumian's intrigue grew as he delved further. Who leads the Sinners? and who acts as the intermediary for you. I'm uncertain of the leader's identity, but he's the sole individual among all the sinners who possesses godhood, Guillaume Benet's hollow voice responded with an eerie timbre. The individual responsible for my contact is Bouvard Pontpero. Sole individual possessing godhood. Could it be the sufferer lurking in my midst? Lumian's mind raced as he continued his probing. How can I establish contact with Bouvard Pontpero? It's futile, Guillaume Benet's ethereal voice replied, a hollowness to its tone. Upon my demise, he will sense the shift in fate and preemptively erase all traces transfiguration is one of the abilities granted through a pact. He can become anything, but he is no longer himself. Can take on any form, but at the cost of his own identity. Prolonged use of transfiguration might have driven him to complete madness. Perhaps I can visit the asylum and seek out any patients with similar cognitive impairments. I must be careful with acquiring further contract abilities. If there are only three or four negative effects, that's manageable. However, if the list becomes extensive, it not only invites trouble but also provides enemies with exploitable openings. If the Padre had encountered a member of the Bliss Society or a bestowed from the Mother Tree of Desire, he would undoubtedly fall victim easily. Lumian gazed at the altar mirror and posed another question, why did the sinner's organization send you to Cartier de la Princesse Rouge? Guillaume Benet's indistinct visage lit up with zealous fervor. It satisfies my desires and simultaneously serves as a recruitment ground for believers, all in preparation for the upcoming grand ritual. Only by allowing our Lord to tread upon this realm can sinners like us seek redemption and baptism, thus escaping our predetermined fates. Did the sinner's organization provide you financial support, or did you amass funds independently? Lumian aimed to trace the origins of the money for potential leads. Guillaume Benet shook his head. It's an anonymous deposit from Aurora Lee, no, Roche-Louise Sanson. The sum totals 100,000 Verl d'Or. Damn it, you swine. Lumian cursed. While he had foreseen this, the realization that the Padre had been using Aurora's earnings to support a courtesan and sustain a lavish lifestyle for recruiting heretics ignited a seething anger within Lumian. Suppressing his emotions, Lumian let out a scornful chuckle and stated, Did the sinner's organization not provide you beyond her characteristics? Have you never consumed a potion? Otherwise, the Padre would have been even more formidable and difficult to deal with. 
beyond are characteristics of the seer, monster, apprentice, and marauder pathways that inevitabilities bestowed are compatible with aren't easily acquired. I've been searching for them. Given the adverse effects those contracted creatures have on me, drinking potions from other pathways would undoubtedly lead to a loss of control on the spot. Fortunately, my current negative effects remain minimal and feeble. If they were more potent, it could jeopardize my ability to ingest hunter pathway potions in the future. Lumian's spirituality was dwindling, so he capitalized on the moment to pose one final inquiry. What are sequences 6-0 of the inevitability pathway? Guillaume Benet's voice hollowed further. Sequence 6 is ascetic, sequence 5 is fate appropriator, sequence 4 is circle inhabitant, and sequence 3 is sufferer. Beyond that, I am unaware. Ascetic. It seems akin to the advancement of an alms monk. Why didn't Termoboros inform me? Right, as a victim, he will likely have the ascetic boon extracted from him in the future. It's only natural for him to evade answering related queries. If he remained utterly impassive and too willing to provide an answer, I would have grown wary and suspected a trap. Lumian's gaze lifted slightly, his countenance involuntarily contorting. What abilities does an ascetic possess? Guillaume Benet's voice drifted as he responded, an ascetic is defined by endurance, accumulation, and eruption. After accruing one's usual strength within the body, it can be momentarily unleashed during combat, rendering the ascetic akin to a giant. Accumulating ritualistic processes permits the simplification of certain special rituals, making them applicable in combat. Akin to a giant. A momentary outburst. Lumian recollected the confrontation between Shepard Pierre Barry and the investigator, Ryan, along with the metallic giant the Padre had morphed into. Had the metalized Guillaume Benet not been overly cautious of the spell of Harumph and abstained from close-quarter combat, constantly maintaining a safe distance and shifting positions swiftly, thereby thwarting Franca's psychic piercing, by amalgamating steel body with ascetic, the Padre could have likely outmatched Lumian, who needed to use his spirituality judiciously. This corroborated Lumian's rationale for disregarding the strange creatures that came with the boon's knowledge and opting to identify a contract target from the spirit world bestiary. If he hadn't, the Padre would have been able to determine if the spell of Harumph was still at Lumian's disposal and gauging his remaining combat strength. In that scenario, his adversary's battlefield decisions would probably have starkly diverged from the ultimate outcome. Guillaume Benet had earlier shared details of the simplified ritual. By enveloping an individual in sheepskin through ritualistic accumulation and intoning the incantation, they could be transmuted into a sheep. A cumbersome and intricate ceremony was unnecessary. Just as Lumian was on the cusp of inquiring about the abilities of a sufferer, an acute pang surged through his head, thwarting his continuation. A pang of disappointment ensued, albeit one he could accept. Had Franca not devised the magic mirror spirit channeling spell, Lumian wouldn't have been able to amass such a wealth of answers through his line of questioning. Lumian engaged his spirit vision and concluded the spirit channeling. He took deep breaths as Guillaume Benet's spirit drifted out of the mirror. Having calmed down, Lumian suddenly extended his right palm, capturing the Padre's spirit body. Though his grasp couldn't control the intangible entity, Crimson flames surged forth from Lumian's palm, immolating the already fragile spirit of Guillaume Benet. Amid the flames, which burned fiercer than the noonday sun, Lumian watched the apparition writhe instinctively, a pained visage etched upon it. A faint smile curved Lumian's lips as he proclaimed, Praise the sun. Momentarily bewildered, Guillaume Benet's form swiftly disintegrated within the flames. Chapter 333, Gains Lumian's smile gradually softened as he watched the spirit body writhing and wailing within the flames. This was one of the ways the Padre died as he had predicted. Certainly, when he initially ignited the abyss demon flowers, transforming the derelict mine within the bottle of fiction into a fiery inferno, he hadn't anticipated Guillaume Benet's direct incineration. During that moment, he had relied on his combat instincts and seasoned experience to create an environment that favored his strengths and mitigated his most vulnerable points. 
the summoning of the abyss demon flowers by the Padre had presented an opportunity. The anesthetic gas produced by the incineration of the abyss demon flowers wasn't his intention. His aim was to battle within an infernal hell. During that period, his remaining spirituality had been scarce. Nonetheless, a pyromaniac's resistance to flames significantly outclassed the fate appropriators. Moreover, this resistance was a physical attribute that didn't deplete his spirituality. As the bottle of fiction transformed into a blazing inferno, even the very air could scorch the trachea and lungs. Lumian believed he would ultimately prevail. He could outlast Guillaume Benet, enduring until the flames extinguished themselves due to lack of fuel. With his grasp of the inevitability pathway, and in the absence of unforeseen deviations for Sequence 6 Beyonders, Guillaume Benet's constitution was merely more robust than that of an ordinary person. His strength lay in his flexibility and tolerance, rather than fire resistance. Lumian's observations during the quarter confrontations validated this point. Both Guillaume Benet and Pierre Barry, individuals who had clearly progressed beyond Sequence 7, exhibited remarkable combat capabilities, albeit lacking commensurate defensive attributes. Lumian hadn't anticipated the Padre contracting the Steel Body ability. This ability possessed pros and cons. On the one hand, it thwarted Lumian's initial plan for an infernal hell. On the other hand, it curtailed the Padre's own capabilities, granting Lumian an opportunity to contend more effectively and unseal the entrance to the bottle of fiction. This would permit his accomplice to join the fray and offer assistance. Lumian subsequently exploited Guillaume Benet's determination to eliminate unnecessary obstructions by dealing with Franca first. He then improvised, crafting a lethal snare. Amidst the sizzle of burning air, Guillaume Benet's wailing spirit body disintegrated swiftly, gradually dissipating. With the task accomplished, Lumian pivoted, acknowledging Franca and Jenna with a nod, signifying his completion. In the ensuing instant, he staggered toward the altar, retrieving the skins of cow, sheep, and dog. These items were whole, exuding a sinister aura upon closer inspection. These constituted specialized hides, amassed through the initial half of the animal creation spell ritual, harnessed by leveraging ascetic powers for accumulation. Upon grasping the corresponding incantation and enveloping individuals and oneself with these skins, the animal creation spell could be executed outright. Although Lumian hadn't yet deciphered the predetermined incantation for animal creation or its nullification, these obstacles could be surmounted in due course. He could, for instance, detain Paulina, the Padre's butler, and others to determine if they possessed such knowledge. Alternatively, he could engage a cryptologist of the Marauder Pathway to decode the incantation. He could even resort to trial and error, applying his knowledge of the inevitability domain and his comprehension of Guillaume Benet's persona. Last of all, he could use divination to get any clarity on success. Thus, these two sheepskins, a single cowhide, and two dogskins held considerable value. Employed judiciously, they could unleash unparalleled effects. Guillaume Benet had nearly beguiled Lumian previously by adopting the guise of a massive, brown furred dog, attempting to flee Rue Vincent and sever their destined encounter. However, his fanaticism and inevitability's boon and his greed due to his contract had overridden reason. This led him to transition from prey to hunter, setting a trap in reverse. When Lomian's body began to sway as if he had lost his footing, Franca and Jenna lent their support, each helping him bear a share of the cow, sheep, and dog skins. In that instant, the bottle of fiction quaked. Stripped of Guillaume Benet's reinforcement and subjected to the infernal hellfire for a duration, it eventually fractured akin to ice, its fragments plunging into the void. The derelict cavern, encompassed by its confinement, unveiled itself to Lumian and his companions through the secret door. All the abyss demon flowers had been reduced to ashes and strewn across the ground. The flames had exhausted their combustibles, and bereft of Lumian's spirituality, most had dwindled to cinders. Only select regions persisted with a crimson luminescence, which was waning steadily. Lumian glanced at Franca and said, I'll head back to Rue de Blouse's Blanches through Underground Trier. Carry the earth blood or as you make your way to the surface. Once the decency brooch was removed, Lumian would inevitably be scorned by those around him. 
Should he retrace his steps, numerous mishaps could befall him. Alternatively, if he didn't remove it, an alert would be triggered within two to three minutes, attracting the attention of nearby official beyonders or concealed factions. Given the potential complications involved in carrying the earth blood or into the underground, coupled with the possible difficulties Jenna might encounter upon receiving it, Franca nodded, pursing her lips, and turned toward Jenna. Follow Seal. He's at his limit. He might not even stand a chance against the dog. If it's the same dog as before, I wouldn't be able to defeat it, Lumian muttered. As the exit on the opposite side of the abandoned mine remained unobstructed, a frigid gust swept into the sacrificial hall, dispersing the anesthetic gas with the fragmentation of the bottle of fiction. Lumian staggered onward, arriving at the charred remains of Guillaume Benet. He kicked the body and turned it over, ensuring nothing was concealed within. Lumian picked up the iron-gray military alcohol flask and advanced toward the abandoned mine's exit. There, he noticed a brown fur dog skin that no longer bore a sinister aura. This particular area had avoided incineration, leaving the dog skin intact. Nevertheless, the process of reconstituting the animal creation spell ritual was mandatory. Only through the application of an ascetic's ability could it regain its status as a beyonder item. Beyond the abandoned mine's exit, two objects were propped against the rocky wall. One comprised a kerosene-lit lantern, while the other was a dark green canvas backpack favored by adventurers and mercenaries. Lumian hoisted the backpack, finding it surprisingly weighty. It was almost too heavy to lift. Curious, Franca crouched down and unfastened the backpack. Within it lay gratifying gold bars, stacks of banknotes, and golden coins. Wow! Franca exclaimed. So much money? Lumian's initial thought was, thank goodness, the Padre didn't expend all of Aurora's accrued royalties. This was followed by a rather visceral reaction, fucking damn it, this man is so sinister. Evidently, Guillaume Benet had anticipated the possibility that Paulina and the others might not escape. In such an eventuality, Lumian and his companions could deduce that the Padre had chosen an alternate escape route based on the scarce funds carried by these inevitability believers. Consequently, they would converge on the basement, inadvertently walking into a trap. Not too shabby, not at all, Franca remarked, grinning. While these heretics might not drop characteristics, they do drop other spoils. Indicating upward with her hand, she continued, I'm heading back up. Pass me this dog skin. She relinquished the three ritualistic hides to Jenna and returned to 50 Rue Vincent, clutching Guillaume Benet's dog skin. Jenna slung the dark green canvas bag over her shoulder, gripping the five sinister hides. She observed as Lumian picked up the lantern and kindled it. After a few strides through the dim tunnel outside the abandoned mine, Lumian promptly removed the decency brooch and placed it in another military alcohol flask hanging from his waist, sinking it to the bottom of the liquor. Lumian took a few more steps before suddenly shuddering. He turned around, glancing at Jenna who was trailing behind. Jenna, clasping the cow, sheep, and dog skins while toting the canvas bag, bore a somber expression, marked by repugnance. She struggled to speak, her voice faltering, I, I can control myself. Damn it, I won't beat you up. Though Lumian was skeptical, he had no choice but to continue his journey. After seven to eight minutes, he encountered an abandoned tunnel and settled into a corner, awaiting the dissipation of the decency brooch's adverse effects. He seized the opportunity to rest and recuperate some of his spirituality. The events that transpired at 50 Rue Vincent remained unknown to anyone as Franca methodically erased all evidence and conducted an anti-divination process in the manner befitting a demoness. Throughout this endeavor, she combed through every room. Vigilant against potential corruption, she refrained from delving too deeply, though her explorations yielded neither valuable clues nor significant items of interest. Ultimately, she returned to the parlor on the ground floor, rousing the unconscious imposter Guillaume Benet. The imposter Guillaume Benet gazed at the cloaked figure adorned in a black robe, a brown dogskin clutched within her grasp. For a fleeting moment, he experienced a sensation akin to being trapped within a dream, unable to awaken. Franca emitted a soft chuckle. As you can see, 
we've killed that devil. In her eyes, the imposter Guillaume Benet was no longer identical to the Padre. He had become very unfamiliar. Perhaps this was his true appearance. I, I. The imposter Guillaume Benet stammered in surprise and elation, are you here to aid me? We're demon hunters, Franca fabricated. What else can you tell us about this devil? Though her magic mirror spirit channeling spell enabled Lumian to glean extensive information from Guillaume Benet, its reach had limitations. It could not cover every facet. Further inquiry into relevant individuals was imperative to avert the risk of overlooking crucial leads. The imposter Guillaume Benet found the shrouded woman before him remarkably affable. He contemplated briefly before responding, other than engaging in an affair with my wife and indulging in steak and mutton chops, there's nothing particularly remarkable about that devil. Yes. It, it vanishes for one day each week before resurfacing without fanfare. Disappearing once a week? Frank acknowledged this detail and pursued further inquiries. Having exhausted the potential for extracting additional information, she smiled and subtly instigated the imposter Guillaume Benet. If I were in your position, I'd hastily depart this location. Your wife is akin to a devil. I would relocate any valuable possessions to regions where my identity remains unknown. I'd purchase a new residence, enter a fresh marriage, and embark on a new chapter. Guillaume Benet's heartbeat hastened, and his resolve to stand his ground waned. In the ensuing moment, he observed the woman before him liquefy akin to melting ice. Chapter 334 Clues In the abandoned tunnel, Lumian's eyes snapped open. Unintended slumber had overtaken him, but it also served to rejuvenate his spirituality. At the very least, the pounding in his head had ebbed away, and the searing fire coursing through his veins, organs, and flesh had altogether abetted. Lumian's sight plunged into unadulterated darkness. His hands groped for the lantern that had been snuffed out, and after lighting it, he noticed Jenna. Clad in the guise of a female mercenary, she sat diagonally across from him. She reclined against the tunnel's wall, her gaze affixed to the dark green canvas backpack and the five ritualistic hides splayed before her. Sensing the corresponding motion, Jenna looked up at Lumian. After scrutinizing him for a few seconds, she playfully jested, Finally, you're no longer as annoying. Have the negative effects of the decency brooch been lifted? Lumian instinctively exhaled a sigh of relief. Jenna's lips curled into a grin as she rose, hoisting the dark green canvas backpack onto her shoulder. She told Lumian, Earlier, I entertained notions of beating you up and painting your face with dog poop while you slept but I managed to restrain myself. Much appreciated, Lumian said, his gratitude tinged with sarcasm. With the backpack slung casually over one shoulder, Jenna stooped to gather the five ritualistic hides. Her smile bore an air of leisure as she uttered, You're welcome. And with that, she strode toward the tunnel's exit, a smile dancing on her lips. Chalk it up to me treating you as a friend? You're mocking me again. Lumian grumbled under his breath, picking up the lantern before following suit. Apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches Franca, now dressed in her usual attire, a blouse and light-colored breeches, awaited Lumian and Jenna's return. Her eyes traveled over Lumian's scorched upper body, and a grin formed on her lips. Jenna didn't take the opportunity to stab you a few times? Decency's negative effects aren't as potent as I'd imagined. Jenna interjected before Lumian could respond, for the first half hour, it was a real struggle. I had to hide outside the tunnel where he was resting. Every few minutes, I checked for potential threats from below ground, the ceiling, or behind the rock walls. But even then, I seriously contemplated collapsing the tunnel and burying him alive. That's not what you said just now. Lumian couldn't help but glance at Jenna. For a moment, he couldn't tell if the instigator was telling the truth in the abandoned tunnel or if she was telling the truth now. Franca chuckled and gave Jenna a thumbs up. That couldn't have been easy. You maintained your vigilance, even in a semi-enclosed, deserted tunnel. You anticipated attacks from below, the cave's ceiling, and the very walls surrounding him. 
Jenna's brows relaxed, and her smug smile was unmistakable. You're always feeding me those horror tales, remember? Like hands emerging from the earth to grab ankles, bloody heads dangling from ceilings, or figures springing from walls to embrace the protagonist. Every night's entertainment involves retelling horror stories to Jenna. Lumian glanced at Franca, sensing that her intentions might run deeper. See? Those stories have their uses. Franca beamed. Then she turned her attention to Lumian. Need a doctor? The burns appeared quite severe. No need. For a pyromaniac, it's merely a minor scrape. Lumian refrained from mentioning that he would be fully recovered by 6 a.m. the following morning. And if things worsen, I can always seek out Rat. His nurtured planter hadn't risen to the ranks of a Sequence 8 doctor yet, so his assistance was rather limited at the moment. Observing Lumian's lack of visible discomfort, Franca's concern lessened. She picked up the dark green canvas backpack Jenna had left on the armchair and prepared to place it on the coffee table to meticulously tally their spoils. Casually, Lumian pushed aside cups, plates, newspapers, and magazines that cluttered the table, creating enough space. Glancing around, he noticed the magazine's title, Women. It was a widely read weekly among middle-class Antisian women, showcasing Trier's latest fashion trends, lifestyle advice, and beauty tips. The Lowland Kingdom had its own bootleg version, Ladies' Aesthetic. Lumian raised his head with a smile, and his gaze shifted to Franca, a playful question in his eyes, Oh, you read such magazines? Franca pursed her lips and puffed out her chest in response, What's wrong with me reading women? After their brief exchange, Franca unzipped the backpack and removed banknotes, coins, and gold bars. Roughly 60,000 verl d'or, she assessed after a moment's calculation. In a little over two months, the Padre had managed to deplete 40,000 verl d'or of Aurora's savings. And all that without acquiring beyond her characteristics or obtaining any mystical items. The more Lumian pondered, the more vexed he grew. It wasn't that the Padre lacked options for mystical items, rather, suitable ones were proving elusive. On the one hand, his status as a heretic warranted caution, limiting his exposure. He didn't frequent many mysticism gatherings, and thus remained ignorant about numerous aspects. On the other hand, his slew of contracted creatures came with many negative repercussions. Several mystical items would be counterproductive or perilous for him. Some might even bring about abrupt, fatal consequences. Franca pondered for a moment before addressing Lumian and Jenna, all the gold is Seal's share. I'll take half of the remaining assets. Jenna, you and Anthony can divide the rest. Let's decide on the distribution once Anthony returns and we see what he's managed to acquire. Does that sound fair? This arrangement would allocate around 30,000 Verldor to Lumian and 15,000 to Franca. I'm fine with that, Jenna responded with a hint of concern. But Anthony still hasn't come back. Damn it, could something have happened to him? If it were anyone else, I might suspect trouble, but Anthony is a psychiatrist. He's highly skilled in reading people, so falling into a trap is unlikely for him. Plus, he's an experienced information broker. His tracking abilities are on par with mine or SEALs, Franca explained with a smile. Most importantly, while waiting for you too, I used magic mirror divination to ensure his safety. Heh, it might actually be a good sign that he's taking so long. It suggests he hasn't lost his target and might have gained something. Why do you have to explain so much instead of just saying you checked through divination? Lumian quipped, finding amusement in the situation. Franca made a tongue-clicking sound and chuckled. You don't get it. This is about not solely relying on divination. She gestured toward the five ritualistic hides. Are those the components for the animal creation spell? Can we use them? At the moment, only I can utilize them, Lumian replied, shaking his head. And I haven't obtained Guillaume Benet's preset incantation yet. Franca's expression showed a tinge of disappointment as she settled into her recliner. After a few seconds, her smile returned. By the way, I've discreetly informed the authorities using my contacts that a wanted criminal is hiding at 50 Rue Vincent. 
Once Guillaume Benet's death is confirmed, we should be eligible for a bounty of around 20,000. Should we stick to our initial plan for distributing that? Entrusting this task to Jenna wasn't feasible. It could raise suspicions that Lunian Lee was among the people she associated with. Anthony Reed, the information broker, was the most suitable choice, but his absence raised concerns. Franca worried that further delays might lead the police to uncover the situation at 50 Rue Vincent before they could claim the bounty. Once Lumian and Jenna acknowledged the plan without objections, the trio settled in to await Anthony Reed's return. After a few minutes, the seated Lumian leaned forward, fixing his gaze on Franca and Jenna. In a measured tone, he said, there's a matter I need your analysis on. With Aurora's affairs, he often found himself grappling with his emotions and straying from rationality. This was why he wanted to hear perspectives from Franca and Jenna. One of them shared a connection with Aurora, yet their bond was markedly different from Lumian's deep tie with Aurora. The other had no direct involvement, making their viewpoints invaluable in approaching the situation from diverse angles. Sure, both Franca and Jenna responded in unison, adopting a professional demeanor by shifting their postures. For the first time, Lumian recounted the events in Cordu. While he omitted certain details such as the inevitability angel and anything related to the dreamscape, he provided an overview of the catastrophe. This encompassed Aurora's unusual behavior, Louis Lund, Madame Poilis, Guillaume Benet, and the rest. Franca had some prior knowledge, but Jenna was largely unfamiliar with this narrative. As Lumian spoke, the underground singer of Sal de Ball Breeze and apprentice actress at Theatre de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons found herself transported into a world that seemed both distant and strangely familiar. While the notion of the animal creation spell was already unnerving, they weren't prepared for concepts like men giving birth and babies scaling walls like birds. It was madness, utter madness. Franca's primary concern, however, revolved around Aurora's transformation. She had harbored curiosity about Muggle's death in Cordu but hadn't dared to probe too deeply, fearing it might agitate Lumian. Franca couldn't believe it when she realized the source of the problem was Aurora. This didn't match her impression of Muggle at all. Aurora's revelation that she wasn't Aurora Lee in the presence of Guillaume Benet caught Franca off guard. Her initial surprise morphed into a grave expression. Soon, Lumian narrated the concluding sacrificial ritual. Aurora's sudden awakening within the altar and her act of shoving him to safety allowed him to survive. In response to this account, Franca abruptly rose from her seat. Baffling Lumian and Jenna with her actions, she hurried to her bedroom, returning with a stack of papers in hand. These were Aurora's grimoires, transcribed by Lumian who harbored a suspicion that something might be awry. He had hoped Franca could offer insights. The papers were spread across the coffee table, and Franca extracted one sheet, her expression morphing into a blend of trepidation and seriousness. She began, I think I know what's wrong. Lumian looked over in surprise and saw that the notebook had a copy of the warlock spell known as Soul Summoning. A supplementary spell designed to aid spirits in separating from the flesh or to help astral projections find their spirits when adrift in the spirit realm. Having previously studied the spell structure, Lumian had discerned no problematic elements. It wasn't associated with any evil god. However, Franca's words carried a weight that demanded attention. Lumian directed his gaze to the spell once more, focusing on the date and its origin. April 1, 1357, purchased from the April Fool's Gathering. Chapter 335, Another World Lumian withdrew his focus from the grimoire and turned his attention to Franca. Is there a problem with that? He had meticulously studied the soul-summoning spell on numerous occasions. If there had been a problem, he should have uncovered it sooner. His limitation lay in his inability to learn the spell and discern its ultimate effects. However, as a pyromaniac, he didn't possess the necessary capacity for such learnings, being incompatible with the corresponding sequence. Franca remained silent for a few seconds before speaking up, what happens when the soul summoning spell is used on others? It enables a spirit to reunite with the body from which it was separated, 
providing a means to call back astral projections lost in the spirit world, thus offering an opportunity for reconnection with their physical forms, Lumian began, describing the spell based on Aurora's grimoire before offering a personal example for clarity. In the previous battle, if I had been afflicted by Guillaume Benet's soul assimilation mystic spell, resulting in severe disorientation, the soul summoning spell might have roused me from unconsciousness. Naturally, the premise here is that there exist beyonders with the ability to learn and employ this spell. Franca disregarded Lumian's answer and inquired with gravitas, what if one were to employ it on oneself? What kind of question is that? Lumian pondered for a moment and asked, it would be ineffective. If no signs of separation between spirit and body are evident, the spell would have no impact when cast on oneself. If there's already a problem resembling such a condition, then one wouldn't be able to employ any spells at all. But what if, hypothetically? Franca began before her words trailed off. Jenna, observant and quick-witted, glanced at Franca, then at Lumian before rising from her seat and flashing a smile. We've been engrossed in discussion for quite a while. Aren't you both feeling hungry? How about I get some afternoon tea? Sure, Lumian agreed on Franca's behalf. He sensed that Franca was on the brink of revealing something that might be problematic if Jenna caught wind of it. This was why she stopped short in the midst of speaking. Lumian had already contemplated introducing Jenna to Mr. Fool's faith. They were comrades now, destined for numerous joint endeavors. In such scenarios, certain secrets couldn't be concealed, and in constantly doing so, would inevitably hinder collaboration. As for whether to share information about the Tarot Club and Curly-Haired Baboon's Research Society, Lumian hadn't reached a conclusion. After careful consideration, he determined that preaching to Jenna would be more fitting once she became a witch. Her sequence was still too low, and she lacked the strength to shoulder the weight of such knowledge. Too much information could make her vulnerable and inadvertently divulge secrets. However, Sequence 7 Witches of the Assassin Pathway represented a qualitative transformation below the demigod tier, empowering Jenna to fend for herself. While Lumian remained unfamiliar with the Sequence 5 of this particular pathway, its name and the beyonder powers it encompassed, he believed that a Sequence 6 demoness of pleasure didn't manifest a drastic metamorphosis compared to a witch. The latter could even alter an individual's gender, illustrating the considerable gap in their capabilities. Franca's gaze followed Jenna's retreating figure until the sound of her gradually fading footsteps reached her ears. She settled into a cross-legged position on the recliner, emitting a soft sigh. It's not that Jenna couldn't know about this, but I'm concerned that it might make her fearful of me, that she'll distance herself and view me in a different way. Lumian didn't pose the question, aren't you worried I might react similarly? He retook his seat. Patience etched on his features as he awaited Franca's explanation about the soul summoning spell. Franca's lips pursed, her demeanor wavering between hesitation and apprehension. After a beat, she chuckled self mockingly. It's also why I sensed a dangerous aura in this matter, otherwise, I wouldn't have even thought about sharing this with you. I would have kept it to my grave. Ah, there's another reason too, your spell of Harumph's origins are of great significance to me. I hope you'll lay bare all the details with me, just as I'm about to disclose my secret to you. Sigh, we, members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, share one commonality, we all come from another world. With that, Franca slouched further into the recliner, seemingly drained of energy. Observing a demoness of pleasure adopt such a posture inadvertently fueled a subtle warmth within Lumian, despite his thoughts being directed elsewhere. Another world? Lumian echoed, genuine surprise coloring his voice. This was an outcome that hadn't even crossed his mind. Such a possibility was one that ordinary individuals would scarcely contemplate and a rarity even within the confines of fiction. In a fleeting moment, he sensed an odd alignment with this notion. With a conscious effort to rein in his emotions, he inquired thoughtfully, is this the home my sister often speaks of, the place she claims she can never return to? Initially, Lumian had surmised that his sister's homeland had been ravaged by conflict or catastrophe, hence her assertion of being unable to return. 
Otherwise, armed with her warlock strength, she could have surreptitiously revisited, even if she was being pursued by the entire world. Subsequently, Lumian discovered Aurora's status as a Triarian, causing him to find her references to an enigmatic home perplexing. Franca's expression shifted into one of complex emotions upon hearing Lumian's question. Her countenance was a blend of wistfulness, melancholy, and sorrow. Does she frequently speak of home? Franca inquired, her eyes briefly shuddered to mask the shifting emotions within. Without awaiting Lumian's reply, Franca's lips pursed, and she continued, think of it as another planet or alternate dimension. Lumian dipped into his memories, muttering to himself, no wonder she enjoys climbing up to the rooftop to gaze at the cosmos. The cosmos. Franca echoed with a sigh. A hushed ambience enshrouded apartment 601 as Lumian and Franca delved into their introspective reveries. After a pause, a memory resurfaced within Lumian's mind. Madame Magician had mentioned evil gods like the Mother Tree of Desire existing outside our world, separated by a barrier. These entities perpetually seek methods to breach that boundary. Lumian's gaze shifted toward Franca, and he voiced his thoughts. Could it be that all of you are spawn of an evil god released into this world? Pfft. Franca immediately shook off her contemplative state. Do we look anything like that to you? No, Lumian responded after a brief pondering, you're far too weak for the efforts of the evil gods to be expended in sending you here. They could have instead focused on sending more of their saints. Or perhaps they are pinning their hopes on your potential growth? After all, being weak had its own advantages. Infiltration through the barrier would be less likely to be detected. Amused and slightly annoyed, Franca was tempted to refute his words, but tangible evidence eluded her grasp, leaving her with little recourse. In any case, I've come to believe in Mr. Fool. Not one member of the curly-haired baboons research society whom I've encountered shares faith in an evil god. Even if they did, they might not reveal it to you. Lumian muttered. Franca ignored his comment and continued, I also remain uncertain about the why behind our transmigration. I've been seeking an answer for quite some time. What I do know is that we arrived in this world as spirits and found ourselves reborn within other individuals' bodies. It's comparable to Guillaume Benet's process of rebirth. Drawing on this analogy, Lumian effortlessly comprehended the situation of Franca and her companions in the curly-haired baboons research society. In other words, you inhabit the bodies of other people? Yes. Franca cast a sidelong glance at Lumian, remarking, Are you disheartened to learn that the sister you hold dear is essentially a wandering spirit occupying another's body? Why would I be disheartened? Lumian responded casually. Aurora Lee. The person who took me in and shared my life in Cordu for nearly six years, is my sister. I care not for the past of that body or its history. Franca seemed to seek Lumian's perspective on her own behalf, don't you find this situation morally dubious? Do you not consider your sister and me as thieves who appropriate the corpses and lives of others? Does this not present you with moral dilemmas or conflicts? I have no morals, Lumian replied calmly. Expanding upon his statement, he added, I show kindness to those who are kind to me. Franca's mouth slightly agape, she struggled to find an immediate rejoinder. Lumian glanced at her and said, that person is already deceased. It's a pragmatic use of available resources. If guilt weighs on you, treat her, no, his family well. Perhaps even fulfill some of his unfulfilled desires. True. Franca pressed her lips together, nodding in agreement. Steering the conversation back to its initial trajectory, she inquired, what might occur if individuals like us were to employ the soul-summoning spell on ourselves? Could it summon a departed spirit? And if there's an underlying issue with the spirit itself? Lumian's train of thought expanded abruptly. Simultaneously, he recalled a line of inquiry introduced by Madame Hila the vice president of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Muggles' parents and other relatives likely remain alive in this world. For some reason, she distanced herself from them and refrains from returning to Trier. It's unclear whether there's something amiss with them or if they've come into contact with heretics. Did Madame Hila already harbor suspicions? 
Lumian's brows furrowed as he whispered, could Roche Louise Sanson be the original Boyd spirit? Is she and some of her family members associated with inevitability, perhaps even linked to the Sinners organization? Continuing our investigation in that direction is indeed a possibility, Franca admitted after a moment's contemplation. Two other questions arise. Why did Muggle resort to the soul-summoning spell for herself? Did the April Fool's member who sold her the spell foresee this outcome? Franca had chosen to share the secret of their transmigration with Lumian, sensing that something might be awry within the curly-haired baboon's research society and discerning an impending threat. Lumian offered a subdued nod, his expression void of emotion. A subtle smile played upon his lips as he ventured, you mentioned that April Fool's Day was formed by members of the curly-haired baboon's research society who are disheartened by the future and seek only joy. Could it be that the individual who sold Aurora the soul-summoning spell hoped to experience such amusement? Franca fell into a brief contemplative silence before replying, I don't know. I'll take charge of locating the April Fool's member and delve into their motivations. Lumian offered a curt acknowledgement. I'll follow the trail of Roche Louise Sanson. With the conversation surrounding the soul summoning spell concluded, an interim quiet settled within the living room of apartment 601. After a pause, Franca exhaled softly and told Lumian, You can now tell me about the spell of Harumph. Chapter 336 Armored Shadows Origins Lumian shifted his focus away from thoughts of Roche Louise Sanson the soul summoning spell, and April Fools. He began recounting the tale from the very beginning, all at the behest of Franca. In the wake of the Cordu disaster, I found myself tainted by the corruption of the evil god, inevitability. Fortunately, the protection granted to me by Mr. Fool allowed me to retain my sanity, preventing me from transforming into a monster. This corruption, a curse and yet a blessing, is now being extracted in stages, as per the instructions of Madame Magician. The aim is to channel this corruption into my own power, finding equilibrium with the corresponding sequence beyond her characteristic. Franca was enlightened. So, what you were referring to as a special contract is essentially the power of a contractee. No wonder you mentioned it's impossible for me to learn it. Since Lumian didn't know the powers of a sequence 6 of the inevitability pathway, she deduced his current state as a dual sequence 7 pyromaniac and contractee. Lumian nodded. That's why Guillaume Benet doesn't dare to meddle with my fate recklessly. The degree of corruption within me is rather substantial. A sudden revelation crossed Franca's mind. To require Mr. Fool's safeguard, it means there must be godhood involved. Could there be a chance for me to receive similar boons? Do you want to give everything a shot? Lumian clicked his tongue and asked, Are you prepared to seek out the Great Mother, engaging in daily cycles of pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding? Alternatively, do you wish to put faith in the Mother Tree of Desire and drag stray dogs to bed? Hiss. Franca gasped and said, I was merely musing. Engaging in the risky business of following an evil god is out of the question for me. The immediacy of gaining Mr. Fool's protection by merely brushing against the power of an evil god, much like you, is a rarity indeed. This isn't a mere brush against power. To dispel Franca's unrealistic thoughts, Lumian divulged a little more. The power of inevitability is sealed within me. In essence, I beseech Mr. Fool and the corruption within me for a boon instead of the entity known as inevitability. This approach is pivotal for ensuring my very survival. Otherwise, I risk becoming unrecognizable or just dying abruptly. Franca instinctively exhaled and said, Just tell me about the spell of Harumph. Lumian restructured his narrative, stating, To prevent any indirect influences from inevitability, I gave up the strange creatures that accompanied the knowledge bestowed by the boon. Instead, I obtained a wealth of information about creatures from the spirit world through Madame Magician. You know the rest. The spell of Harumph originates from a creature of the spirit world that I summoned. Initially, I aimed to summon the Shadow of Shriek. However, whether due to my invocation being witnessed by Mr. Fool or my summoning incantation lacking precision, I can't say for certain but the entity I summoned greatly diverged from the description of the Shadow of Shriek. 
Lumian delineated the relevant summoning incantation, the concept driving its formulation, the armored shadow's visual attributes, and its array of capabilities, all in meticulous detail. He even used his barely passable drawing skills to illustrate a rudimentary schematic. Fish Scale Armor Spell of Harumph Night Parade of Ten Thousand Demons Soul Devouring Scream Franca softly uttered these names to herself while gazing at the sketch on the coffee table, her gaze seemingly distant. Lumian probed, is there an issue? Were Aurora present, would she also react in a similar fashion? Franca snapped back to the present, her expression a blend of solemnity and exhilaration. That armored shadow might very well be from our world. The world that you guys come from? Lumian hadn't expected such an answer. Yet, it made sense. The armor's design and the ability names bore a distinctive uniqueness, setting them apart from the present world. Franca confirmed tersely. There are many countries in our world, and the culture and language of each country are different. The armored shadow is very similar to some entity in the myths and legends of the country your sister and I hail from. Are you from the same country as Aurora? Lumian was most concerned about this. He paused a beat before continuing, did Mr. Fool's might, combined with my imprecise incantation, summon the armored shadow from your world? Or did he transmigrate long ago, much like you, eventually transforming into a spirit world shadow after his demise? Franca said excitedly, if it's the former, it could signify a bridge between our two worlds. This implies the potential for our return. If it's the latter, the question arises, how did he use the capabilities of our original world? Did he bring these skills along, or did he acquire them at a later time? Resolving these mysteries would inch her closer to the truth of transmigration, potentially paving the path back home. Frank arose from her seat, her eyes gleaming with intrigue as she faced Lumian. Can you summon the armored shadow? I'm keen to witness it firsthand. I have a pact with him. The need to invoke Mr. Fool's intervention is eliminated for precise summoning, Lumian observed Franca's evident enthusiasm, as though she was readying to assist in setting up the altar. Steering the conversation, he added, Nonetheless, I perceive him to be immensely dangerous. While under Mr. Fool's aegis, the danger is mitigated. However, if that protection wanes, we could well find ourselves killed by the shadow. Yet, should we remain sheltered by Mr. Fool, Direct communication remains an impossibility, precluding spirit channeling. We can solely execute the summoning rite. Franca frowned in disappointment. What's our course of action then? Lumian pondered for a moment and said, Wait till I gather 100,000 Vroldor worth of gold and fulfill the contract. By doing so, the pack's power shall act as our shield, enabling us to figure out why the armored shadow demands such a substantial sum. After a thoughtful pause that spanned nearly a minute, Franca finally exhaled. That's all we can do for now. Initially, her intention had been to promptly corroborate the situation concerning the armored shadow and extract pertinent insights from it. Subsequently, she planned to inform the curly-haired baboons research society, pooling their collective effort to unearth viable solutions. However, for the time being, she had no choice but to defer these actions. After a period of immersion in the summoning incantation, it became evident that Franca's success rate in summoning was rather low, presumably due to an imprecise methodology. While it was possible that a shadow of Shriek could be summoned, Lumian surmised that by omitting a particular descriptive line and using Lumian Lee's contracted creature, the target could be pinpointed more precisely. After a while, Jenna returned with a spread of coffee, treats, and meatloaf. The ravenous appetites that had ensued from their prior battle now found their solace in afternoon tea. As evening approached, Anthony Reed, masquerading as a clerk, made his return to apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. How did it go? Lumian's concern was evident, unabashedly displayed. With his weathered top hat set aside, Anthony nodded slightly. I trailed the lady, her butler, valet, maid, and carriage driver to 20 Rue de la Terrasse, within the library district. It appears to be an alternate residence of sorts, akin to a safe house. Franca turned her gaze towards Lumian, inquiring, should we maintain surveillance? 
Lumian ruminated for a beat and then grinned. No need. Periodic checks to ensure they haven't left will suffice. Why? Jenna had expected Seal to rush to deal with them to gather more information. Lumian's smile was radiant. Behind them stands an organization known as the Sinners. Their point of contact is likely aware of Guillaume Benet's demise, prompting them to disengage and erase any traces, making investigation thorny. Yet, if the Sinners find that they had managed to evade our pursuit and that there's no surveillance, what might come to pass? Perhaps a connection will be re-established. Only authentic non-surveillance can convince the Sinners that the issue has faded. They could then become active anew, crawling out from their rat's nest. Damn it. Jenna cursed silently. Seal is so sinister. Anthony, having garnered significant intel, claimed two-thirds of the final 15,000 vrl d'or, leaving Jenna with a share of 5,000. As banknotes were deftly stowed away within assorted pockets, Anthony Reed turned his attention to Lumian. I'm eager to delve into the secrets surrounding Hugues Artois and the truth behind his treachery. I hope to begin the investigation soon. This was the primary reason for his involvement in the operation. Very well. Lumian had already discussed this matter with Jenna and Franca. Jenna was set to glean relevant details from the purifiers. As Franca was highly excited about the armored shadow matter, she took the initiative to suggest, I have acquaintances from Lowen. I'll see if I can obtain a battle record from the Lowen military. It might shed new light on the situation. That's a good idea. Anthony Reed's eyes lit up. The notion of soliciting the truth directly from the attacker had not previously crossed his mind. On Rue Anarchy's forever bustling nights, Lumian, relinquishing the task of divining the incantations to Franca, walked towards Aubert's Ducoke door. There, his intent was to summon the messenger of Madame Magician, intending to relay matters regarding Guillaume Benet, the Sinner's organization, and the Armored Shadow. Concurrently, he hoped she could relay to Madame Justice and Madame Susie his readiness for their final therapy session. Under the cool embrace of the night breeze, Lumian's thoughts unfurled languidly. After learning from Franca about the shared trait among members of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, Lumian's impression of Aurora crystallized. Of course, the vagueness was something he didn't understand at first, but he deemed it of little consequence. Investigations were unwarranted. It's no wonder that Aurora severed her familial ties to reside in Cordu, a frontier village. It's no wonder that she harbors a disinclination towards Trier. It's no wonder she always says strange words and likes to explain to me what they mean. It's no wonder her novels were different from the contemporary ones. It's no wonder she likes to say a certain philosopher from home once said only to substitute it with Emperor Roselle once said. Lumian ruminated in a wordless, contemplative cadence, a sensation of calm washing over him, as if he wasn't strolling on Rue Anarchy but Cordu. It was a place he could never return to. Simultaneously, Lumian gained an understanding of the symbolic elements in the dream. Aurora's acquisition of the land previously occupied by a deceased warlock, could this embody her possession of Roche-Louise Sanson's body? Consequently, might the legendary warlock, Roche-Louise Sanson, symbolize the original adherence of inevitability? Mr. Poet failed to interpret the dual symbolic meanings because he lacked crucial information previously. He had solely indicated to Lumian that they likely bore their own significance. As his thoughts raced, Lumian returned to room 207 and saw a simple folded letter on the table. Letter? This doesn't seem like Madame Magician's. Lumian walked over, alarmed and suspicious. He picked up the letter and unfolded it. Two lines of elegant intision script graced the parchment, I have arrived in Trier. Gila. Chapter 337 Magician speculation. Madame Gila has arrived in Trier? Lumian held the letter with a countenance etched in complexity. In essence, nothing seemed awry about this development. After all, the vice president of the Curly Haired Baboons Research Society, codenamed Gila, had alluded to her impending visit to Trier beforehand. 
However, Lumian's introduction to Roche Louise Sanson had occurred merely that afternoon, sparking suspicions of Aurora's original body harboring beliefs and in inevitability and hinting at a potential anomaly within the April Fool's team. Strikingly, this very evening saw the arrival of this woman in Trier, soliciting a meeting. She had advised Lumian to keep a vigilant watch over Muggle's familial roots, surmising it to be a promising avenue of investigation. Sheer coincidence, or is there another reason? Lumian pondered briefly before easing into his seat. Beneath the carbide lamp's glow, he set pen to paper, commencing correspondence with Madame Magician. In succinct prose, he relayed the day's occurrences, his discourse with Franca, and the conundrum of the armored shadow. While he withheld no mention of Gila's arrival, he refrained from disclosing the fact that the curly-haired baboons research society's members hailed from an alternate world. Approximately half an hour later, Lumian received a response from Magician, giving up on the creature accompanying the boon and autonomously choosing a contract partner from the spirit world was a prudent choice. Your transition into an inevitability hunter, with the bestowed of the inevitability pathway as your objective, proves that my subtle guidance bore fruit after all. At this point, Lumian was a little puzzled. When had Madame Magician ever hinted at foregoing the strange creatures that came with the boon? Suddenly, a realization surged forth. Before praying for a contract T boon, unaware that the mystical knowledge it brought would encompass contract targets, Madame Magician had offered him information on creatures from the spirit world for his consideration. It was indeed a hint, but did it have to be so subtle? Lumian mused that those skilled in divination or enamored with astromancy seemed averse to straightforward elucidation. Instead, they favored dropping crumbs of insight or weaving riddles imperceptible to others. After figuring this out, Lumian lowered his head and resumed poring over Madame Magician's response. Sinners, a secret organization that venerates inevitability, has been around for more than six years. Its origins can be traced back to the closing stages of the Loan Kingdom, the Faysak Empire, and the Intus Republic's War. Roche Louis Sanson, the name you mentioned, might have been an adherent of inevitability, though perhaps not granted its corresponding boons. In sum, that war provided evil gods more crevices for invading our world. You've likely discerned the close connection between Roche Louis Sanson and your sister Aurora. To a certain extent, they're one, yet not wholly distinct personas. Much like the rebirth ability, your sister carried a prior background, resurrecting within the departed body of Roche Louis Sanson. According to the normative progression, your sister should have taken such a path, integration of Roche's memories and sentiments, internal conflict, a prelude to dissociative identity disorder, self-harmony, embracing a fresh existence. If self-reconciliation fell short, engaging a genuine psychiatrist was requisite. Judging by your sister's behavior during the first five years, even if her self-harmony remained incomplete, she fared reasonably well. Likely, her disquiet was manageable. Yet, she found Roche's association with an evil god unacceptable. This unresolved matter provided an opening for the soul summoning spell. Just as you're puzzled, why would she want to use the soul summoning spell on herself? It's a crucial question. I suspect that Sinners is not only the secret organization's name, but also a sequence 2 or sequence 1 of the inevitability pathway. The entity known as Inevitability does have authority over the past, present, and future. You glimpsed this in your dream, did you not? Sinners of the past and sufferers of the present, do they not harmonize splendidly? But what befits the future? Sinners of the past, sufferers of the present. I wonder if Termoboros signifies the past or the future. Yes, Madame Magician's guess is similar to Franca's but she doesn't seem to agree that it's purely the resurgence of a wraith. It rather appears a fusion of dissociative identity and lingering spirit. Lumian meticulously pondered the message's depictions, wary of omitting any hints. He was relatively calm now. Be it the real Roche Louise Sanson's revival or Aurora's dissociative identity and the vestige of spirit unveiled through the soul-summoning spell, he could embrace either without much hardship. One was an evil person doing evil deeds, and the other was his sister being sick, what was so unacceptable? Lumian released a deliberate, slow breath, shifting his gaze towards the letter behind. 
the armored shadow problem is very complicated. Neither you nor the Two of Cups should be privy to the specifics at this juncture. In fact, prior to your summoning of such a shadow, I'd only heard of analogous entities from Mr. Hang Man. He's come across them only three or four times, one instance even within a dream. In the future, as you summon the armored shadow again and fulfill your commitment, remember to write to me and inform me of any noted changes. Mr. Hang Man The holder of the Hang Man card in the Tarot Club? Responsible for addressing the problem with the other world? Lumian's mind engaged earnestly, realizing Madame Magician's implicit message, this entails a matter of high caliber. Details are beyond your grasp for now, but you can investigate and follow leads within your capabilities. This implies the Tarot Club's vested interest in the world represented by the Armored Shadow. Lumian tacitly nodded, his focus returning to the remnants of the letter. I'll notify you when the timing for the final psychiatric treatment is confirmed. Your mystical item should be ready within the upcoming week. Meet Gila. No glaring concerns on my end. You might even hint that Aurora's anomaly might have stemmed from the sale of the soul summoning spell by an April Fool's member, gauging her reaction. As for telling her about the armored shadow, it's up to you and the Two of Cups. Lumian lightly brushed his fingertips, causing the crimson flames to set the letter alight. After completing this task, he composed a response to Gila. Honorable Madame Gila, if it suits you, let's meet tomorrow at 10 a.m. at Cartier de l'Observatoire's Little Cow Café on Rouen Sienne. Lumian had initially planned to choose a meeting spot in the market district he knew well. But the risk of the Iron and Blood Cross Order spotting him with a stranger was too high. His second option was to pick a café or beer house near a cathedral. However, he felt that this might come off as overly cautious. It would seem as if he could seek refuge in the cathedral if anything went awry. But the truth was, he didn't dare to hide there. In the end, he settled on Rouen Sien, the street where Salle de Bal Unique was situated. When the time came, if there was something amiss with Gila, he would draw the danger to the dance hall that set his nerves on edge. He wanted to see if he could manipulate the troublemakers into turning against each other. After receiving Gila's response and confirming the time and place, Lumian returned to Rue de Blouse's Blanches with the Earth Blood Ore. He knocked on Franca and Jenna's door once more. Franca was still dressed in her usual attire, not having changed into her nightwear. She looked at Lumian with a puzzled expression and asked, Why are you here again? Instead of answering, Lumian inquired, Where's Jenna? Why do you need to know? She received a payment from you and left to visit her brother, Franca replied, sensing that Lumian had serious matters to discuss. Only then did Lumian bring up his meeting with Gila the next day. Finally, he posed the question, should I mention Armored Shadow? Not yet. We'll wait until we have a clearer picture, Franca said after careful consideration. For now, don't mention me. Act as if we've never met. A chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. You're suspicious of everyone. It's better to be cautious, Frank aside. The soul summoning spell has made me excessively vigilant. Once the details were confirmed, Lumian glanced at Franca. Are you heading out? Yes, I'm going to Rue de Fontaine's to find Gardner, Franca replied openly, a mischievous grin on her face. I'm going to introduce him to some real pleasure. Lumian was momentarily speechless. Franca let out a soft laugh. I don't have much of a choice. Since neither you nor Jenna are helping me, I need to find someone else to share in the pleasure. Without waiting for Lumian's response, she added with a smile, I'll also tell Gardner that I took part in your operation against your enemy at Jenna's request, and that I received a substantial share of the spoils. Lumian was surprised. I thought you'd keep it a secret from him. Franca chuckled and explained, that guy is actually a very suspicious person. In most cases, telling him the truth works better than keeping things from him. As Lumian nodded in agreement, Franca recalled something. The ritualistic incantations have been divined. The dispelling incantation is his grace, and the usage incantations are cow, sheep, and dog. It depends on the type of hide used. Everything's in Hermes. 
With that, the demoness waved her hand and left with a joyful demeanor. The dispelling incantation is his grace. The Padre sure has a taste for power. Lumian entered apartment 601, grabbed the five ritualistic hides, and made his way to his safe house. Of course, he didn't forget to lock the door for Franca. The following morning, on Rouen Sien, Cartier de l'Observatoire. Lumian walked among the vintage buildings, realizing that Salle de Bal Unique and the Alone Bar remained closed at this hour. Ding ding ding. A postman peddled by in a blue floral coat. Lumian diverted his gaze from the firmly shut door of Salle de Bal Unique and continued his stroll, heading towards the cafe named Little Cow. Chapter 338 Gila Little Cow Cafe served the working class folks of the nearby streets, offering them affordable breakfast and lunch options. Even amidst the bustling night market, patrons could enjoy a hearty and satisfying meal for just one verl door. Many individuals with modest incomes, such as motel attendants, restaurant handymen, and cleaning staff earning between 60 to 80 verl door per month, frequented the cafe either alone or with their families every couple of weeks to treat themselves. When Lumian finally arrived, the bustling breakfast rush had subsided. The cafe had only a handful of customers, and the staff seemed somewhat fatigued, lacking any enthusiasm. After placing an order for a cup of McHale coffee brewed from ground coffee beans, Lumian settled into the designated spot, patiently awaiting Gila's arrival. As the cuckoo wall clock in the cafe struck the hour, a woman pushed open the door and stepped inside. Clad in an intriguing black dress, she emitted an enigmatic allure, reminiscent of the attire one might expect from a widow. Upon spotting the woman approaching, Lumian straightened up and scrutinized her intently. Her skin possessed an unnaturally pale complexion, as though she had been shielded from sunlight for an extended period. Light golden hair cascaded naturally over her shoulders, soft yet lacking in luster. Her eyes seemed to absorb all available light, rendering them dark and impervious to revealing their true color. Though her facial features were rather attractive, they didn't leave a distinct impression on Lumian. It was almost as though her cold demeanor had cast a shadow, preventing him from forming a complete assessment. Her icy demeanor didn't merely create distance, it seemed to emanate from within her causing the ambient temperature to dip slightly. Before Lumian could discern more details, the woman seated herself across from him and inquired in a chilly tone, Muggle's brother? Although Lumian had already surmised that this was Madame Gila, her directness caught him slightly off guard. He hadn't expected her to appear without any attempt at disguise, seemingly unconcerned about potential betrayal. Lumian didn't use the knee's face or the mystery prying glasses, but he usually employed basic disguises. Relying on his distinctive golden black hair and simple makeup, he maintained enough divergence from the Lumian lead depicted in the wanted posters. Perhaps this is a form of disguise that I can't detect. Lumian offered a polite smile and nodded. Madam Hila? The lady nodded slightly, acknowledging her identity. May I offer you something to drink? Lumian asked politely. Gila didn't stand on ceremony. A glass of absinthe, and a triple espresso shot. Drinking liquor at 10 a.m., quite the match for my habits. And she even goes for a triple shot of Rima espresso. Did she have a sleepless night? Or perhaps a night of drinking, seeking absinthe to clear her senses? Lumian lifted his right hand and snapped his fingers, signaling the waiter. Once the light green absinthe and the strong Reem espresso arrived in front of Gila, Lumian surveyed his surroundings to ensure a secure environment for their conversation. Gulp! Gila downed half the glass of absinthe in one swift motion, her pale face gradually regaining some color. Setting the glass down, she turned a ring on her right middle finger using her left thumb and index finger. The ring possessed an elegant simplicity, a black diamond with numerous facets set into a base of pure silver. As Gila rotated the ring gently, Lumian experienced a subtle shift in the surroundings, as if the ambient light had dimmed. No one can eavesdrop on us now. Gila's voice retained its chilly demeanor. Impressive. This mastery goes beyond Franca's abilities. 
truly befitting of a member of the curly-haired baboon's research society who has ventured farthest along the paths of the divine. Lumian maintained his gaze on Hila's black eyes that possessed a light-swallowing intensity. He proceeded with calm composure. I've made some new discoveries recently. Hila remained silent, her gaze fixed on Lumian, awaiting further disclosure. I've caught Guillaume Benet. Lumian conveyed this without an air of boastfulness, it was akin to a bartender at Sal de Ball Breeze mentioning the concoction of a new cocktail. Gila's response was a nod, displaying scant interest in the specifics of Guillaume Benet's capture. Commencing with Guillaume Benet, Lumian recounted the transformations of Muggle, Aurora, detailing the peculiarities that arose, including the appearance of the lizard like elf and the name Roche Louise Sanson. In conclusion, he presented a stack of papers. This is the grimoire my sister penned three months prior to the spread of inevitability's faith in Cordu. Please review it and ascertain any irregularities. Throughout the narrative, Gila remained an attentive listener. Yet, her emotional fluctuations and facial expressions remained limited. Only when Lumian mentioned the second appearance of the lizard-like elf and uttered the name Roche Louise Sanson, did she exhibit a slight frown. Gila, who had maintained silence, swiftly perused the grimoire, her pace almost supernatural, as though she could glean mystical insights from its pages with each flip, detecting any anomalies. After a span of five to six minutes, she extracted a page from her notebook. It bore the sole summoning spell that Aurora had documented. Only members of the curly-haired baboon's research society and those sharing common experiences would detect the issue at a glance. Lumian found himself stirred by a sudden wave of emotion. Gila raised the absinthe once more, finishing the rest of the dreamy green liquid in a single gulp. After finishing it, she turned her gaze to Lumian and spoke, What are your thoughts on the matter of the lizard-like elf? I've heard rumors that heaven has banished a group of elves in recent times. Among them are some who bear resemblance to diaphanous lizards, Lumian responded. He refrained from delving into the symbolic interpretations that Mr. Poet had provided, instead opting to present the account provided by the official investigator, Ryan. Gila's complexion took on a slightly rosier hue, the chill in her demeanor diminishing. I possess certain insights into these elves and have conducted a degree of study on them. They were not banished from heaven. It's plausible that they originated from an alternate realm. Aligning certain folklore and events in the alternate realm, coupled with the passage of time, may have allowed elements from the alternate realm to permeate the spirit world and enter our world. At present, this is a hypothesis I personally have. I haven't substantiated it as yet. I simply wish to convey that I've studied the phenomenon of these elves in recent years and have personally encountered the diaphanous lizard-like elves you described. However, they differ from the diaphanous lizard-like beings you've mentioned. Not true elves? Lumian expressed no surprise at this assertion. After all, Ryan and his colleagues had been theorizing, and Mr. Poet's perspective leaned towards an affiliation with a different faction. Gila chose not to elaborate, confirming Lumian's suspicion with a nod. I will continue to search for similar motifs in elf legends from various sources. Having said that, she spun the grimoire containing the soul summoning spell and pushed it toward Lumian. This is likely where your sister's problem originates. Lumian's eyes conveyed his anticipation for an explanation. He was genuinely curious to hear Gila's perspective. However, he didn't expect her to reveal the most closely guarded secret of the curly-haired baboon's research society, as Franca had done. Gila's tone remained as cold as ice as she began. I've had numerous interactions with your sister and have discerned that she had been grappling with psychological turmoil rooted in her original family. Something is amiss with her biological family. Consequently, your sister had no recourse but to distance herself from them and seek refuge in the border village. It mirrors your gradual realization of Cordu's growing abnormality, prompting your desire to escape. That's why I directed your attention to this avenue of investigation and should one employ the soul summoning spell detailed in this notebook upon themselves, it's highly likely that your sister's psychological distress will escalate into a mental ailment, potentially leading to true dissociation of her personality. Lumian pondered for a moment before inquiring, 
Are you suggesting that Roche Louise Sanson is a dissociated persona of my sister? That the foundation of inevitability's faith originates from her biological family? This deduction, while refraining from disclosing the most guarded secret of the curly-haired baboon's research society, seemed to be the most logical conclusion. Yet, Madame Magician had also entertained the notion of dissociative identity disorder as one potential cause. Gila took a sip of her triple-shot Rheem espresso. The situation might be more complicated than a case of dissociative identity disorder. There seems to be some bizarre mystical phenomenon involved. That, however, remains contingent upon your future investigations. Lumian acknowledged her response with a nod and posed his question with a serious demeanor. Is there any issue with the April Fool's member who sold the soul-summoning spell to my sister? Did they foresee a scenario involving dissociative identity disorder? Gila remained silent for a few seconds before responding, It's suspicious, but I cannot definitively be sure. I intend to probe further, although it might take a considerable duration of time. As you're aware, the organizational structure of the research society is quite informal, and my connections with the individuals from April Fools are limited. I understand. Lumian had heard a similar sentiment from Franca. Gila glanced at him and pondered for a moment. In reality, you are the most suitable candidate to investigate this matter. Unfortunately, you lack the necessary prerequisites. Why do you say that? Lumian questioned, genuine surprise lacing his words. For someone known for wit and mischief in Cordu, the prospect of heading the investigation was unexpected. He had assumed that his role would merely entail supporting Franca. Gila's tone retained its chilliness. If you possessed a beyonder power to physically alter your appearance, you could transform into Muggle and participate in various research society gatherings as her. Then, when the occasion arises, you could observe any April Fool's member who reacts oddly to Muggle's presence and displays signs of abnormal behavior. You could even employ yourself as bait to draw out any individual harboring hidden motives. Me assuming Aurora and using the code name Muggle to become a member of the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society? Lumian had never envisioned such a scenario. His brow furrowed as he remarked, Can I really pull off being my sister even with a transformation item? Especially within your research society? He wasn't familiar with their world and its intricacies. How could he effectively bridge the communication gap? Just a sentence or two could potentially blow his cover. Chapter 339 Purpose of Visit Gila continued in her cold voice, Don't worry, there's no reason to fret. Our research society operates rather informally. Except for a handful of members who maintain close private communication, the rest only convene two to four times a year, all while in disguise. Your sister behaves quite relaxed at these gatherings. Her interactions would resemble her usual demeanor with you. However, she'll take care to guard her genuine information. You can certainly play the part. And many of the coded terms and expressions we employ for communication are familiar to you. Given your relationship with your sister, she won't intentionally keep them from you or abstain from using them. Understood. Lumian's mood suddenly soured. She'll also explain the exact significance to me and attribute it to a philosopher from back home or even Emperor Roselle. Upon hearing this, Gila responded, If you truly possess the potential to masquerade as Muggle and engage with the research society members, there's no need to forcibly cite philosophers from back home. Simply allude to the latter portion of the content. Then, should I incorporate Emperor Roselle once said? Lumian deliberated the specifics earnestly. He lacked a key item and couldn't authentically impersonate Aurora. And even though the niece's face was primarily an illusion, it could be instantly deciphered by Beyonders equipped with the corresponding abilities, whether the other party held a rank as low as Sequence 9 Mystery prior, they'd discern his non-female identity at a glance. Yet, he remained determined to give his utmost. Who knew if a chance for transfiguration with diminished negative effects would arise in the future? Regarding mystic makeup achieved through the use of the mystery prying glasses, it wouldn't provide psychological suggestions, given that attendees concealed their faces at the gathering. Furthermore, it couldn't alter his gender. 
Ela lapsed into silence, her facial muscles twitching subtly. In the event that you're presented with an opportunity to enact such a role, make sure to avoid these mentions. You might not possess precise discernment about when such references are suitable. Just keep in mind, other members frequently employ the phrase Emperor Roselle once said to liven the mood or offer amusement. Why does it feel like Emperor Roselle's image in the curly-haired baboon's research society isn't too favorable? It's not that it's unfavorable. Instead, it assumes a comedic quality. Speaking of which, Aurora appears to do the same. Whenever her spirits dip, as long as I deliberately reference Emperor Roselle's words, she tends to loosen up and finds herself chuckling involuntarily. Lumian struggled to fully grasp the rationale of the curly-haired baboon's research society members, but he refrained from further probing, recognizing the necessity to feign ignorance concerning their most profound secret. If the opportunity arose, he intended to seek Franca's insights on the matter. Gila continued, while participating in the gathering, keep in mind to listen more than you speak. If you lack confidence, avoid delving into profound discussions. Should others delve into the past, if possible, shift the focus and maintain a patronizing tone. Emulating Muggle's traits and characteristics will aid in effectively acting as her. Lumian pondered for a moment. This guy's, however, remains merely a surface-level ruse. Your research society houses Beyonders adept in divination and possessing keen intuition. They could readily discern that I'm not my sister. No, quite the contrary. They might prove you to be the genuine muggle, Gila furnished an unforeseen response to Lumian's expectation. In the midst of his unveiled astonishment, Gila expounded, to begin with, most of us remain unaware of the realities of our fellow members, impeding our capacity for efficacious divination or prophecy. Additionally, with my understanding of your sister, I employed an artifact to divine her state. Yet, I couldn't ascertain her life or death status. It was akin to confronting a formidable anti-divination barrier. W.H. Lumian was caught off guard before grasping the underlying rationale. As per Madame Magician, Aurora hadn't entirely died. A possibility of revival persisted, her soul shard sealed by Mr. Fool, thereby rendering conventional divination unable to circumvent the seal and ascertain Aurora's genuine condition. A potent anti-divination effect was at play. Gila took another sip of her triple-shot Reem Espresso. Most crucially, subsequent to our meeting today, my spiritual intuition tells me that when I confront you, divination or prophecy regarding Aurora will point toward you. What? Lumian nearly blurted out the question. Before long, he cast his gaze downwards to his left chest and offered a wry smile. Perhaps this stems from the fact that a fragment of my sister's soul has been specially preserved within me. Lumian let out a long sigh. What a pity. Post Hila's analysis, he harbored the conviction that he could seamlessly stand in for his sister within the folds of the curly-haired baboon's research society without incurring exposure. He yearned to do so. This way, he could not only aid Franca in her operation but also safeguard her from solitary risks. Together, they could operate, one in plain sight, the other in the shadows, ensnaring their adversary in a carefully orchestrated trap. Simultaneously, Lumian recognized the potential of utilizing the society's gatherings to gather invaluable information about Aurora. Regrettably, his one hindrance was his lack of transfiguration abilities. The power to alter his gender, stature, or physique eluded him. A brief silence hung in the air before Gila reiterated her commitment to investigating the April Fool's predicament. Following that, she spoke candidly, I've come to try her this time to delve deeper past the catacombs. Do you have any information about that place? Deeper into the catacombs? Lumian's heart skipped a beat as he took the initiative to remind her, it's very dangerous there. Madame Gila's guidance from her letters and prior suggestion had been invaluable. With deep appreciation, he recounted his grasp of the catacombs and the bizarre phenomena he had borne witness to. Finally, he said, for some inexplicable reason, I alone retain memories of the ill-fated couple. The rest feign ignorance, as though they never existed. True, Kendall, the administrator of the tomb, ought to have sensed it as well, yet he feigned ignorance. Gila listened in quiet contemplation. 
Without astonishment or consternation, she inquired, Have you heard of the Samaritan Women's Spring? I have, though from the mouth of a charlatan. Lumian mused, his brow furrowing as he tried to recall Asta Troll's narrative. He claimed that the Samaritan Women's Spring on the upper level of the catacombs is a sham. Just a puddle left behind due to a construction error back then. The administrators spun it into a legend. But deep in the underground world, within an ancient tomb, there lies the Rayal Fountain of Oblivion. Gila refrained from commenting on Lumian's account and simply nodded. Thank you. With her gratitude expressed, she downed the last of her three-shot espresso, rose from her seat, and made her way toward the cafe's exit. As she rose from her seat, the heavy silence was shattered, and the sunlight once again flooded the area with its radiance. Lumian remained seated a while longer, savoring the last sips of his Mikhail coffee. Afterwards, he strode along Rouen Sien, his destination being Place du Pertori. There, he planned to catch a public carriage back to the market district. Passing by Sal de Bal Unique and the Alone Bar, a sudden, crystalline tinkle reached Lumian's ears. His heart skipped a beat, and he swiftly turned around. He saw a figure he knew well, who had just entered the newly opened alone bar. Draped in a delicate, pale white fishnet dress, the figure sported a small, circular hat adorned with silk flowers. Two dainty silver bells dangled from the intricate hair buns, complementing the similar accessories on the figure's dark-hued boots. Leah. Bureau 8's Leah. Lumian recognized the person as Leah the official investigator who had entered his dream. Once affiliated with Bureau 8's Riston Province branch, she had now appeared in Trier and entered the somewhat peculiar Alone Bar. Sal de Bal Unique is perilous. Could the Alone Bar be used by Bureau 8 to monitor the opposing stronghold? After retracting his gaze, Lumian continued forward as if nothing had happened. Returning to Salle de Bal Breeze, Lumian found himself summoned to Eleven Rue de Fontaines in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative by Gardner Martin, just when he was hoping for some rest. Inside a room adorned with bookshelves, Gardner Martin, donned in a light colored shirt and dark trousers, greeted him with an energetic smile. Franca mentioned that your vengeance is complete? Lumian detected an odd thrill emanating from the boss, as if he had indulged in immense pleasure and hadn't fully calmed down. He responded candidly, yes, I've already killed Guillaume Benet. Thankfully, Red Boots, Jenna, and Anthony Reed, the information broker I hired, assisted me. He spared no details about the participants, there was no use concealing anything. They relied on Rat Christo and his pets to communicate, after all. Gardner Martin nodded slightly and commented, you've exceeded my expectations in terms of efficiency. Franca didn't delve into the specifics. Can you give me an overview of the overall situation? Lumian held nothing back when it came to the sinner's organization. He elucidated Guillaume Benet's various abilities, detailing their specific impacts. Gardner Martin listened intently and asked in thought, what do you reckon is Guillaume Benet's strength equivalent to in sequence? Lumian replied without hesitation, sequence 5. A brief pause ensued as Gardner Martin fell into contemplative silence before he uttered, I've summoned you for a purpose, a mission. What mission? Lumian didn't hide his curiosity. Gardner Martin's smile reappeared. It's quite straightforward. Make your way to the mechanical cafe in Cartier de l'Opera and establish contact with a literary and arts group named Black Cat. I lack any artistic inclination, Lumian honestly admitted. Gardner Martin smiled and said, No artistic inclination is necessary. Your primary role will involve sponsoring and befriending one of the members of Black Cat. His ancestor boasted an aristocratic title of a count, a fact he's quite fond of calling himself that. Right, his name is Pufer Sauron. Chapter 340 Black Cat Cartier de la Maison d'Opera Rue Lombard. The street was famous for its array of sweets, and colorful candies adorned every corner. At the end of Rue Lombard stood the mechanical cafe, nestled next to a small confectionery factory. From the outside, it looked like an ordinary place, and even peering through the glass windows, there was no hint of its mechanical nature. 
the black triangular sacred emblem on the weighty wooden door was the only reminder of its true identity. Lumian pushed the dark brown door, but it resisted as if locked from within. After a moment's observation, he pulled the doorbell hanging by the secondary window. Amidst the tinkling chimes, Lumian caught the soft clink of metal and watched as the door inched open. A mechanical arm extended from its rear, reaching all the way to the bar counter like an ornamental display. Surveying the surroundings, Lumian made his way to a corner of the café. Two single-legged tables were placed there, hosting five individuals. Among them, a middle-aged man with fiery red hair stood out. Fair skin from cosmetics, with dark circles accentuating his brownish-red eyes, he was a captivating figure. Clean-shaven, he sported an open brown velvet coat and a red shirt sans bow tie, exuding an air of refinement and casual elegance. This was Count Poufer, the member of Intus's former royal Sauron family whom Lumian sought. Having inherited a substantial fortune from his father, he hadn't ventured into politics, military service, or trade. Instead, he moved within various artistic circles as a literary critic and frequented black cat gatherings. Approaching with a smile, Lumian inquired, Are you Count Poufer? Poufer Sauron looked up casually, his tone relaxed as he asked, Are you the friend Martin mentioned? Yes, Seal Du Bois. Lumian responded without any reservation, claiming a seat by pulling up a chair. Poufer gave him a measured once-over, a satisfied smile playing on his lips. Not bad at all, you're quite the beautiful friend. Among literature, oil paintings, sculptures, poetry, and music, what's your preference? Novels, Lumian replied without hesitation. Poufer leaned back, gesturing towards the plump middle-aged man diagonally across from him. Anori, the author with the most literary eloquence in recent times. The author who delved into the realm of erotica, forgetting that the essence of writing is to explore human nature? Lumian naturally recollected Aurora's assessment of this novelist. Initially, Anori's works had explored love as a means to understand humanity. But over time, the focus shifted, consumed by the former. Aurora believed that if not for restrictions, Anori might have penned something akin to monks chasing dogs, a risque novel. Of course, Lumian cared little for probing human nature, he simply enjoyed the engaging parts. Your novels have certainly broadened my horizons, he said to Anori genuinely. With black hair and blue eyes, Arno puffed on his pipe and remarked, Luckily, you didn't mention appreciating my death of a herald. Death of a herald. Isn't that Adri's work? Right, Aurora had mentioned the similarity in names, leading to frequent confusion. Enlightenment dawned as Lumian inquired, You mean the Adri who's backed by the government, earning a five-figure fortune yearly, yet only manages to produce dog's hit? Anori erupted in laughter. That's worth a glass of absinthe. With that, he tapped the silver-gray metal button on the single-legged table before him, thrice. Count Poufer took pleasure in Lumian's reception and proceeded to introduce the other members of the Black Cat organization. Among them were Mullen, a painter with a pale and weary complexion, Ernst Young, a slightly stern-looking literary critic, and Irita, a poet who held a cherrywood pipe. Just as Lumian was wrapping up his greetings, he witnessed the iron-colored surface of Anori's one-legged table split open unexpectedly, unfolding like a blossoming flower. Within the stamen, a glass of emerald absinthe, radiating a dreamlike sheen, appeared on a tray that ascended through a mechanical lift. Author Anori picked up the glass of absinthe and tossed a silver coin worth one verl door onto the tray. Gradually, the mechanical elevator descended, causing the parted metal surface to seal shut, restoring the one-legged table to its original state. Anori slid the absinthe toward Lumian, a smile gracing his features. Cheers to what you just said. It's really a mechanical café. Lumian reacquainted himself with this place. His gaze drifted to the table's broad and sturdy leg, suspecting it to be hollow and linked to an underground conduit. Taking a sip of the absinthe and savoring its familiar bitterness, Lumian directed his attention to the one-legged table. No change? Here, a glass of absinthe costs one verl d'or, Anori responded with a grin. Isn't that rather steep? Sal de Ball Breeze and the basement bar only charge seven licks. 
their quality is nearly identical. Lumian critiqued inwardly. One Vril door was equivalent to twenty licks. At that instant, Mullen, the pale-faced painter who seemed perpetually fatigued but was a handsome man, took a sip of his coffee and shared, I heard that an elephant has arrived at Trier Zoo. Quite an uncommon sight. The pudgy Anori muttered, What's so intriguing about an elephant? It strikes me as utterly mundane. Count Poofer let out a soft chuckle. Shall we then discuss the ongoing clash between the parliament and the two churches, the high-ranking government officials perpetually stumbling, the detestable censorship of publications, and the covert agents shadowing us like hyenas? Anori sighed in resignation. Let's just stick to that elephant. Amidst the laughter of the black cat members, Count Poofer crossed his right leg and proposed, since we have a new friend, how about engaging in a game of mysticism? A game involving mysticism? Lumian's eyebrows twitched. What sort of game? inquired Irita, the poet, puffing contemplatively on his pipe. Count Poofer smiled and said, a game known as King's Pie. Observing the perplexed expressions around the table, Count Poofer chuckled and continued, don't any of you have a childhood or a family? Haven't you played this game? The rule is to divide the King's Pie into portions equal to the number of participants plus one. The larger piece is richly dedicated to a deity or esteemed ancestor we hold in reverence. Among the remaining portions, one contains a broad bean or coin, hidden. Whoever discovers it becomes the king for the day, empowered to issue commands to the others. Naturally, these commands must remain within the bounds of reason. The mysticism aspect involves offering up the excess king's pie in sacrifice. Lumian cast a glance at Anori, Mullen, and the rest, intrigued by the idea and curious whether any Beyonders were part of the group. Of course, none of them appeared to be. In just over ten seconds, Count Poofer's proposal garnered agreement from everyone except Lumian. He commenced by pressing the corresponding button on his one-leg table, hitting it the appropriate number of times to signal the kitchen to dispatch a king's pie. Reportedly, this dessert had been a favorite since the era of the Sauron dynasty. In the underground of Eglis St. Robert, within the confines of the Inquisition, a gathering of purifiers was underway. Valentine, Imra, and their fellow purifiers congregated in the office of Deacon Angulim. Dressed in a light gold shirt and pale white pants, Angulim raised the dossier in his hand and addressed the group. We've verified the body found at 50 Rue Vincent in Cartier de la Princesse Rouge to be that of Guillaume Benet, the former wanted padre. Ensure that the police headquarters takes down the wanted posters from the market district. The market district case wasn't under the purifier's jurisdiction, but Valentine had heard about it. Finally, there was confirmation. Sporting a formal blue coat, Valentine glanced at Angoulême and asked, Deacon, have there been any developments in the investigation into Guillaume Benet's killer? At the moment, no suspects, responded Angoulême, his golden hair, eyebrows, and beard lending him an imposing aura. He continued, what we can ascertain is that there were clear signs of incineration at the scene, and it's likely that Guillaume Benet succumbed to a demoness curse. At least a sequence seven hunter and a demoness? That's an uncommon combination, Imra remarked, clearly taken aback. To his knowledge, most who followed the Demonis pathway were affiliated with the Demonis family, a formidable secret organization that seldom required collaboration. Uncommon doesn't mean impossible, retorted Angulim. As a purifier deacon, he had access to more confidential information and experience compared to Imra, Valentine, and the others. He had even personally executed two members of the Demonis family. Valentine furrowed his brow, ruminating for a moment before suggesting, could Lumian Lee be involved? He does have a solid motive. But he lacks the power, Imra objected. How could he advance to Pyromaniac so quickly after leaving Kordu? Isn't he concerned about losing control? Furthermore, based on your description, not even a Pyromaniac would be a match for Guillaume Benet. Valentine clung to his conjecture. That's why he might have sought help from a demoness. Could he have joined the demoness family to seek revenge and then transition into becoming a demoness himself? If that's true, this could become a major issue. Lumian Lee carries significant problems with him. And you mentioned the demoness family's penchant for sowing chaos. 
Angulin nodded. We must keep a close eye on this. I'll report this matter. Meanwhile, intensify the scrutiny of suspicious individuals in the market district. Having made up his mind, he reassured Valentine, don't be overly anxious. Lumian Li isn't the only one with a reason to eliminate Guillaume Benet. There are powerful bounty hunters, official members of the Aurora Order, and the bestowed of other evil gods. Valentine acknowledged concisely, signifying his comprehension. Following their discussion on recent Beyonder cases, Valentine and Imra exited the deacon's office, passing by Charlie who was acquainting himself with a mechanical typewriter, before heading towards the tunnel leading to Eglise St. Robert. Why do you think the quasi demoness is seeking us? Has she uncovered crucial information? Imra inquired curiously, conversing with his fellow teammate. Valentine ruminated briefly before responding, could it be related to Guillaume Benet's death? Imra was caught off guard. Are you suggesting she had contact with the Demonis family? Before Valentine could reply, Imra shook his head. That's impossible. The Demonis family despises female assassins. If they encounter one, they'll surely eliminate them. Chapter 341 Branch on Rue Doyle, nestled between the Market District and the Solemn Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, stretched a verdant street. Its clean pavements and modern architectural style set it apart from its surroundings. Jenna had deliberately chosen this location to rendezvous with the purifiers. The individuals frequenting this place had little connection to her former life, and the likelihood of recognition was slim. Clothed in a pristine white blouse and a light brown dress, Jenna's attire differed slightly from her previous encounters with the two purifiers. This strategic variation was intended to thwart any attempts by the other party to decipher her intentions if she were to wear the same ensemble repeatedly. Nevertheless, her overall presentation remained faithful to a certain style, a portrayal of cleanliness, radiance, and vitality. This image was a composite distilled from the bishop's sermons and the impassioned advocacy she had encountered during her involvement in church activities. A sun talisman dangled around her neck, accentuating her brownish-yellow hair that was neatly tied up. She followed the elongated shadows cast by the trees, moving toward apartment 17. In the midst of her journey, a brown four-wheeled carriage rumbled by. The window was ajar, revealing an arresting visage. Adorned in a black court dress, a lady graced the carriage's interior. A dark veil hat adorned with white feathers crowned her head, intricately framing her raven black hair. Her face boasted soft contours, her chin held a graceful curve. A slender, elevated nose bridge led to plump, subtly upturned crimson lips. Within her dark gray eyes, a glint of brightness coexisted with a hint of melancholy, evoking a pang of sympathy. How beautiful! Jenna sighed from the bottom of her heart as the carriage passed. Even though Jenna herself could be considered attractive, she remained capable of appreciating the allure of others. Simultaneously, she acknowledged the stark contrast between her appearance and that of Franca, who had ascended to the rank of demoness of pleasure, as well as the lady who had just passed. Shifting her focus, Jenna ascended to the roof of apartment 17 on Rue Doyle. Her wait was brief, for Imra and Valentine soon appeared. Valentine's demeanor, though frosty, gave way to a proactive inquiry. Have you obtained crucial intelligence? Valentine's gaze swept past Jenna's neck, where the sun's sacred emblem was suspended. A subtle nod confirmed his satisfaction. Jenna shook her head slowly. No. Without permitting Imra and Valentine to voice their queries, she bared her emotions in earnest. I want to repent. Repent? Imra exchanged a quizzical glance with Valentine. Had something gone awry? Jenna's gaze lowered, a bittersweet smile touching her lips as she regarded the ground. My mother haunts my dreams, recurring persistently. And each time she appears in my sleep, I find myself grappling with a nagging question. Why did the church permit someone like Hugues Artois to partake in the elections? Upon uncovering the truth, why did they not promptly apprehend his accomplices and thus forestall the ensuing catastrophe? I, I yearn for redemption. 
The pain gnaws at my heart, sowing doubt in my faith, and causing me to question whether God and the church still watch over us. These sentiments were sincere, albeit less intense than they seemed. Valentine felt ashamed and didn't know how to respond to Jenna. Imra, who had experienced many similar situations, sighed and consoled her skillfully, there's no need to doubt that God is always watching over us. The sun graces the land each day, yet we understand that the ebb and flow of light and darkness constitutes the essence of our world. Just as the sun sets inevitably to give rise to night, it's this very cycle that allows us to revel in the radiance of the morning and the ascent of the sun. Likewise, the church is an all-powerful. In Intus, we remain subject to the constraints imposed by the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery, the National Convention, and the government. Our actions are bound by limitations, we cannot operate without restraint and probe at will. Pain and calamity are integral facets of existence. Their presence varies, but they are transient, much like the sun's emergence after the darkness. Jenna fell into contemplative silence for a few seconds before exhaling, a slow release of tension. She extended her arms slightly, proclaiming, Praise the sun. Praise the sun, both Valentine and Imra echoed in unison. With her sincere performance, Jenna asked, Who propelled Hughes Artois to the position of parliament member? And who facilitated his representation for an evil god? We're in the midst of investigating. No substantial breakthroughs have emerged thus far, Imra replied after measured consideration. Jenna's expression turned to one of anxiety and concern. Why the lack of substantive progress? Is it due to the limitations mentioned earlier, which hinder the acquisition of pivotal leads? Do you require my help? I operate unbound by restrictions and hold no fear of breaching the law. Imra and Valentine were caught off guard by Jenna's reaction. It echoed the same spirit as her abrupt assassination of Hugues Artois, albeit in a more subdued form. The two exchanged glances, a wordless deliberation on whether to entrust this matter to an informant bound by contract, thereby affording greater flexibility and latitude. Drawing upon Franca's counsel, Jenna refrained from invoking instigation directly. She instead gauged the disposition of the two purifiers and employed words to accomplish her intent. If the church itself finds its hands tied, could it not delegate the task to capable devotees? Which holds greater importance, the church's dignity or the well-being of God's children? With each thwarted catastrophe, numerous families and lives are spared. They all stand as devout supplicants to the sun. An evil god was backing Hugues Artois. Valentine found himself swayed, and observing Imra's absence of dissent, he addressed Jenna with gravity, Are you sure you want to help us investigate this matter? It's very dangerous. The odds of forfeiting your life are substantial. Jenna responded with a smile suffused with complexity, I'm afraid of death, but I'm more afraid of becoming a sacrificial lamb for the heretics, much like my mother. She didn't hide her hatred at all. Imra then said, In the course of our investigations, we've ascertained that Hughes Artois shared close ties with General Philip. Certain covert activities trace back to him. However, General Philip succumbed to illness last year, resulting in the loss of all leads. The other backers and supporters of Hugues Artois either owed their allegiance to General Philip or deemed him an asset worthy of support. Their involvement in heretical belief or secret organizations remains unverified. Jenna blurted out, What about Philip's family? What of the heretics who encircled Hugues Artois? There's nothing wrong with Philip's family, Valentine responded, his tone revealing traces of vexation. We've apprehended only two heretics affiliated with Hugues Artois' campaign. Their roles were comparatively inconsequential. The individual most knowledgeable opted for suicide when escape became unfeasible. His fanaticism stymied our quest for the sought-after leads. We've effectively eliminated two branches of the secret organization, the Order of All Extinction. Order of All Extinction. Jenna recalled the secret organization that believed in an evil god. Imra supplemented, the primary source of knowledge is the red-haired woman named Cassandra. She hails from the Sauron lineage, a collateral branch of the former royal family. A beyonder and a heretic graced with a boon. Is there anything wrong with the Sauron family? Jenna inquired further. 
Imre shook his head. At present, no concrete conclusions exist. The noble families that supported Hugues Artois maintained standard relations with the Sauron family. Cassandra chose an adventuring life, as she encountered minimal regard within the Sauron family hierarchy. Subsequently, she became a Beyonder, ultimately joining Hugues Artois' team last year. Cartier de la Maison d'Opera, Rue Lombard, Mechanical Café. Mechanical precision guided the king's pie to Pufer Sauron and his associates within the Black Cat organization. The pie bore the appearance of a brown floral marvel adorned with intricate black motifs. Pufer looked around and said to Lumian, Anori, and the others, I suggest that this game of king's pie serves as a tribute to one of my esteemed forebears. He held the title of the first Count Ardennen and the 27th Count of Champagne. In his interactions, Pufer habitually designated himself as Count Ardennen. The Count of Champagne, the one who coveted Roselle's ass. Novelist Anori quipped with a grin. Over the past year, the most sought-after banned manuscript within Trier's covert book market had been Emperor Roselle's Secret Chronicles. Within its pages lay a trove of Emperor Roselle-related rumors, intermingled with an array of outlandish, sizzling revelations. Pufer sighed and said, that would be the thirtieth Count of Champagne, the great-grandson of my illustrious ancestor. He hails from a distinct Sauron family branch. I have no objections. The flaxen-haired painter, Mullen, steered the conversation back on track. This was merely a game, no one else insisted on allocating the surplus king's pie to a specific figure, thus prompt consensus was achieved. Considering Lumian's usual style, he should have objected and angered Count Pufer. However, he recalled that his current role revolved around that of a friend of Gardner Martin, scion of a prosperous merchant family with a penchant for art. He was essentially playing the role of a spendthrift imbecile, a persona that basked in the lavish spending only to incur disdain. Pufer shifted his attention to the more reticent literary critic, Ernst Young, and instructed, You shall have the honor of cutting the pie. Ernst Young, his black curls framing his face, indulged in a self-deprecating smile. I despise the absence of waiters in the mechanical cafe. It makes me feel like a waiter. Isn't that a good thing? It signifies the absence of spies, novelist Anori muttered. A puff of cherrywood smoke escaped the pipe held by Irita, the poet, as he chuckled in response, perhaps the spy is among us. At that moment, Ernst Young had already picked up the table knife, slicing the king's pie into seven equal portions. Pufer delicately positioned one of the king's pie slices near the plate's rim, hands clasped, cradling it against his chest. His voice, a soft cadence, invoked an invocation, to you, member of the mighty Sauron family, the great Vermont Champagne Sauron. Pufer repeated the incantation thrice. Lumian couldn't help but note that mechanical café, already bereft of its waiters, descended into an amplified hush, akin to the commencement of the bishop's sermons. After offering the excess portion of the king's pie to Vermont Sauron, Pufer raised his gaze to Lumian and grinned. You're the guest. You'll be the first to choose. Without observing, Lumian extended his hand to the king's pie closest to him. At that moment, Termoboros's resonant voice echoed in Lumian's ears, switch. Chapter 342, Fright Switch Lumian hadn't anticipated that Termoboros would drop a hint at a moment like this. Whether this inevitability angel aimed to use the opportunity to set a trap or had some other intention, or if he simply sought to avert any trouble from befalling his vessel at this particular time and place, it was clear that this seemingly unremarkable game of King's Pike concealed profound hidden hazards. Once triggered, it would plunge all those present into a perilous abyss. When Count Pufer brought up the mystical aspect, the act of sacrificing a piece of king's pie to a deity or revered ancestor, Lumian suspected the presence of a beyonder element. It resembled the divination games favored by many enthusiasts of mysticism. To his astonishment, the issue proved even graver than he had initially imagined. It had prompted an angel to believe that he, Lumian, a dual sequence seven, was incapable of handling it or could be harmed by it. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian struggled to fathom Termoboros's motives. 
All he could manage was cautiously extending his arm and nonchalantly selecting one of the remaining five slices of king's pie. This time, Termoboros didn't intervene. After Lumian, Anori, Mullen, Ernst Young, and Irita each acquired a slice of king's pie, only the one nearest to Lumian remained. Seems like it's mine. Count Pufer leaned in, grinned, and seized the slice of king's pie. He brought it to his mouth and delicately took a bite. Lumian followed suit. The crust was crisp, the filling sweet, its aroma lingering on his palate. The quality was rather impressive. After a few bites, Count Pufer chuckled and remarked, Looks like I'm the king today. As he uttered the words, he extracted a broad bean from his mouth. The instant Lumian laid eyes on the broad bean, a faint trace of blood and rust wafted to his senses. Meanwhile, the atmosphere in the mechanical cafe grew heavy, as if everyone dreaded receiving an order they couldn't bear. Count Pufer rose from his seat, his back to the window that faced the street, blotting out the sunlight, which cast a faint shadow over his face. His smile seemed somewhat dark. Count Pufer's gaze fixed upon the novelist Anori, a mischievous smile dancing on his lips. Step outside the cafe and declare to the passersby, I'm dog shit. Anori, who had been on edge, let out a sigh of relief and responded with a grin, sure thing. The portly man rose from his seat and hastened to the door, grasping the handle nestled in the sidewall. Amidst a grinding noise and faint clatters, the mechanical arm suddenly tightened, its grip dragging the weighty wooden door ajar. Anori ventured outside and onto the street. He directed his voice at the pedestrians, I'm dog's hit. I'm a piece of dog's hit raised by a sow. My whole family is dog's hit raised by sows. The passersby stared in astonishment before erupting into laughter. After cursing himself, Anori returned to Lumian and the others in high spirits. You've got an impressive mental fortitude. Lumian compelled himself to rephrase your really thick-skinned in a more polished manner. Novelist Anori chuckled and said, Whenever I'm stuck in my writing, I'll curse myself out on the balcony. It's the simplest method. You writers do have your peculiarities. Lumian was reminded of his sister, who fancied herself afflicted by an advanced stage of procrastination syndrome. Anori took a sip of absinthe and resettled himself. His attention turned to Count Pufer, who, with his back to the light, cast his gaze upon Mullen, the pale and handsome painter. Slap Irita. Mullen relaxed in his seat, opting not to rise. He leaned forward and delivered a slap to poet Irita. Irita, his hair thinning and his facial muscles slightly sagging, remained unperturbed. He merely drew another puff from his pipe. Noticing Lumian's scrutiny, he offered a casual smile. As a poet, I must learn to relish the malice around me. Finding joy in malice. What a poetic youth. Well, more accurately, a poetic middle-aged man. Lumian surveyed the participants of the game, realizing that aside from Count Pufer, who had consumed the broad bean, nothing else appeared amiss. Count Pufer shifted his posture slightly, his features still shaded by the backlight. He said to Ernst Young, Express your loyalty to me. When the black cats convened, they often engaged in a variety of audacious acts. In a more contemporary characterization, they were avant-gardes of performance art. Hence, Ernst Young felt no qualms about kneeling on one knee and professing loyalty. He even considered it insufficient, sensing that it lacked excitement or humiliation. Count Pufer then turned to the poet, Irita, and dictated, Give all your money to the beggar across the street. Irita was taken aback. His heart ached as he responded, All right. As you know, I'm a pauper. Over the past five years, I've scarcely earned three thousand verldor from my poetry. Each day. I ponder which friend might organize an event and offer me a free drink. Quite the honest poet. Lumian pondered whether he should sponsor this individual and witness what kind of verses he could produce. After all, the sponsorship fee was supplied by Gardner Martin. Not employing it would result in it going unused. Conversely, by sponsoring certain artists, he could potentially pocket a portion for himself. Before Count Pufer could reply, Irita suddenly burst into laughter. 
he fumbled in his pocket and exclaimed with excitement, that's why I only brought five vril d'or. Five vril d'or? At the Vichy Café, that had barely cover half a bottle of mineral water and two boiled eggs, novelist Anori murmured as he watched poet Irita hastily depart. He tossed the five vril d'or to the beggar opposite. Vichy Café resided in an alley off Avenue du Boulevard. It drew parliament members, high-ranking government officials, bankers, industrialists, financiers, famed courtesans, and esteemed authors, painters, poets, and sculptors from the upper echelons of society. By this juncture, every participant had taken their turn, leaving Lumian as the last. Count Puffer fixed his gaze on Lumian, his look profound as he spoke, this is your inaugural time attending our black cat gathering. I'll assign you a simple task. Take your slice of king's pie and proceed to the last room in the café's basement. Exchange the pie for a sheet of white paper. This bears a hint of mystique. If anything goes awry, I'll just burn down that basement. Lumian mumbled to himself as he clutched the partially eaten king's pie. As per novelist Anori's guidance, he located a staircase leading to the basement close to the kitchen. Before venturing forth, he ignited the gas wall lamps in the vicinity. Under their faint yellow radiance, he navigated a corridor cluttered with various items until he reached the last room. The vermilion door stood tightly sealed. Lumian listened attentively but detected no movements from within. There were no suspicious signs around the door either. Lumian extended his right palm, gripped the handle, gave it a gentle twist, and gradually pushed inward. As the gas lamps in the basement's corridor illuminated the space, objects came into view. These objects were heads, clustered within the dusky shadows, their gazes devoid of emotion, fixed on the intruder at the entrance. Lumian's pupils dilated as he recognized a few familiar heads. They belonged to novelist Anori, painter Mullen, critic Ernst Young, and poet Irita. Just before conjuring a fireball, Lumian, experienced and resilient, forced himself to steady his nerves and discern the situation. The heads lacked the pallor of the deceased, and the room was bereft of the distinct scent of preservatives. Lumian reigned in his initial reaction and scrutinized the scene. He realized that these were wax heads that had been taken down. Resembling melons, they were stashed within compartments on a wooden frame. Is this mission intended to startle me? Were it not for Termoboros's forewarning, how could such a prank perturb me? What's so mystical about this? Lumian ruminated for a moment before placing his king's pie on a wooden shelf and extracting a sheet of white paper from one of the wax heads. Upon returning to the mechanical café with the white paper in hand, he was met with smiles from Anori, Irita, and the others, as though gauging any lingering trepidation. Count Puffer nodded in satisfaction. You executed the mission admirably. What if I hadn't executed it admirably? What would have transpired? Lumian simulated residual unease and inquired, those wax heads seemed so lifelike that they nearly stopped my heart. Ha ha, Anori chortled. This serves as Count's welcome gesture to every newcomer. He's rather fond of collecting wax figurine heads. Each individual he acknowledges receives an invitation from a wax sculptor to immortalize their heads as art and place them in the basement of the mechanical cafe. It's almost as if your heads have been given to Count Puffer. Lumian eyed Anori and the others necks, yet found no trace of sutures. After delving into various rumors circulating within the novelist's circle and offering 2,000 Vroldor to sponsor the Black Cat, Lumian took his leave. As he departed, his gaze inadvertently swept over the two-legged tables. Abruptly, Lumian's pupils constricted. He observed that Count Puffer, Anori, and the others still had unfinished king's pie on their plates while the white glazed porcelain plate that had previously held the pie now sat empty. There should have been a slice of king's pie intended for the Sauron family ancestor. It was gone. Lumian's perplexity couldn't be concealed. He gestured toward the snack plate and remarked, I recall there being a slice of king's pie left. Count Puffer chuckled and sipped his coffee. I ate it. Is that so? Lumian smiled in realization. Turning away, he exited the mechanical café, the smile on his face gradually waning. 
Count Poofer had only taken two bites of his slice of king's pie. Chapter 343 Feedback As Lumian strode down Rue Lombard toward the nearest public carriage stop, a sense of unease settled over him. Observing the deserted street, he dropped his voice to a hushed tone as he muttered, Temaboros, why did you make me choose the king's pie slice without the broad bean? What if he had consumed that fateful broad bean and ascended to the role of the king? But Termoboros remained silent, withholding any response. Lumian pondered for a moment, then rephrased his question. Though the entire incident held a few unsettling details, the outcome appeared unremarkable. It's hard to discern whether it's tied to mysticism or beyond her powers. After a brief pause, Termoboros's deep voice echoed in Lumian's ears. Next time, you could consider defying the king's orders. What if I chose to disregard the king's commands? What if I indulged in my king's pie instead of placing it in the room of wax figurines or even walking away with the paper? Lumian's mind plunged into contemplation. Rather than heading directly back to the market district, he hailed a public carriage bound for Rue Shear on Avenue du Boulevard. As an official member of the Aurora Order, he bore the responsibility of promptly reporting his execution of Guillaume Benet and the latest developments within the Iron and Blood Cross Order to Mr. K. Simultaneously, he hoped to flee something out of them. Participating in three secret organizations came with the potential of receiving triple rewards, but it also entailed making three reports per mission. 19 Rue Shear, underground of Psychic's headquarters. Mr. K perpetually unchanging, sat in the red armchair, attentively listening as Lumian recounted his strategic utilization of the Iron and Blood Cross Order's resources to pinpoint and eliminate Guillaume Benet, the heretic. When Lumian mentioned how the former padre of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church had embraced the entity known as inevitability in pursuit of power and strength, Mr. K lowered his head and traced a cross upon his chest in a deliberate up and down, left to right motion. His voice, hoarse and subdued, chanted a prayer, Merciful Father, forgive the world's transgressions. Lumian's lips twitched, mirroring Mr. K's penance, although he couldn't fathom the necessity of such repentance. Post-repentance, he succinctly recounted Aurora's dual nature and the sinister sinner's organization that underpinned Roche-Louis Sanson. Finally, he said, Mr. K, I request your aid in locating the original family of Aurora, or rather, Roche Louis Sanson. They may well be tied to the sinners, a heretical group devoted to inevitability. Mr. K's face, obscured beneath a voluminous hood, remained shrouded in shadow. His words, tinged with satisfaction, hoarsely resonated. I understand your desire to avenge Aurora. There is no problem in that. The benevolent Father and the omnipotent God do not bar believers from securing their own futures. If they can intertwine personal matters with the sacred crusade against heresy, all the better. In this endeavor, leveraging your assets and harnessing the resources of the Iron and Blood Cross Order to fulfill your objective is a strategy one admire. Strive for more of such feats. I'll investigate the sinners. He agreed to Lumian's request as it aligned perfectly with his own aspirations. By unearthing Roche Louise Sanson's family, he could deal with the sinners, a faction devoted to the evil god, inevitability. Thank you, Mr. K, Lumian said sincerely. He pondered for a moment before proceeding, the death of Guillaume Benet might trigger an intensified pursuit from the official beyonders. I'm wondering if there exists a mystical item that would suit my needs, enabling me to alter my appearance and stature at will? He was seeking a means to assume Aurora's identity infiltrating the curly-haired baboon's research society as muggle. Mr. K's tone shifted abruptly, infused with zeal. Only the lifeblood I possess can accomplish what you seek. So long as you can master your flesh and blood, altering your height and appearance becomes attainable. While it may not provide an exact replica of your desires, it suffices to veil your true identity. The caveat lies in the necessity for early injection and its limited duration. You won't possess the liberty to transform at your whim. Precision isn't required, members of the curly-haired baboons research society assume disguises, masking their true selves during gatherings. Yet, that falls short. 
a perceptive spectator might notice something from Aurora's eyes or the contour of the chin. To fully pass off as muggle and dupe everyone, the masked face must mirror Aurora's flawlessly. Plus, the adverse effects of lifeblood are beyond my tolerance. Lumian's thoughts coalesced, and he articulated his response. I'm concerned that administering lifeblood could revert me to the most primordial human archetype. Despite the Lord's protection mitigating severe physical and mental consequences, the Iron and Blood Cross Order could easily detect the anomaly and discern my true allegiance. Mr. Kate sighed in disappointment. That's a problem. Though I believe the Lord will safeguard you, preserving your devout persona from exposure, your concerns bear merit. Having declined the offer of lifeblood, Lumian continued, Recently, the Iron and Blood Cross Order tasked me with an interaction. He detailed Gardner Martin's summons, narrating until the culmination of the King's Pie game. The sole omission was Termoboros's warning, the reason subtly placed on his intricate grasp of mysticism. A niggling suspicion prodded him to sidestep the matter, avoiding any potential anomalies. Mr. K listened attentively, refraining from interjection. As Lumian concluded, Mr. K stood and paced the room. Your next objective is to figure out the Iron and Blood Cross Order's rationale for engaging the Sauron family. Are they coveting the Sauron's inheritance or considering collaboration? Yes, Mr. K. Lumian recognized the need for him to remain well informed, irrespective of Mr. K's order. Mr. K halted his pacing, fixing his gaze on Lumian. Your intuition is sound. Should any mishap occur within that game, it could set off a mystical catastrophe. The central figure of Pufer's sacrifice, Vermanda Sauron, held significant standing within the Sauron royal family of that era. Born into the Champagne lineage, he was adopted into the main family by King Odo XII, who invested resources in his upbringing. Vermanda began auspiciously but met a negative end. His later years saw him vanish without a trace, dealing a heavy blow to the Sauron dynasty. In the ensuing two decades, several prominent Sauron family members met untimely and mysterious deaths, or succumbed to sudden insanity. The family's power dwindled, paving the way for Roselle's eventual overthrow. Emperor Roselle's successful usurpation of the Sauron dynasty was partly facilitated by the apparent decline of the ancient royal line. Vermanda's inexplicable disappearance spanned two to three centuries. How could today's sacrifice catalyze a dangerous mystical shift? Lumian's thoughts raced, absorbing the details recounted by Mr. K. Apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches Jenna, having gleaned some insights from the purifiers, sought out Franca in hopes of sharing her findings. As her gaze roamed the room, Jenna's attention was drawn to the slightly ajar master bedroom door, from which emanated a rhythmic tapping sound. Franca, she called. Franca's clear voice resounded. I'm here. Come inside. Jenna, who had never entered Franca's bedroom, hesitated for a moment before walking over and pushing open the door. A burst of amazement brightened her blue eyes as they fell upon an intricate apparatus nestled against the wall, distant from the window. The contraption consisted of a myriad of interlocking gears and circling brass cylinders, interconnected through levers, crankshafts, and screws. In awe, Jenna regarded the towering device and inquired, What is this? Seated before the elaborate mechanism, Franca's fingers danced across a state-of-the-art mechanical typewriter as she proudly introduced it to her companion. This is a third-generation difference engine, cleverly modified, a sort of analyzer. It's a truncated version, simplified and miniaturized. The complete model wouldn't fit in my room. Are you really a believer of the god of steam and machinery? Jenna blurted out. Franca chuckled and explained, sometimes. Jenna's scrutiny lingered on the so-called analyzer, revealing the connection of a telegraph machine and two metallic mechanical typewriters at its lower end. It wasn't long before Franca ceased her typing, and the analyzer's mechanical appendage set the second typewriter into motion, producing letters upon pristine paper. The energy and information seemed to flow from the radio transceiver. What? What are you doing? Jenna felt illiterate. Franca happily pointed at the analyzer and said, 
When the coding remains consistent, this contraption can automatically decode telegrams and codes for me. Through the metallic fingers linked to the mechanical typewriter's keypad, it types the corresponding letters, shaping the intended words. In essence, I can directly read the content of telegrams. No need to laboriously decode the encrypted messages I receive. It saves me considerable time and effort. Likewise, I can draft telegrams in standard language. The machine will autonomously encode them and transmit them via a predetermined radio frequency. Studying the gears as they turned in their various states, Jenna struggled to grasp Franca's intent. But what's the purpose? she asked, befuddled. Franca was caught off guard. Purpose? Well, the purpose is to simplify telegram conversations. Make it something mundane and routine. Though admittedly, it does consume quite a bit of paper. Telegram conversations? Jenna felt a touch of perplexity. Franca had constructed such an intricate apparatus and embarked on such an elaborate matter simply for conversation. The late-night typewriter sounds were Franca engaged in casual chatting. Exactly, Franca affirmed with a self-satisfied grin. A friend of mine in the Lowen military agreed to share the information Anthony Reed seeks during that time frame. We just had a brief exchange. While Franca could easily request the pertinent information from Madam Judgment, she preferred not to burden her major arcana cardholder unless absolutely necessary. As Franca finished speaking, the analyzer completed its task of typewriting, and the telegram materialized in intision. Snatching the paper, Franca's countenance darkened as she scanned its contents. At night, in apartment 601, Lumian, Anthony Reed, Franca, and Jenna reassembled. Waving the paper in her grip, Franca addressed Anthony Reed, stating, I've received a response. The Lowen military's official report on the encounter states, No such battle occurred. No such battle occurred? Anthony Reed's eyes widened as he jolted to his feet. No battle at all? Lumian arched an eyebrow. Such a response was undeniably unexpected. Franca nodded gently, her gaze fixed on Anthony Reed. To put it simply, it's highly probable that the assault against you and your companions was not executed by the Lowen army. Chapter 344 Boxing Gloves Not by the Lowen army. Anthony Reed muttered under his breath, his eyes distant. The night of the attack had haunted his dreams, replaying over and over, each iteration etching the brutality and mercilessness of the Lowen soldiers into his consciousness. These nightmares had grown, evolving into an inescapable nightmare. And now, shockingly, someone was telling him that they were not Lowen soldiers. Franca's demeanor, the subtle shifts in her expressions and body language, it all told him that Franca wasn't lying, she wasn't bluffing him. This revelation rendered his years of suffering, of misattributed blame, into a cruel jest. As a psychiatrist, Anthony Reed was acutely attuned to the waves of disillusionment that crashed through his psyche. His emotional stability quivered, struck by a potent aftershock. Instinctively, he used placate on himself. As Anthony Reed struggled to save himself, Frank elaborated, either the battle's secrecy is of the highest order, barring Miloanese friend from obtaining the truth for now, or a different faction entirely orchestrated the assault on your unit. Her inclination leaned toward the latter possibility. In the grand scheme of the Lowen Kingdom, this skirmish was a minor one. Anthony's company held no strategic value, no pivotal figures, so there was no reason for a high-level concealment. Who could it be? Jenna had already raised this question after reading the telegram, but both of them couldn't come up with a reasonable answer. She even speculated that an instigator might have sowed seeds of internal discord amidst the Intus army to digest a potion. This made one of the companies impersonate as Lowenese soldiers, launching a deadly nocturnal assault on Anthony Reed and his comrades. However, this was far too difficult. No matter how formidable an instigator was, there was no hope of success unless Anthony Reed's company had discovered evidence of someone's serious crimes or formed a deep feud with other companies due to conflicts on the battlefield. Indeed, who could it be? Anthony Reed, now more composed thanks to his placate, intoned with a voice etched in determination. 
he understood why the Lowen army would attack him and his comrades, their animosity, though intense, was comprehensible within the context of war. But an attack from an unknown faction? That puzzled him. Franca pondered for a moment and said, Did your unit forsake allies on the battlefield? Or perhaps lay claim to spoils of war that weren't rightfully yours? Anthony Reed ruminated briefly before shaking his head resolutely. No. Lumian chimed in with conviction, absolutely not. This ties back to Hugues Artois. It can't be a squabble between comrades or external rivals. Jenna, absorbed in contemplation, posed another question, did you defy Hugues Artois' orders? Or did your actions inadvertently cost him something? Anthony Reed shook his head again. If I had, I wouldn't have grappled with years of puzzlement. Silence enveloped apartment 601, a contemplative hush broken only by Lumian's recollection. A shard of Madame Magician's prior words tugged at his thoughts, and he ventured, could it be a sacrificial rite? A blood offering to an evil god? Madame Magician had mentioned that sinners, a secret organization devoted to evil gods, emerged in the war's later phases. The conflict had unwittingly provided opportunities for these evil gods to infiltrate the realm. Could Anthony Reed and his comrades have stumbled upon one of these opportunities? Blood sacrifice. Franca and Jenna recalled the support various evil god factions had given Hugues Artois. Had he forged an alliance with these heretics? Did he sacrifice his own company? Anthony Reed fell silent for a moment before saying, the heretics, disguised as the Lowen army, orchestrated our annihilation with Hugues Artois' complicity? Franca said insightfully, it's the most logical explanation, though the question remains, who gains? Certainly not Hugues Artois. He reaped no boons, not even in death. For a moment, no one could answer Franca's question. After a few seconds, Lumian said, that's one of the avenues we must delve into as we proceed. It might intertwine with Hugues Artois' ascent to power in his parliamentary role. Upon hearing this, Jenna recounted the information she had obtained from the purifiers and concluded, the pressing issue lies in the fact that General Philip, who seems the most suspicious, is already deceased. It's as if all the threads converge at a sudden dead end. He died just in time. Franca chuckled. A preemptive elimination, perhaps? Lumian stroked his chin and spoke slowly, in the world of mysticism, certain deaths don't necessarily mean true demise. Madame Justice had mentioned that an evil god's boon had a deceased sequence. They could use death to escape their original fate. Similarly, if General Philip had used the substitution spell, the one who died might not be the real him. Franca, who had previously helped with finishing Guillaume Benet, immediately understood. Substitution spell? We cannot dismiss the possibility. Lumian smiled. Our immediate objective remains the investigation of General Philip, ascertaining the truth of his demise. Even if he is truly dead, there may be traces he left behind, undiscovered by the purifiers due to the constraints imposed on them. Anthony Reed, though still grappling with the shattering revelations, felt the warmth of unity and purpose in his companion's discourse. It bolstered his resolve, a spark of renewed determination igniting within him. He nodded slightly and said, there's no need to rush. This matter must be very complicated. I'll first gather preliminary information about General Philip, his family, and friends. After Anthony Reed took his leave, Lumian observed Franca preparing to head to Rue de Fontaine's in search of Gardner Martin, so he left apartment 601 with her. As they walked down the stairs, Lumian broached the subject of his conversation with Gila, sharing the details with Franca. Her excitement burgeoned as she absorbed his words, a fervor building within her. Great! Great! Quickly transform into Muggle. Let's make contact with April Fools together. Why are you so excited? Lumian glanced at him. Franca made a tongue clicking sound and chuckled. Back home, there's a saying that goes, if you get drenched in the rain, rip up someone else's umbrella. Ha ha, it's all in jest, but isn't it interesting? Even though your appearance leans towards masculinity, a few simple adjustments can render you strikingly beautiful. Once the pyromaniac potion has been digested, 
have you not considered having a potion of pleasure? Sigh, forget it. There's still some risk before reaching sequence four. Laughter and jesting flowed between them, Franca's demeanor then taking a more serious turn as they reached the street furthermore, you're one of the few people I can trust now. If I could obtain your direct collaboration in our probe of the April Fool's conundrum, I'd feel significantly more secure. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Lumian echoed the sentiment, a tinge of regret shading his words. His curiosity then led him to inquire about Emperor Roselle and the perplexing attitudes of the curly-haired baboon's research society members. Franca's expression turned strange, as if she struggled to suppress a bout of laughter. After a moment, she exhaled and said, This matter is quite complicated. It's difficult to explain in a few words. I'll explain in detail tomorrow or the day after tomorrow when I'm free. In short, be mentally prepared. How complicated can it be? Lumian muttered. He bade Frank a farewell and commenced his journey toward Rue Anarchy. Upon reaching room 207 at Aubert's Du Coq door, despite having already deciphered the issue with Aurora's grimoires and no longer needing to delve into them, Lumian's habits dictated that he retrieve the copies and skim through their contents, his thoughts wandering amidst the scattered pages. Approaching midnight, a stirring within Lumian's heart drew his gaze toward the carbide lamp. The light it emitted bore a dark green hue. The doll messenger, clad in a light gold dress, suddenly materialized. It glared coldly at Lumian, as if striving to contain its emotions. With twin thuds, a pair of iron-black boxing gloves, adorned with multiple short thorns, landed soundlessly on the table. The impact carried a resonance more akin to wood meeting wood than metal striking wood. Simultaneously, a folded sheet of paper drifted toward Lumian. Thank you. Although the doll messenger quickly vanished, Lumian still expressed his gratitude politely. He refrained from touching the boxing gloves for now, opting to unfold the piece of paper and peruse the contents of Madame Magician's message. The shadow branch and the lucky one beyond her characteristic have been made into a mystical item. How does it fare? Has its form been modified? rendering it more convenient for transport? This is a masterpiece forged by a master. It remains nameless for now. With common words, you could dub it the lucky shadow boxing glove. For a touch of panache, flog could be a stylish choice. The name is yours to determine. Any target struck by this glove, regardless of creating injuries, whether they defend with a weapon or not, will undergo a surge of desire or emotion. The specific emotion hinges on your luck. Yet, with the presence of Lucky One, you can envision or simulate the corresponding desires and emotions ahead of time, guiding the target's reaction. The success rate stands impressively high, around 70 to 80 percent. Following the trigger of a target's desires or emotions, a second strike won't engender new feelings. Instead, there's a likelihood of causing the pre existing desires or emotions to erupt. This unleashes an overwhelming tidal wave on most targets, inflicting significant harm, even rendering them temporarily incapacitated. While the likelihood of invoking desire or emotion with each hit isn't substantial, repetitive blows will eventually yield the desired outcome, unless you are cursed with bad luck that counteracts the influence of Lucky One. However, the glove's most exceptional facet isn't its offensive potential, but its defensive capabilities. It possesses unparalleled sturdiness, capable of withstanding an assault from a reaper without incurring any damage. Note, reaper refers to sequence 5 of the hunter pathway. Naturally, this hinges on the attack squarely targeting the glove. In such a scenario, there's even a possibility of taking a strike infused with godhood, at the expense of shattering or fracturing the glove. This probably places the glove at sequence 4. On the downside, carrying the glove will erode your self-control, intensifying the oscillations of various desires and emotions. Withstanding this requires exceptional endurance. Moreover, while donning the glove, you will attract the attention of a hidden entity since it originated from the Tree of Shadow. While they cannot directly harm you for various reasons, they can summon dangerous entities to your vicinity, influencing or attacking you. Hence, each use of the boxing gloves should be accompanied by a change of location, and their usage should not be for extended periods. 
failure to adhere to these guidelines may attract hidden dangers. However, should you maintain your composure and endure one or two attacks, the world will expel those dangerous entities who can't truly descend here. Ah, one last detail, your two psychiatrists request a final follow-up consultation at the usual time tomorrow afternoon. Chapter 345, Dream I need exceptional endurance to withstand the weakening of self-control brought about by carrying the flock. The waves of various desires and emotions surge stronger. Am's monk excels in handling such situations. While reading Madame Magician's letter, Lumian swiftly considered if he could fulfill the conditions for using the mystical item. Naturally, he didn't have to keep the flawed boxing gloves with him to employ them. Lumian could position them in advance and entice the enemy into an ambush before revealing them. Alternatively, he could accumulate enough resources to purchase a steam robot and have emotionless tools carry the gloves for him. Nevertheless, thanks to Am's monk's abilities in managing adverse effects, he didn't need to resort to such complicated strategies. With this in mind, Lumian recollected the adverse effects of contractee contracts. A substantial portion of them seemed to be mitigated by Am's monk's resilience and self-restraint. First acquiring the Am's monk boon prior to becoming a contractee. Could it be that one must bolster their endurance to endure a contract? Otherwise, the Padre with over ten negative effects would have self-destructed long ago. Yes, Guillaume Benet's utilization of Am's monk and ascetic powers wasn't overly adept. Could this stem from his ingrained indulgence, making change difficult? Or did he leap directly into being a contractee before evolving into a fate appropriator? His grasp of the Am's monk and ascetic boons seemed inadequate, relying largely on instinct. Lumian murmured to himself. Recalling how the Padre in the dream transformed from an ordinary individual to a fate appropriator within a day, Lumian was more inclined to believe the latter possibility. He surmised that the events in the dream marked Guillaume Benet's advancement to a fate appropriator with only two to three boons. Lumian redirected his attention to the letter in his hand and read through the remainder in one go. Concerning the utilization of the flawed boxing gloves to attract perilous creatures, he intended to seize an opportunity and approach Franca for assistance to verify the precise circumstances. If indeed hazardous, he would need to contemplate reserving one usage of spirit world traversal to escape any future influence or attack. Crimson flames silently surged, setting the letter ablaze, its words turning to ash. Amidst the dispersed ashes, Lumian reached out his hand toward the iron black boxing gloves. Although they lacked the metallic texture and chilliness, they were exceptionally rigid. Almost in unison, two voices resonated in Lumian's mind, one was the voice of the eloping couple, casting curses, the other was the voice of inebriated individuals shattering bottles and clamoring in the street. The former set Lumian's imagination ablaze, while the latter spurred him to draw his revolver and open fire. The sensations weren't overpowering and could be endured and repressed. After confirming the fit of the boxing gloves, Lumian set them beside the pillow. In the depths of night, in a hazy state, Lumian felt as though he had stepped into an ancient beige castle. Its exterior bore numerous dark and crimson stains, as if drenched in a copious amount of blood. Hysterical laughter and shouts reverberated from within the castle. Lumian instinctively raised his gaze and spotted a deep red visage peering at him through a narrow window on the third floor. Their eyes met, and suddenly, the man raised his right hand and cruelly gouged out his reddish-brown eyes. Fine blood vessels detached from their sockets, leaving behind a pair of inky black, blood-soaked cavities. Ha ha! Ha ha! The eyeless man chortled with a maddened demeanor. Lumian's thoughts blurred as he involuntarily stepped into the ancient castle. What unfurled before his eyes were gruesome scenes, the maid rent her abdomen with a dining knife drawing forth pallid intestines marred by blood. The valets ascended the staircase to the second floor, only to throw themselves back into the hall, repeating their falls in a macabre cycle. The butler clutched a comely female head, his lower body severed. He dragged himself with his elbows, leaving behind a broad and extended trail of blood. The headless mistress sat in an armchair, lifted her cup of coffee, and poured it into the gash on her neck. 
The pungent stench of blood and the frenzied ambience pierced Lumian's mind, snapping his eyes open. He beheld the familiar, squalid ceiling and caught the ceaseless nocturnal clamor of Ruanarchy. Had it all been a dream? The scene from his dream lingered in Lumian's memory, a residual unease remaining. As a beyonder season with the world of mysticism, he didn't underestimate such a dream. It likely bore the marks of a revelation through astral projection or an external influence. Swiftly reviewing the day's occurrences, Lumian zeroed in on two potential culprits. Could it be the lingering effects of the King's Pie game from earlier, or perhaps linked to the impact of the flawed boxing gloves? He cast a glance at the iron black spiked boxing gloves, left untouched beside his pillow, sensing that the game was the likely trigger. An attempt to commune with Termoboros yielded no response. After securing the flawed boxing gloves within a drawer in his wooden table, Lumian drifted back into slumber. Throughout that night, nightmares plagued him repeatedly. Each instance, he encountered the bizarre ancient castle. Fortunately, the dream's lucidity waned progressively, eventually melding into a commonplace nightmare. The following morning, Lumian adhered to his routine of jogging and practicing boxing, then set out in search of a distinctive breakfast in the bustling market district. After spending nearly the entirety of the morning at Sal de Ball Breeze, he eventually found himself standing before apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. With a flush on her face and a lively demeanor, Franca answered the door. You're quite the eager one. Lumian was forthright about his intentions. Remember you mentioned wanting to discuss Emperor Roselle with me? Well, well. Franca's expression shifted oddly once more. She grumbled, I'm feeling unwell. What sort of ailment? Lumian found it hard to believe that the demoness of pleasure could fall ill. As Franca led him to the living room, she muttered, it's empathetic embarrassment. Lumian shut the door and took a seat on the sofa. After a moment's thought, he inquired, is this embarrassment on behalf of Emperor Roselle? Exactly. Franca, seated cross-legged in a recliner, scratched her flaxen hair. I'm seriously concerned that he might be so mortified that he'll rise from the grave to strangle anyone who's privy to the information. After a rather odd comment, Franca sighed and explained, in simpler terms, Emperor Roselle, like us, hails from another world. Emperor Roselle is also one of the transmigrators you mentioned? Lumian blurted out in astonishment. Franca confirmed succinctly, many of his inventions, beliefs, and ideas originated in our world. What's more significant, his diary was penned in the language of the nation your sister and I come from. That's why it remained undeciphered for so long until our transmigration. Lumian's mind was a whirlwind of confusion. It all seemed too fantastical, like something out of fiction. However, Aurora's attitude toward Emperor Roselle and his diary lent credence to Franca's words. Seeing his silence, Franca added with understanding, nonetheless, he's an extraordinary individual. Progressing from a mere Sequence 9 individual, he ascended the paths of the Divine step by step, overthrowing the Sauron dynasty and enacting monumental changes upon Entis and the world. His impact on the history of the past two to three centuries and generations of humanity is profound. That's true. Emperor Roselle once said that a hero is a hero, irrespective of their origins. Where Emperor Roselle came from was immaterial. Lumian quickly collected his thoughts and asked with curiosity, did Emperor Roselle's famous quotations originate from philosophers in your world? Many of them did. Franca, in a way, supported her fellow countrymen's public image. But some are genuinely his own. Consider this, a person who's undergone so much, tasted both triumph and failure, must possess unique insights across various domains. He's not lacking in memorable sayings. Now I understand why Aurora chuckles whenever I mention something Emperor Roselle said. A realization dawned on Lumian. He grasped his sister's sentiments at that moment and the jesting tone the curly-haired baboon's research society adopted toward the emperor. He then inquired, did one of you write Emperor Roselle's secret chronicles? Yes, but I'm unsure who the author is, Franca honestly admitted. The writer possesses quite the literary talent. Is everything in there accurate? Lumian contemplated seeking out an underground bookseller to procure a copy. 
Franca chuckled. About half of it. Even among the portions based on actual events, half of that is a sensationalized expansion of a couple sentences from the Emperor's diary into a narrative rife with explicit details. For instance, the Emperor once shared more than just friendship with a demoness. Franca suddenly paused. Realization dawned upon her that she herself was now a demoness. A worthwhile addition to my collection. Emperor Roselle does seem to live up to the legendary reputation of being a flirt. Lumian's anticipation for the underground book grew. He opted not to delve further into the topic of the Emperor and the Demoness. Instead, he brought up the King's Pie game from the prior day and the subsequent nightmarish dreams. He then sought Franca's insights as an adept practitioner of divination. What revelations are hidden in that dream? I can't decipher it, Franca said after a prolonged pause. It conveys a sense of danger and advises to stay away. Also, those nightmares appear to be lingering effects from some form of insanity. Lumian contemplated for a moment, deciding not to probe deeper for the time being. He planned to consult the two psychiatrists later in the day. At 3.20 p.m., Lumian reached Mason Café in Cartier du Jardin Botanique and took a seat in Booth D. He requested a cup of aromatic Intis coffee and two cream-filled cupcakes. Once the coffee and confections were served, he patiently waited for a minute or so before catching the sound of Susie's gentle, feminine voice. Good afternoon, Mr. Lumian Lee. Lumian responded with an easy smile. Good afternoon, Madam Susie. Good afternoon, Madam Justice. Chapter 346 Follow-up Visit How did you know I was here? Madam Justice's voice held a smile. Lumian gazed at the chair across from him and responded, a grin tugging at his lips, can't hurt to extend a greeting. Susie steered the conversation forward, congratulations on completing the initial phase of your vendetta. Care for a brief discussion? No problem. Lumian's composure remained unshaken, not even flinching at the mention of vendetta. Of course. Part of his calm demeanor stemmed from the fact that he hadn't brought along the flawed boxing gloves. This was a psychological evaluation, after all. He couldn't allow external influences to taint his thoughts and skew the doctor's judgment. From the point of seeking assistance and crafting a strategy, he recounted his experiences of the past two days. He glossed over the secret of the curly-haired baboon's research society but provided a concise account of everything else. Following a momentary silence, Susie's soothing voice resumed its course. Your mental state has held up admirably. A certain degree of overreaction in specific scenarios is par for the course. Psychiatric therapy doesn't strip a person of their emotions or feelings. Instead, it aids in unburdening oneself, fostering reconciliation, and discovering inner resilience. Nightmares won't deal a devastating blow to you any longer. Otherwise, according to the more dubious therapists who advocate severing the frontal lobe for eternal tranquility, you'll forever be at peace. Removing the frontal lobe? Lumian's ears caught wind of this concept for the first time. Susie's tone tinged with revulsion. It's a notion that has cropped up in the last couple of years. It doesn't yield the intended outcomes, rather, it inflicts grave harm upon the patient. There's an evident malevolence behind this treatment proposal. It's as if some callous individual propagated it with the sole intention of making a mockery out of medical professionals and those seeking solace. A prank that toys with the lives of others? Lumian shifted gears, steering the conversation onto a different course. Madam Susie, you haven't even delved into my emotions or analyzed my thoughts, yet you've already deduced that I've made some strides towards recovery, and a follow-up might not be necessary? Susie's demeanor lifted rapidly, and she replied with a grin, at times, a person's actions can be more telling of their psychological state than their thoughts. Understand that humans excel at deceiving themselves. They concoct a slew of rationales for their actions, which often stand less grounded in reality than their deeds. To decipher an accurate psychological portrait from this labyrinth of complex and contradictory thoughts requires meticulous analysis but such scrutiny can easily unearth problems. Hence, I chose to commence with an examination of your actions. 
Evidently, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you've successfully re-established social connections and fostered a level of trust in others. You've also exhibited a willingness to extend your trust to others. Prior to your ambush of Guillaume Benet, you demonstrated the capacity for calm contemplation and thorough preparation. While there were impulsive undertones and hints of macabre inclinations in your operation, they were inevitable. Their absence would only have hinted at more severe psychological turmoil. And once the affair concluded, you swiftly reverted to your norm and dived right back into life, embarking on another investigation. Grounded in the sequence of actions you've undertaken, I extend my congratulations. The pronounced self-destructive tendencies have lost their grip, and you've truly extricated yourself from the abyss of agony. Naturally, the pain won't dissipate entirely. It will wane and recede. Perhaps it might resurge abruptly in the future, once again occupying your mind. Yet, there's no need to succumb to panic. Armed with this period of experience, I trust you're equipped to navigate it adeptly. Psychologically speaking, this signals a path to recovery. In similar fashion, the past invariably leaves its imprints upon us. Your self-destructive propensities, your extremities, your pathological behaviors, no doubt they're more potent than in most individuals, but they all abide by the bounds of reason and normalcy. In response, Lumian let out a slow exhale and murmured, I sense it myself, honestly. The present me is an entirely different person from the one who initially set foot in Trier. Thank you, Madam Susie. Thank you, Madam Justice. He realized that his transformation from an initial state of apathy was thanks to the efforts of these two psychiatrists and his escapades in the market district. The prospect of death itself had lost its sting. He had shifted from a vindictive malevolent specter to an individual fueled by an ardent thirst for retribution, driven by a potent desire for action. In essence, this is your own redemption. Susie's tone brimmed with a delight not present before. The primary contributors to this turnaround are none other than yourself and your sister, Aurora. Were it not for the tiniest ember of hope that you harbored, coupled with your will to persist, and were it not for Miss Aurora gifting you nearly six years of cherished moments to savor and to mold your thoughts, we might not have been able to reel you back in. As Lumian processed these words, a montage of scenes flickered across his mind, Aurora inhaling deeply, using the breaths to temper the vexation derived from instructing him. The tempestuous storms of combat training, coupled with her impromptu attacks. The two of them ensconced in the study, each absorbed in their respective books, relishing the tranquility of the night. And, as the number one experimental subject, he was obligated to consume the culinary reproductions of food back home that his sister conjured, be they successes or failures. Lumian's expression softened as he recollected a line from his sister's novel, The Joy and Pain of Days Past Are Equal to the Me of the Present. After a pause lasting more than ten seconds, he straightened in his seat and queried, Were last night's nightmares all rooted in the King's Pie game? This time, it was Madam Justice who responded, her voice soft with understanding, indeed. Considering the current situation, it's likely that you were mentally corrupted during that time. Mental corruption? Does it actually involve beyond her powers? Lumian asked with genuine curiosity. Madam Justice replied, ordinarily, the simple act of sacrificing a king's pie wouldn't have yielded any results. Otherwise, the game wouldn't have remained a popular tradition in Intus for centuries, fading into obscurity only after the establishment of the Republic. Only a handful of families still recall it. Yes, that's what I assumed back then. Poofer didn't employ any mystical language or invoke a complete honorific name. It's implausible for the sacrifice to succeed, Lumian concurred. Madam Justice continued, Nevertheless, exceptions exist, sacrificers who share blood ties with the subject of the sacrifice and exhibit numerous similarities. If you participate frequently in Poofer's King's Pie game and repeatedly endure the mental corruption it entails, the ramifications won't dissolve with a mere spate of nightmares. Rather, before they fully dissipate, they'll progressively warp your psyche and lead you into madness. Could the content of these nightmares be symbolic? Lumian inquired succinctly. Madam Justice's response flowed measuredly. It's highly probable that they're a fusion of specific deranged occurrences from your past, 
projected into your dreamscape through the taint of corruption. So, that ancient castle and those deranged individuals could really exist. Lumian mused, nodding in contemplation. As Lumian engaged in a conversation with Justice and Susie for a while, he intuited that the day's follow-up session was drawing to a close. In that instance, Madam Justice took the lead, saying, Didn't I mention previously that I might require your assistance with something? Of course, no problem, Lumian swiftly agreed. Consider it the cost of the psychiatric treatment. Moreover, he held the belief that Madam Justice wouldn't have entrusted him with the task without assessing his capabilities. The endeavor couldn't be excessively dangerous. Madam Justice chuckled and said, Should you succeed, I shall bestow an additional reward upon you, one that will cater to your requirements in a specific manner. Something capable of altering my appearance? Lumian's heart skipped a beat with excitement. Something along those lines. Madam Justice's initially gentle tone turned solemn. I'm hoping you can venture to an ancient tomb situated on the fourth floor of Trier's catacombs, specifically to retrieve a vial of the Samaritan Women's Spring for me. Samaritan Women's Spring? Lumian was taken aback. Madam Hela had previously mentioned that she had journeyed to Trier in pursuit of an artifact hidden deep within the catacombs. Concurrently, she had inquired about the legend surrounding the Samaritan Women's Spring. Wasn't this too much of a coincidence? Almost as if she sensed his thoughts, Madam Justice chimed in with a smile, don't you find it too coincidental? Yes, what I'm hoping for is that you can leverage Madam Hela's exploration to assist me in securing some Samaritan women's spring water. Doing so yourself might yield slim chances of success. In truth, I could arrange for you to undertake this task in a more clandestine manner, but that approach contradicts my philosophy and principles. I still require face-to-face -face communication with you and your explicit consent for such matters. I'm disinclined to ensnare you passively through covert cues to fulfill my objectives. For me, indulging in the manipulation of others' minds is a treacherous endeavor. Of course, honesty is also an effective way at influencing others' thoughts. Lumian's skepticism and doubts gradually ebbed away. He inquired, perplexed, Madam Justice, Given that you possess a general awareness of the Samaritan Women's Spring's approximate location, why wouldn't you retrieve it yourself? Why involve a sequence seven beyonder like me? The Tarot Club's major arcana card was definitely a demigod, countless times stronger than him. Madam Justice laughed. To put it succinctly, certain locales become progressively hazardous with an increase in sequence. A location where higher sequences meet with increased danger? Lumian found this notion confounding. Madam Justice added, as sequences rise, proximity to the oldest one increases, accumulating more madness along the way. Consequently, individuals in higher sequences are more susceptible to particular forms of corruption. Gila is also beneficial in this matter. At the very least, this approach will save her time and permit her to narrow down her search to a designated area. After a brief contemplation, Lumian agreed to Madam Justice's request. From her, he gleaned the approximate location of the Samaritan Women's Spring, situated within the westernmost ancient tomb on the fourth floor of the catacombs. Following the session, Lumian made his way back to Rue de Blouse's Blanches in the Market District, his objective being the retrieval of the flawed boxing gloves from the Iron Cabinet. Upon his arrival at the safe house, an odd inkling settled upon him. Intrusion Someone had infiltrated a safe house. Lumian's heart tightened as he advanced with purpose, unlatching the iron cabinet. While observing that Aurora's grimoires and the flawed boxing gloves remained, a sigh of relief escaped him involuntarily. However, he proceeded to conduct a thorough inspection, and his scrutiny bore fruit. One article was conspicuously absent, the earth blood or was gone. Chapter 347, Strange Theft Looking at the open iron cabinet, Lumian found it absurd and surreal. The thief had entered the house without taking the most valuable flawed boxing glove, nor did they flip through Aurora's grimoires to see if there were any banknotes inside. They had only taken a mineral specimen that didn't look like a gem at all. 
disregarding the traps, if the thief were truly a marauder with beyonder powers, he wouldn't have given up on the boxing gloves made of unique materials and capable of powerful abilities. If he were just an ordinary thief, he wouldn't have just taken the earth blood ore. He might have even casually thrown the seemingly worthless item to the ground. All of this led Lumian to suspect that the thieving intruder had only one motive, take away the earth blood ore. The other party clearly knew what was special about the mineral specimen and was attempting to exploit it. Termoboros, who stole the earth blood ore? Lumian couldn't identify any suspect no matter how hard he thought. Apart from dealing with Guillaume Benet a few days ago when he retrieved the earth blood ore and handed it to Franca, he kept the mineral specimen in the safe house. He never carried it with him to avoid being targeted. Of course, the thief might have divined or prophesied to narrow down the area. He searched every room and finally found the target item. Termoboros's magnificent voice suddenly resounded. I don't know. Don't know. Lumian was alarmed. This answer was meaningless, but coming from Termoboros meant many things. While Termoboros, sealed within Lumian's body, couldn't exert any direct power, his angelic nature granted him unique insights. As an angel of the inevitability domain, he possessed an uncanny ability to detect problems and traces that eluded many low-sequence beyonders through low-sequence beyonder size and fate. But now, he claimed ignorance. This revelation carried significant weight, suggesting that whoever had stolen the earth blood or was no ordinary individual. It hinted at the involvement of a high-level power, possibly tied to a secret organization or cult. Hiss, I have to write a letter and inform Madame Magician about this. After all, she once predicted that the earth blood ore would bring me some misfortune. However, the item is lost before the misfortune arrived. Lumian had initially hesitated to burden his major arcana card holder with this matter, as he didn't attach much value to the mineral specimen. Its applications were limited, and its loss seemed inconsequential. However, with the situation taking a bizarre turn, he couldn't simply dismiss it. In the world of mysticism, negligence often led to painful lessons. Truth be told, Lumian didn't harbor anger over the loss of his possession, nor did he feel compelled to retrieve it. Though the earth blood or might lead to fortuitous encounters, it remained an abstract concept, difficult to quantify or cherish. Moreover, Madame Magician's warning of potential misfortune made him view its loss as a means to mitigate risk. Lumian meticulously inspected the safe house once more, confirming that none of the traps had been triggered. Only the earth blood or had vanished. He settled down to compose a letter. This time, the summoned puppet messenger displayed a less frigid demeanor, no longer suppressing intense emotions. In mere minutes, Madame Magician's response arrived concise and to the point, there's indeed something amiss in this matter. I can't identify the thief of the earth blood or either. If you're not fearful, you can venture to the entrance of Sal de Bal Unique and seek anyone with a monocle in their right eye. Even if they aren't the culprits, they should possess knowledge of the suspect. If you find it too risky, exercise patience. Someone will inquire on your behalf. Sal de Bal Unique. That makes sense. The sequence preceding a swindler is marauder. Could those monocle-wearing individuals hold sway over all the thieves wielding beyond their powers and try her? Lumian pondered this in silence. Aurora's grimoires had mentioned that marauder occupied sequence 9 on one of the paths of the divine. Above marauder was swindler, and further up was cryptologist. After careful consideration, Lumian opted to wait for someone to inquire on his behalf. He had no immediate need for the earth blood ore. The thought of Sal de Bal Unique, Monet, the monocle-wearing islander swindler, and the swindlers who emulated his style sent shivers down his spine. He preferred to avoid any unnecessary contact for the time being. After burning the letter, Lumian shifted his attention to the iron cabinet, the repository of Aurora's grimoires, flawed boxing gloves, and various other items. The once secure safe house had become compromised and he needed to find a new location for these possessions. I'll take Flog with me. I'll carry the rest if I can, and sell what's sellable. If not, I'll secure another safe house. 
for Aurora's grimoires and the gold, I'll rent an anonymous safe deposit box at a large bank for their safekeeping. When this property's current lease expires, I wouldn't renew it. Lumian had a clear strategy in mind. His plan encompassed the items he couldn't easily transport or wish to part with, which primarily included the five ritualistic hides, in addition to Aurora's grimoires and his accumulated gold. Finding a new home for these items was a priority, along with securing another safe house for himself. With these considerations in mind, Lumian began drafting a letter addressed to Gila. In the letter, he revealed that he had acquired information about the approximate location of the Samaritan Women's Spring through a secretive channel. The information source had tasked him with venturing underground to retrieve a genuine bottle of water from the spring. However, as Lumian was writing, he felt a sense of puzzlement. It seemed unnecessary for him to be directly involved when he could have entrusted Gila with the task of obtaining the spring water on his behalf. Madam Justice should have considered this. Why am I required to descend into the fourth level of the catacombs personally? Is it because of the perceived difficulty Gila might encounter in procuring the water by herself? She needs my assistance? What's so special about me? Apart from the angel sealed within me, my sequence isn't high. Madame Gila's sequence is relatively high. It's relatively dangerous for her to approach the Samaritan Women's Spring and she will be prone to madness. Am I responsible for monitoring her condition and awaken her if needed? I previously believed that Madame Gila was at least a sequence for. She claimed she could resolve the Corda problem before the descent ritual, but now it appears she hasn't ascended to a demigod. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to enter the fourth level of the catacombs, let alone approach the Samaritan Women's Spring. Does she possess a grade one sealed artifact or a mystical item equivalent to a saint? Lumian combed through the entire situation and made some guesses and judgments. Continuing to write, Lumian used the information provider's request as a pretext to express his personal desire to enter the ancient tomb. After the summoning ritual, the skull, crafted from pure silver and radiating a gentle glow, retrieved the letter and departed. Before long, a messenger returned with Gila's response, no problem. I'll meet you at the gates of the Death Empire at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Phew. Lumian exhaled a sigh of relief, his body trembling with a mix of excitement and trepidation. His adventurous spirit and penchant for experimentation had always defined him. The bizarre vanishing of the couple in the catacombs had etched a profound mark on his psyche. The next morning, at eleven rue de Fontaines, Lumian dutifully arrived at Gardner Martin's villa and reported the details of his meeting with Count Poufer and the other Black Cat members. Inside, Gardner Martin, unusually excited, sat behind his desk and spoke with a hint of joy, despite your claim of lacking artistic inclination, your background allows you to converse with them effectively. That's precisely why I chose you instead of Albus. I was concerned you might not exhibit enough generosity, but you handled it admirably. You even sponsored them with 4,000 Vroldor on your first visit. Gardner Martin, the commanding officer of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, implied that Lumian's status as the younger brother of best-selling author Aurora Lee, even without artistic inclination, provided him with a wealth of insider knowledge about the scandals, grudges, and grievances within the literary and artistic circles. Lumian, however, didn't waste any time and cut straight to the point. What I don't understand is why the King's Pie game gave me a sense of danger. I even had a few nightmares last night. Gardner Martin nodded thoughtfully. That's because Poofer is quite unique. He bears a striking resemblance to his ancestor, Vermanda. They share a strong blood connection, which allows them to bypass many crucial steps during a ritual. Has his ancestor turned into an evil spirit? How can he still accept sacrifices after centuries? Lumian asked, basing his question on logical reasoning without mentioning Mr. K's account. Gardner Martin responded with solemnity, that's something you should investigate when you approach Poofer. Don't worry, as long as you don't participate in the King's Pie game every two or three days, the only aftereffect you'll experience is those nightmares. Keep that sense of danger intact and resist becoming a king. It's easier for you to become a king than anyone else, except for Poofer himself. 
If you're uncertain about making the right choice, let Poofer choose first. The Iron and Blood Cross Order wants to uncover the whereabouts of the mysterious Vermanda Sauron, who has been missing for centuries. Hehe, <laughs> why didn't they warn me about the dangers of the King's Pie game beforehand and advise me to be the last to make a choice? Lumian suspected that Gardner Martin hadn't mentioned it to confirm a crucial matter. In the afternoon, near the Trier Opera House, within a concealed quarry cave, Franca and Jenna, wearing half-masks, once again met the warlock in the black robe. He was the same client who had previously commissioned the investigation of the disappearance of the Deep Valley Cloister's gatekeeper. Franca scanned their surroundings, her voice intentionally hoarse as she spoke, We've made some progress in our investigation regarding the disappearance of the Deep Valley Cloister's gatekeeper. We wish to discuss it with you privately. The man fell silent for over ten seconds before finally nodding. Very well. Their iron-masked skeletal escort led them, along with the client, into a secluded conversation room within the quarry cave. With an hour left until their agreed meeting time, Lumian equipped himself with a carbide lamp and entered the market district's corresponding entrance to Underground Trier. Chapter 348 The Bustling Underground The carbide lamp emitted a bluish-yellow light, casting an eerie glow over the tunnel, which was divided by stone pillars. Lumian strolled casually, carrying a black canvas bag that had become popular among university students in recent years. Inside, he had stashed the flawed boxing gloves and a stack of white candles. After conducting numerous experiments, Lumian had discovered that carrying them in his bag was less risky than tucking them into his shirt or pants pockets. While it didn't make a significant difference, it was still better than the alternative. As he followed the route marked on Gardner Martin's map, leading him toward the underground of Cartier de l'Observatoire, Lumian suddenly perked up his ears, listening for signs of approaching footsteps. A cacophony of faint footsteps echoed in the air, barely audible. Lumian scanned the path ahead and to his right, unsure which route the unidentified group would take. To remain inconspicuous, he clambered up to a stone pillar supporting the tunnel's ceiling, extinguishing his carbide lamp, and disappeared into the shadows. Before long, a group of men emerged. Most of them wore tattered jackets or were shirtless, hunched over while carrying heavy crates. Over a dozen burly men, dressed in well-worn attire with sinister expressions, held various firearms and carbide lamps, interspersed throughout the group. Smugglers. Lumian peered out, examining the crates illuminated by the smugglers' lights. They appeared to emit a metallic gleam. Firearms or something else? He mumbled silently, observing the smuggling caravan as it entered the right tunnel. As they advanced, possibly due to a shadow that moved too much like a human, one of the smugglers raised his gun, took aim, and fired. With a resounding bang, the alarm ceased, and the group pressed onward. Lumian clicked his tongue and shook his head, finding their reaction overly tense and excessive. In underground trier, such actions could easily lead to trouble. It was well known that aside from university students exploring and citizens cultivating mushrooms to eke out a living, most individuals venturing underground were not to be underestimated. The chances of encountering beyonders were significantly higher below ground than on the surface. Firing upon any passerby could potentially provoke members of secret organizations, bestowed of evil gods, anti-government militants, or formidable cave adventurers. With this in mind, Lumian drew his revolver and squeezed the trigger in the direction of the smuggling caravan, which was about to disappear at the end of the tunnel to his right. He wasn't aiming at anyone, just firing into the air. Bang! The armed smugglers either spun around or scrambled for cover, unleashing a barrage of bullets at the crossroads. However, Lumian was no longer concerned. He was already scaling the rock wall, almost reaching the top. After exchanging gunfire with the empty air for a brief moment, the smugglers shifted their positions nervously, puzzled and flustered. Lumian observed their backs and couldn't help but smile. No need for thanks. Consider it a free lesson. He leaped to the ground and relit his carbide lamp. Smelling the lingering scent of gunpowder, Lumian grinned and holstered his revolver before continuing along his planned route. 
A few minutes later, he came across a group of Cory police officers dressed in dark uniforms, armed with semi-automatic revolvers. The officer leading the group, upon seeing Lumian's youthful appearance, backpack slung diagonally, and well-dressed attire, muttered under his breath, Son of a bitch, why is it another college student? He then exhaled loudly and asked, Did you hear anything just now? There was a gunfight over there. Bang, bang, bang. I wanted to go over and take a look, but I didn't dare, Lumian replied, concealing nothing about the smuggling caravan. The Cory police officers exchanged glances and swiftly passed Lumian, sprinting toward the intersection. In the conversation room. Observing the iron-masked skeletal host's departure, the man dressed in warlock attire turned his attention to Franca and Jenna and said, What did you discover? As I mentioned, you need to find the gatekeeper or his remains to claim your reward. Jenna replied calmly, We haven't really thought about payment yet. We believe the situation is more complex than you described. One night, we infiltrated the Deep Valley Quarry. Upon hearing the term Deep Valley Quarry, the man, hidden under a hooded shadow, subtly lifted his gaze. Franca keenly observed his body language. She had consulted with Anthony Reed and knew the kind of subconscious reactions ordinary humans would exhibit in such situations. The man's actions suggested he was highly sensitive to the mention of Deep Valley Quarry. Only someone aware of the issue would react in such a way. Jenna continued to recount their discoveries, including the cybernetic-eyed monk and the secret cave adorned with limbs. The warlock-dressed man remained composed, making no unnecessary movements. However, to Franca, this indicated that he understood the abnormality within Deep Valley Quarry. After hearing Jenna's account, the man deliberately raised his voice and said, I can't confirm if it's related to the gatekeeper's disappearance, but if you can enter the secret cave, capture a few photographs, or retrieve valuable items, I'm willing to offer half the payment up front. Perhaps you'll find clues about the gatekeeper's whereabouts inside. Do you take us for fools? Are you expecting us to take such a risk for a mere 10,000 vrold door? Franca muttered silently. Had this mysticism gathering not been organized by her friend, she would have found a way to tail the client and uncover his true identity. She could then extract more detailed information from him and have Jenna sell it to the purifiers. Halt! The Death Empire lies ahead. Lumian once again found himself standing in front of the natural arch, adorned with a peculiar mix of white bones, sunflowers, and steam symbols carved into the stone. Before he could reach for the pocket watch he had borrowed from Sal de Balbris to check the time, Gila, dressed in a mysterious widow's black robe with withered blonde hair, approached from the other side. The woman nodded slightly and said, Since you're already here, let's proceed ahead of schedule. Very well. Lumian opened his bag and produced two white candles. After lighting them and handing one to Gila, he grinned and remarked, Aren't you worried that the information I obtained about the Samaritan Women's Spring might be incorrect? Success comes after numerous failures, Gila replied with icy detachment. A chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. I thought you might say that failure is the mother of success. This isn't the research society, Gila replied tersely. Lumian didn't waste any more time. He extinguished his carbide lamp and advanced toward the rocky arch, clutching the white candle its flame now an intense orange. As expected, a figure emerged from the shadows beyond the door. The figure sported a blue vest and yellow pants, with gray hair and few wrinkles. His light yellow eyes held a faint cloudiness, marking him as an elderly man. The old man cast a disapproving look at the white candle in Lumian's hand and asked with a furrowed brow, Didn't you find a guide? You. Not you guys. Lumian glanced at Gila out of the corner of his eye and realized that the candlelight around her had dimmed, as if it had been corroded by the underground darkness or shrouded in dense fog. In this state, she appeared to have vanished from the tomb administrator's view. Lumian flashed a smile at the old man. I don't require a guide. I've been to the tomb many times, though I'm more accustomed to entering through the Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative entrance. Don't worry. I remember all the taboos, and I won't deliberately break them. The old man snapped, you college students. Remember, exit before your candles burn out. With that, 
he stepped aside and disappeared into the darkness behind the door. As Lumian passed through the rocky passage and entered the Death Empire, he turned to the aged tomb administrator and asked curiously, why can you hold a lit white candle? The tomb administrator's faintly turbid light yellow eyes suddenly darkened, and an icy aura emanated from him. In a deep voice, he replied, I'm just stationed by the entrance, not venturing too deep. Is that so? Lumian, who had already entered the catacombs, rationally abandoned any further inquiry. He focused on the chill in his heart and the unseen gazes from the surrounding darkness. He couldn't help but sense a resemblance between the tomb administrator's current aura and Hela's presence. Under the ever-watchful gaze of the corpses in the stone pit and the heaps of bones lining the sides of the passage, Lumian pressed on through the musty air. He walked alongside Hela, passing landmarks like the chapel tomb and the memorial pillar tomb. Hela broke the silence, her tone frosty. Which level are we heading to? The fourth level, Lumian replied, holding the white candle aloft and pointing to a nearby tomb sign, not withholding any information. Hila nodded once more and picked up her pace, striding ahead of Lumian. She seemed intimately familiar with the first level of the catacombs. After a few twists and turns, she led Lumian to a staircase that descended to the second level. Compared to the previous level, there were far fewer tourists here. Occasionally, they encountered university students singing, dancing, or testing their courage under the gaze of the candlelit corpses. Hila showed no signs of slowing down. Soon, Lumian spotted a weathered stone door. With the candle's flickering yellow glow illuminating the way, he read the intention inscription on the stone door, entrance to the old ossuary. Down here, we enter the third level. Just beyond the door is the sun and steam altar. Keep walking until you reach the Chris Mona night pillar, and that's where we enter the fourth level, Hila explained, her voice still cold. Do you have a complete map of the catacombs? Lumian couldn't help but inquire, aware that only the map of the first level was readily available on the market. Hila shook her head. I know less the deeper we go. From the third level onward, you have to rely on the road signs and the guiding black line on the cave ceiling. Lumian chose not to press the matter further. With Hila leading the way, they crossed the threshold of the old ossuary and descended a wide stone staircase, imbued with a palpable sense of history. Upon reaching the third level of the tomb, they encountered a flickering candlelight and a makeshift altar composed of two weathered boulders. The candle's flame belonged to a young man with black hair, brown eyes, and a pale complexion. Upon spotting Lumian and Hila, he rushed toward them as if grasping at a lifeline. As he ran, he shouted, Ma, my friends vanished. Just like that. Chapter 349, Sacrificial Square His friends had vanished. Lumian, clutching a white candle, watched as the young man dashed over, his eyebrows twitching slightly. In the catacombs, it was common for people to disappear. What was unusual was that this guy still remembered his friends and their strange disappearance. He wasn't a tomb administrator, nor did he have an angel sealed within him. Any anomaly that occurred meant that something was wrong. Stop! Lumian drew his revolver with his free right hand and pointed it at the black-haired, brown-eyed, and pale-faced young man. In the flickering candlelight, the lad shook his head frantically and said, Help! Save me! They've all vanished. He slowed down slightly but didn't stop. Bang! Lumian pulled the trigger of the revolver, sending the yellow bullet grazing the lad's body into the distance, disappearing into the darkness that couldn't be illuminated by candlelight. Sensing Lumian's determination to stop him, the lad finally halted and revealed a pleading expression. Save me! Save me! Observing Hila's silence with no intention of making conversation, Lumian had no choice but to inquire, what happened? As he spoke, he used the yellow candle flames in the trio's hands to survey the environment on the third level of the catacombs. Unlike the first two levels of the tomb, which were surrounded by white bones and had corpses lining both sides of the path, this level had a small square devoid of corpses. The square was paved with mottled cobblestones, with no moss or soil in the crevices. It was unbelievably clean. 
Two grayish-white pillars made of boulders stood on either side of it. Their surfaces were severely weathered, leaving peeling marks. Even so, Lumian, with his keen eyesight, discerned the sun's sacred emblem and triangular sacred emblem engraved on the two pillars. Surrounding them were symbols like sunflowers, crankshafts, and connecting rods. Around the square, where candlelight couldn't penetrate, the darkness was dense, as if countless figures stood there, casting gazes that made Lumian's skin prickle. The young man with black hair, brown eyes, and a pale face replied fearfully, I don't know. We were just about to leave the square where the altars of the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery stand to explore the ancient tomb on the third level. Suddenly, they stumbled over something and fell, one by one. Even the candles in their hands fell to the ground and went out. I, I was at the back and saw them vanish just like that. Vanish? Lumian asked deliberately, probing for more information. To him, the most pressing question wasn't how they vanished but why the witness still remembered their disappearance. Yes, they vanished. The young man nodded fervently. It was as if they evaporated right in front of me at an incredibly fast speed. I, I was so scared that I didn't dare look for them or return to the surface. I could only wait in this sacrificial square, praying to the sun. Just as my candle was about to burn out, someone finally arrived. It's clear that if you aren't affected by the strangeness and manage to escape, your faith in the eternal blazing sun would surge. Lumian couldn't discern anything amiss with the other party, so he casually posed another question. Are you college students? The lad nodded again. Yes, we're students from Trier Normal College. We formed a team to adventure here. My, my name is Gerard. Lumian couldn't help but chuckle. He even considered inviting Gerard to join him and Gila in their search for the Samaritan Women's Spring. After all, the chances of a student like him surviving until graduation seemed slim. He might be more useful as bait. As he contemplated how to determine if there was anything wrong with Gerard, Gila suddenly spoke with a cold tone, We'll escort you back. Surprisingly kind? Lumian turned to Gila, taken aback. His impression of this lady was that even her blood ran cold. Gerard was so grateful that tears and snot streamed down his face. He continued to thank them profusely as he approached. Lumian observed his every move. He retrieved a white candle from his canvas bag and tossed it over. Desperately, Gerard caught it and lit the new candle with the old one, which had only a small segment left. Seeing the flickering candlelight, the college student breathed a sigh of relief and followed Gila and Lumian down the stone staircase leading to the second level. Just as he took ten steps up, Gerard was suddenly stunned. Lumian looked over and noticed that the lingering fear on his face had disappeared. Will it be a problem for you to return to the surface by yourself? Gila asked again, but her words were entirely different from before. Gerard chuckled. No problem. Thank you for the candle. Sigh, losing the spare candle is troublesome. Ah. Uh. Lumian's heart stirred as he probed, did you venture to the third level of the tomb alone? Gerard nodded proudly. Of course, I possess enough courage and experience. He has finally forgotten about his schoolmates. Did he not forget because he was at the sacrificial square? Did Madame Hila notice that, thereby suggesting escorting him? Lumian nodded in enlightenment. After watching Gerard ascend the stairs and leave through the entrance of the old ossuary, Lumian and Gila returned to the sacrificial square. This time, when Lumian looked at the two sacrificial pillars representing the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery, his feelings for them were entirely different. Perhaps they symbolized the protection of a deity. However, even with the deity's gaze and protection, the two stone pillars inevitably showed signs of weathering and corrosion after countless years in the depths of the catacombs. Lumian believed that more protection meant greater confidence. He wouldn't lose anything by giving it a try. Facing the sacrificial pillar engraved with the sun's sacred emblem, he raised his body slightly and spread his arms. Praise the sun! Gila watched silently, not interrupting his prayer. After Lumian finished his concise praise, the two of them made their way toward the Chris Mona Knight Pillar to the north, 
following the black line above their heads and the road sign at the edge of the square. Lumian, holding a white candle, had only taken a few steps away from the sacrificial square when his heart stirred. He cast his gaze forward. At some point, a skeleton, covered in dark green mold, had collapsed by the road. The bones of its hands lay across the road, as if it wanted to grab a passerby's ankle. If Lumian had walked faster and failed to carefully observe the environment, he might have tripped over the corpse. This instantly reminded him of Gerard's description. The college students' companions stumbled over something and fell to the ground, extinguishing their candles. Only then were they swallowed by the catacombs, leaving no trace of their existence. Did they trip over these fallen bones? Lumian thoughtfully kicked the hand bone away. Amidst the clanking sounds, he and Hila continued forward. However, after a few steps, they encountered another white skeleton with half its body lying on the road. Lumian frowned and instinctively looked back at the spot where he had almost tripped. The dim candlelight barely reached there, but Lumian could barely make out the details with his hunter's eyesight. His pupils dilated as he realized that the pale white hand bone he had kicked had returned to its original position, still serving as an obstacle for passers-by. They're still alive? Undead creatures? Lumian asked, his nerves on edge. No, but it's a possibility, Hila replied succinctly. Seeing Lumian's puzzled expression, she explained, they must have been affected by the environment deep within the tomb and are exhibiting certain abnormalities. When the hidden dangers and horrors in the environment erupt, it's likely that they will all turn into undead creatures. All of them turning into undead creatures. Lumian instinctively shuddered as he imagined such a scenario. Whether complete or incomplete, there were at least a million skeletons on this level. It might even be an order of magnitude more. If they all became undead creatures with a hatred for the living, the situation would be terrifying to the extreme. Seeing that Hila had no intention of turning back, Lumian followed. They relied on the guidance of the road sign and the black lines above their heads to navigate through the bones that were trying to obstruct them and slowly made their way toward their destination. After an unknown amount of time, they finally reached the Chrismona Knight Pillar without encountering another living person. It was a colossal pillar made of black marble, its upper end reaching the cave ceiling. There were no patterns or symbols engraved on its surface, nor were there any signs of weathering or corrosion. Lumian was taken aback. In the sacrificial square, the two stone pillars symbolizing the eternal blazing sun and the god of steam and machinery had been weathered and corroded. Is this pillar more special than the sacrificial ones? As if sensing Lumian's thoughts, Hila spoke coldly, Chris Mona is a member of the Demonis sect, which can also be called the Demonis family. She was a sequence to Demonis of catastrophe. She perished in the War of the Four Emperors in the previous epic, dying inside Fourth Epic Trier. However, her characteristics were retrieved by the Demonis family. Apart from the Chrismona Knight Pillar, there are also the Marian Knight Pillar and Liu's Knight Pillar on the third or fourth level. Who are these two? Lumian believed they were angels as well. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on par with Chris Mona. Marianne was the Pope of the Church of Evernight back then, and Liu's was a blessed of ancient death, a death consul. Their characteristics were also retrieved by their respective factions. As for whether other angels perished here, I'm not sure, but many of the angels who followed the Blood Emperor must have perished. After Hila briefly explained, she pointed at the stone staircase behind the Chris Monanite pillar. Let's go to the fourth level. Lumian tersely agreed, and they quickly replaced their rapidly burning white candles before ascending to the fourth level. After attending the mysticism gathering, Franca and Jenna retraced their steps to the underground area corresponding to the arcade of the Opera House. As they turned a corner at a fork of the road, Franca leaned over and whispered into Jenna's ear, Someone's following us. Someone is following us. Jenna's heart skipped a beat. Chapter 350 Negative Effects How can that be? Jenna exclaimed, her surprise and confusion evident. She recollected the mysticism gathering's conclusion, where participants dispersed through various routes at sporadic intervals. 
the two of them had been cautious, ensuring they left no clues. So, how had they been followed? Observing Jenna's restraint from looking back, Franca calmly moved ahead and whispered, who knows? Perhaps another participant chose this route and stumbled upon someone ahead. They might want to tail us, hoping for an opportunity to strike it big. Or maybe someone with unusual skills tracked us in an unexpected way. Let's keep moving forward as if nothing's amiss. We'll be safe once we reach the street under the arcade. If our pursuer strikes before then, drop the carbide lamp immediately and hide in the nearby shadows. Depending on the situation, you can decide how to join the fight. Jenna nodded subtly, indicating her willingness to follow Franca's instructions. Unintentionally, she tightened her grip on the carbide lamp. After traversing the dark, damp tunnel for a hundred to two hundred meters, Franca slowed down and glanced back with confusion. The stalker has vanished. It's also possible that he found a way to bypass the spider silk I left behind. As she finished speaking, a figure emerged from the darkness ahead, illuminated by the carbide lamp's glow. Jenna reacted swiftly, dropping the carbide lamp in her left hand and blending into the shadows. Relying on her mirror substitution technique, Franca didn't rush to evade. Instead, she fixed her gaze on the stalker who had circled around to confront them. It was the man masquerading as a warlock, his face concealed beneath a hooded shadow. The entrustee. He gazed at Franca and deliberately spoke in a high-pitched voice, I want to strike a deal with you guys. Behind the Chris Mona Knight pillar, Lumian trailed behind Gila, clutching a new white candle that flickered in the dim light. They followed the worn stone steps, seemingly descending into the depths of hell. The stone walls on either side slowly gave way, revealing intricate reliefs of human heads. Dark gray figures clustered together, reminiscent of the countless bones piled high in the upper tomb. As Lumian completed the descent and stepped onto the hushed fourth level of the catacombs, an overwhelming restlessness overcame him. It was as if he had been imprisoned for a long time, yearning for freedom. This sensation wasn't unfamiliar, it was a side effect of the armored shadow contract, but it had never been this intense before. It was as if his spirit felt trapped within his body, finally becoming cognizant of the truth. It sought to break free from this cage, to shatter this world and gain true freedom. Phew. Lumian exhaled slowly, calming himself down. Even without the Alms Monk boon, he believed he could manage these turbulent emotions. With the Alms Monk's power, he could control them even better. According to Madame Justice, the higher one's sequence, the more susceptible they are to madness and the hidden corruption of the fourth level of the catacombs. Is that what I'm experiencing? Is it because my sequence isn't high that I could endure and control it? Lumian quickly made a guess about the current situation. He instinctively looked up and cast his gaze diagonally at Gila. Her neck is slender, mostly concealed in the widow-like attire's collar, a suitable target for snapping. Just as this thought crossed Lumian's mind, he hurriedly shook his head, dismissing the negative effects of the abscessed hand's contract. Simultaneously, he noticed that Gila's face had turned pale whiter, resembling a corpse that had been dead for many days rather than a living human. In an instant, Gila produced a military flask, unscrewed the cap, and downed its contents. Lumian caught a whiff of the strong scent of alcohol. Silently, he muttered, it should be liquor. Could Gila be like the alcoholics in Faisak, carrying multiple flasks with her? After finishing a third of the bottle in a single gulp, Gila's complexion flushed slightly as she inquired, which way should we go? Lumian responded honestly, it's in an ancient tomb on the westernmost side. We have a general idea of the area, but not the exact location. Gila nodded and glanced at the top of the tomb, where a thick black line was drawn with arrows pointing in various directions. Combining this with the signs near the entrance, Lumian could roughly discern the route leading west. Nevertheless, he pulled out a compass he had prepared beforehand to confirm. Under the feeble candlelight, the compass needle oscillated continuously, erratic and unceasing. It's acting crazy, Lumian commented, attempting to alleviate his pent-up irritation with humor. We'll have to rely on the road signs and black lines, Gila responded, seemingly expecting this. Lumian sighed, eyeing the erratically moving compass. 
he chuckled self-deprecatingly. If it never stops, could it power a perpetual motion machine? Hila glanced at him. Aren't you a believer in the eternal blazing sun? Lumian replied sincerely, at least for now, I am. Hila didn't press the topic further. Following the road sign beside her and the black lines above, she stepped to the right. The Marian Night Pillar and Liu's Night Pillar are both on this floor. There's also Francois's tomb, the Blood Order Hall, and Crazy Shroom's cave. Ah, the style of this name is completely different from the others, Lumian rambled, diverting his attention from the road sign. The most noticeable difference between the fourth and third levels was the absence of corpses lining the path. It appeared wider and cleaner, yet it was eerie in its silence. The ancient tombs had sealed entrances, concealing their contents from prying eyes. Without turning around, Gila remarked, Does your mental unrest manifest in talking and rambling more? Not exactly. Talking just helps me cope with the irritation, Lumian admitted. They continued to navigate, using the road signs and black lines to adjust their direction as they went along. As Lumian passed by the partially natural tomb cave named the Order Hall, the outer soil tinged with a hint of blood, he suddenly spotted someone. It was a woman in a plain white robe, her black hair flowing down her back, and her features extraordinarily exquisite, perfectly harmonious. Her aura was so pure that she seemed out of place in this silent and filthy tomb. Despite having seen a demoness of pleasure frequently, Lumian couldn't help but be amazed. He even felt an unholy urge to ravage her. This wasn't just a drawback of Flog's boxing gloves, it was a dark impulse from the depths of his heart. Lumian snapped out of it. The woman had sparkling blue eyes, cold and lifeless, and her hands were empty, holding an unlit white candle. In the catacombs, the living would vanish without the protection of the white candle's flames. Lumian's body tensed as the woman slipped into the surrounding darkness, blocked by the outer wall of the Blood Order Hall, and disappeared without a trace. What are you looking at? Hila's cold voice cut through the silence. Didn't you see? Lumian recounted the scene he had witnessed in detail. Hila fell silent for a few seconds before saying, I didn't see it indeed. However, as soon as you stopped moving, I cast my gaze in that direction. Was I the only one who could see it? Or was I the only one allowed to see it? Lumian couldn't be certain if it was due to Termoboros's influence, his sequence, or his gender. Hila pondered for a moment and replied, Don't concern yourself with such matters. It's normal for special wraiths and evil spirits to linger in the depths of the catacombs, but this place is like a powerful seal. As long as you don't break the rules and trigger an anomaly, you should be safe. Lumian nodded. I was just thinking, Lumian began, ordinary tourists and adventurous college students wouldn't be able to pass through the third level of the tomb to reach this place. Why did they produce the guiding black line and accurate road signs? Who are they for? Hila answered as she took another step forward, official beyonders who come here regularly to clean up and tomb administrators who patrol the area every day. She then offered a simple reminder. Based on your description, the female figure you saw earlier resembles a high-ranking demoness. Lumian's heart skipped a beat. Could it be the lingering vengeful spirit of the demoness of catastrophe, Chris Mona? I'm not sure, Hila replied, taking another sip from her military flask. Lumian casually glanced around, his eyelids twitching. He noticed a purplish-red patch on the back of Hila's right hand. It hadn't been there before. It resembled the liver mortis seen on the deceased. Is this the effect of the corruption on the fourth level of the catacombs? Is Madame Gila using alcohol to resist it? Lumian continued his small talk. Amidst his babbling, they meandered through the unmarked ancient tombs and eventually reached the westernmost area of the floor. At the edge of the rock wall, dozens or possibly hundreds of ancient tombs stretched out of sight. Just as Lumian was about to ask Hila if she could expedite the search for their target, he heard knocking from an ancient tomb nearby. Both Hila and Lumian tensed, their eyes fixed on the tomb as more of its damaged stone walls crumbled, revealing a dark cavern that humans could enter and exit. A figure emerged, hunched over. Lumian, filled with tension, 
wanted to unleash a giant fireball, but he restrained himself, opting to observe first. The man who crawled out of the ancient tomb held a lit white candle, dusted off his clothes, and slowly straightened up. Dressed in a black seer's robe commonly seen in circuses, he had brownish black skin, a slender build, curly black hair, and deep set eyes. A crystal like monocle adorned his right eye. He was none other than the islander swindler, Monette. Monette flashed a smile at Lumian and Gila. What a coincidence, 